that to the switch, and the switch said, hey, that goes to this one here. So it really allows, so a hub basically takes anything and broadcasts it out. A switch, on the other hand, is very deliberate about get, receiving a packet and then sending that packet on a very specific path. And one of the things that that, that brings us in terms of bandwidth, we talked about bandwidth on the first slide, you see when you purchase these devices, they're rated for a certain amount of bandwidth. You'll see hubs with 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second. You'll see switches with 10 or 100 or even 1,000 megabits per second if they're a gigabit switch. One of the very important differences that even I didn't learn right away when I started learning is that with a hub, because of the broadcast nature of the technology, that bandwidth advertised on the device is shared. So that hub can support 100 megabits per second across all of its ports at any given time. So if I'm sending a large file to a server or to another computer in my house and someone else decides to send a large file to another computer, my bandwidth gets essentially cut in half so that they can have some to use as well. Switches, because they have addressable ports and can keep track of where traffic is supposed to go, that is not the case. Switches, that traffic is available to every port at any given time. Now, if, you're, if you have two computers, say, sending a large file to the same computer, you're still going to run into bandwidth issues because now you've got the same two ports bringing in traffic, but only one sending it out. But the switch as a product is, is technically able to support all of that bandwidth per port. Okay, so next, we've, so we've talked about the hub, we've talked about the switch. Now let's talk about a router. So if we look at the slide, uh, basically you see that the configurations look very similar. The hub, the switch, the router. Uh, there, there's what we refer to as a star. Uh, topology here. So all these devices star into the router. The router enables computers to communicate to a different network. Mm -hmm. We haven't quite talked about that yet. Uh, the easiest thing to think about is, and the way most people think about routers is, a router enables me to communicate with the internet. Yep. So I have my home network, my work network, uh, it has one LAN, uh, one type of network on it. Uh, I use my router and it enables me to connect to another network at this point being the internet. It's the best example that, that we can come up with pretty much any time. Okay, so if we look at the graphic here, uh, we see that the internet, that big huge cloud, and Christopher's using some very uh, basic graphics here. So when you see a cloud like this, they're typically referring to the internet. When you see a device in the middle like this, that's typically referring to a hub, a switch, a router. Uh, the kind of block on the left, typically a server. Uh, the one on the right with the monitor and the block, the computer, is a computer. And then the basic one on the bottom is a laptop. So we talk about documenting your network. This is the type of uh, icons that you'll use to document your network. Potentially, yeah. So we've talked about hubs, we've talked about switches, we've talked about routers. Now let's talk about how we get devices connected to a hub, a device, a router. So basically, how do we get connected to the network? Sounds about right. Okay. So we have a network adapter. I'm sure pretty much if anyone has looked at their computer, uh, laptop, desktop, whatever, they've probably seen this type of port. Uh, for those of you that are a little bit older and are familiar with uh, hard LAN telephones, I'm dating myself here. I just talked about a hard LAN telephone, a hardwired telephone. This looks like a hardwired telephone jack. I just think it's funny that we're talking about it in that context. For the older folk out there, you'll remember back when we had telephones. <laughs> I know. Remember when we had when wires. We had, when we had to plug a phone into the wall exactly. with the cable. And you had to dial the phone. <laughs> so basically what we have here is this is an RJ45 jack oriented piece of hardware. RJ45 jack is just a little bit wider than a telephone. So that is the connection area for the computer, for the wire. And then what you see on the other slide here is the RJ45 jack that you use to connect to the computer. This is for what we would refer to as a wired yep, network. Absolutely. As opposed to wireless. Most people at this point are probably more familiar with wireless than they are with wired, but 
if you're going into, into networking and, and want to understand, these are still terms that you need to know and need to, need to understand. Well, and if you're looking to go into networking from a business standpoint, if you're looking to maybe start an IT career, advance an IT career, these are terms you're going to want to know because a lot of corporate networks aren't wireless. Uh, they provide wireless. Here at Microsoft, we have wireless networks that I can connect a laptop to any time. But if I sit down in my office at my desktop or even with my laptop, I have a wire that I can plug into. And if you're responsible for managing, setting up, designing a network, wired is going to be a large part of what you're doing. Well, and even though your network has wireless in it, most likely when we, t we talk about servers, servers are going to be wired. Yeah, absolutely. So there's going to be part of your network infrastructure that does have wires associated with it. Yeah. Um, I can actually tell, I was looking at the pictures and I'm remembering funny stories. Back when I was learning how to do all of this, how to, how to build a network. I was 14, 15 years old. I had gotten a copy of NT4 perfectly legitimately from a reputable source. And I had, I just wanted to learn. And I tend to learn by doing. So I, I put NT4 workstation on a computer in my bedroom. I put NT4 server on a computer downstairs. This is my parents' house. I went to some store, I can't remember what the store was or if it even exists anymore, and I bought a kit. And this kit came with a little 10100 hub and two 10100 network cards. And I had to install the network cards in both of these computers, and I had to put the hub on the stairs, like on the fourth or fifth step of my parents' house, and then run cables up and down the stairs to my bedroom and to the family room, which my parents loved. They were thrilled. The, the part of the reason I tell that story is because I still have those devices at my house. I still have the hub and at least one of the network cards. And I'm, one of these will actually frame them because it was my first networking experience ever. Was <laughs> going to the store, buying this stuff, and just setting it up at my parents' house and figuring out how it works. And for those of us that are kind of geeky and bent like that, that's what we remember. Like some people are like, oh, my first kiss, my first car. Hey, and not that your first kiss and your first car aren't awesome, but your first network card and the first time you get devices to intercommunicate, nothing better. It's a big just deal. Just saying. What are these IP addresses all about? <laughs> well, we'll have plenty of stories for that when we get to it. Okay, so we've talked about wired networks and how wired networks intercommunicate. We've also kind of hinted about wireless, so the ability to connect a device uh, without wires, and that's what people are most familiar with, whether it be uh, a phone, a tablet, uh, a laptop. Uh, you go into Starbucks, you go into wherever, you prop open your laptop and you start working and immediately have internet connectivity because of wireless. Yep. So the basic wireless device is a wireless access point. And a wireless access point is what's used on a network to allow wireless devices to connect to the hardwired network. We've talked about wired networks and that's going to be the backbone of any network, is going to be wired. And then you will have areas that allow wireless to connect to your wired network. Wireless access points are basically what do that. Yep. And they allow smartphones, PDAs, tablets, laptops, PCs nowadays. Say, even, even desktops, yeah, desktops will come with wireless adapters, so you can take it home, unbox it, set it up, you don't have to worry about it. It's just one less wire to junk up your office, bedroom, living room, wherever you put your computer. Well, and some of us enjoy uh, having the hub in the living room and a wire running to every bedroom. By some of us, it's like three of us, but we do. We love it. It's neat, you know, and tripping over it in the middle of the night just <laughs> reinforces that joy of, I have a network at home, I rock. Oh my goodness. Uh, but, you know, for those of us with families and stuff, with spouses who are like, yeah, you're not going to run wires all over the house. Thank God there's wireless. There's wireless. We can put wireless in. I can go to my bedroom, the kid's bedroom, whatever, and still have access to the network. Mm -hmm. It's demo time. Uh, it... We kind of drew straws, and we decided that Christopher was going to be Demo Dolly this time. So we're going to head over to Christopher's computer. And what do you have for us, Christopher? All right. Well, I think we're going to look at some... We're going to look at the devices we've talked about from a computer standpoint. We're going to start with a Device Manager. Actually, I'm going to start somewhere else. So on, on a modern PC, we're looking at a Windows 8 PC right here. I've, I've cleaned up the desktop. I've just put some shortcuts here that we're going to be using. But I don't want to start there. If you're a home user, if you're a, an office user who, again, is getting into networking, getting into IT, 
what you're going to be able to get to quickly and easily is right here. This little icon. And this little icon takes you to Network and Sharing Center. And I'm going to jump right into adapter settings. These are network cards. Now, two of these, the ones on the right, we're not going to pay any attention to. Those are not what we're talking about from a, from a LAN standpoint. This right here is a, a software representation of the network card in my computer and the properties associated to it. So we have protocols in here. We have different connection items. We're going to talk about all of this later. But for now, we're going to close this, and I'm going to show you a little bit different view of essentially the same information. So back to our desktop, and I'm going to actually open Control Panel. And once we're in Control Panel, a couple of different ways we can get to this information. One of the joys of Microsoft, they like to give us five ways to do everything, which is terrific. You get to pick the one that works best for you. We're going to open up Device Manager, and we're going to take a look at network devices from a, a device manager standpoint, right here in our network adapters. And again, we see the same adapter as we saw before. This one, when you come into properties, it's a little bit different. These are actual hardware properties and hardware settings that we're looking at and can change. There are many, many settings on a network adapter, on a network card that can be changed. We're not going to get into these details. You don't need these details for the sake of this exam. So you can take a look at this. You can play with these if you want to, if you have a network where it's not crucial that you're connected to it because changing some of these may at least intermittently disconnect you from that network. And our last bit is an actual IP address. I'm going to look at this from, unfortunately, the way this computer's set up, I can't go into those property sheets to look at an IP address. Um, I can do this. And I can do IP config, which is a tool we're going to learn more about later in much, much detail. And this gives me an IP address. 10.0.0.39 in this case is the IP address on this computer. Above that, you'll see an IPv6 address. We're going to talk about IPv6. We're actually going to talk about everything you're seeing, IP addresses, the IP protocol, the internet protocol, the different versions. All of this will be discussed in, in more detail later on in this content. I'm going to close that. We're going to hand this back off to Thomas. OK, great. Thanks for the demo, Christopher. No problem. We, and when I say we, I'm talking about myself and the audience, Appreciate your hard work. Well, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so next up, serial data transfer. So how is information basically transferred or a method of transferring data across the wire? One way is serial, serial data transfer. And what this refers to is the transfer of information one bit at a time, very similar to like a single lane highway. So as cars get on the single lane highway one at a time, uh, and go to their different destinations. Uh, on a network cable, the data travels in one specific direction in a single stream. So serial data transfer, there's also data transfer rates. So how fast can data be transferred across these different media? Uh, they define maximum bits per second, BPS, that can be transmitted over a network, typically rated in bits. Uh, using a lowercase b, for example, 10 or 100 megabits per second. Uh, the lowercase b differentiates this uh, from the uppercase b. Uppercase b bytes, typically hard drive and RAM. Uh, bits, network communication, uh, lowercase b. So to, to kind of bring a real world example to that, because it's, this is something that people actually interact with and I'm not sure they realize it most of the time, when you go to your cable provider, your DSL provider, whoever's providing internet, say at your house or at your office, and you run speed tests, you know, my internet's running slow, I need to go look at why it's running so slow, they're gonna do data transfers to test that throughput. Those data transfers are gonna be represented most of the time in bytes. So when I go to my provider and I run a speed test, it's gonna show me a little meter with a little needle. That needle's gonna show me bytes, megabytes per second to get megabits per second, to get the actual speed of that internet connection as advertised by that provider, because a byte is eight bits, you have to divide or multiply that case, that byte number by eight to get your megabits per second. So if my, if my speed test shows two megabytes per second download, and I say, well, I bought a 16 meg line from my provider, so why is it only two? If you multiply that two megabytes per second that the screen is showing me by bits, by eight, I get 16 megabits per second, and my internet connection is running the way it should. 
Nice. nice. See, you learn something every day. You do. Okay, our types of transfers, there's broadcast and unicast. Broadcast is basically information being sent to all devices. Uh, unicast is information being sent to a specific device. So broadcast, the way to think of broadcast, an example, uh, radio. So somebody talking over a radio, that gets sent to multiple devices. Unicast, walkie-talkie. So when you're on a walkie-talkie, those are only going in between those two devices. IP addresses. So we've talked about devices on the network. We've talked about broadcast. We've talked about unicast. How does a device know, or how do devices know, a specific device that is being sent information? They use an IP address. An IP address is similar to, here in the States, we use social security numbers to uniquely identify each person. Uh, Networks use IP addresses. Christopher talked about MAC addresses, media access control addresses. Those are the hardware addresses that are physically associated to the computer. IP addresses are addresses associated by the TCP IP protocol associated to the MAC address. Again, this lets devices know who one device, who two devices are talking to. So when they say, hey, I'm talking to 192.128.1.1, they know, hey, 128 or 192.128.1.1 is this specific device, and it allows device intercommunication. Most devices connected to a network have an IP address, and Devices that we might not even think about. Again, we go back to that list of wireless devices. A phone, a tablet, a PC, a laptop. These could all be a router, a switch. These could all be devices that have an IP address. Potentially, yeah. Again, they uniquely identify devices on the network. Uh, they give an example here, 192.168.1.1. And every IP address is broken down actually into two components, a network component and a host component. The network ID basically shows what network the system is on, and then the host ID says, hey, this specific device. And by, by what network the device is on, what, what do you mean by that? So you've talked about bandwidth, and we've talked about local area networks. A local area network is, and one we've said it's a geographic area. So it's a geographic area that shares the same network ID. The same network ID, all devices on a network share the same network ID. And in our example here, the 192.168.1.1, the network ID is 192.168.1. So all devices that share this first three numbers are all on the same network. The dot one uniquely identifies a device. Now we talked about a hub, a switch, and a router. All devices on 192.168.1 are all able to communicate, communicate using a hub or a switch. To communicate with a device on a different network, uh, using this example, 192.168.2, we would need a router device. This allows us to basically create areas where we have bandwidth. So we're going to have these devices using this set of bandwidth in this network. Then we're going to have another network over here of a different group of devices that again share bandwidth. Then we can use a router to interconnect these two different networks. Mm -hmm. So if we look at a local area network, as Christopher had just mentioned, uh, you'll see here, again, using our documentation kind of standards, some different items here. You see some servers, you see some routers and switches, uh, you see the internet, the brick wall is typically what's used for a firewall. Yep, and I, I put that in here with a note to myself that a firewall, especially in this representation, is essentially a router with additional functionality. Firewalls are going to allow you to interconnect two networks 
but with a large amount, depending on the firewall you're using, of security ability that a typical router may or may not have. So it sounds like your firewall is basically your gatekeeper that allows your devices from your network to communicate to the internet, but the internet, all of the internet, not to be able to communicate directly to your devices yeah, we don't inside. Want, we don't want that necessarily. And that's how we create like denial of service attacks and things like that is firewalls not being properly set up and allowing what you could refer to as malicious communication to come in from the internet into your internal network. Yep. Or, or sometimes externally. I don't know if we'll get into those details today, but sometimes firewalls can be used for containment. If something has managed to get to my network, has you know, a virus, malware, some sort of other potential security issue that could happen inside a network, that firewall may keep it contained. If I have other sites that I don't want it to get out to, there's a lot of, it, we get into security, we'll be here for weeks and weeks and weeks. Very good, very good. And then notice, let's actually go back to the graphic really quick. Notice uh, we also have a wireless access point here. So we have our wired network, we have our firewall, we have internet connectivity, we have devices connecting to hubs, we have servers. We also have a wireless access point and wireless devices connecting to the network. Yeah, this is, this is pretty representative of, of really any network. Uh, this could be at your house, although maybe on a smaller scale. This could be your office on any scale. This could be here at Microsoft on a massive and global scale. But at the end of the day, these are the pieces that make it up. Devices, servers, switches, firewalls, wireless access points. It gets much more complicated when you get into the details, but this is the general idea. So at, at this point, people have a pretty decent understanding. Now it's just about scale. Yeah. So all these components, and these components, we've simplified stuff, and things in a basically production environment might be a lot more complex, but these basic hub, router, switches, client, server, peer, wireless access point. These are all things that you'll find in your neighborhood, yep. basically. And in some cases in my living room, or in you know someone's living room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Virtual LAN. So a VLAN is a group of hosts with a common set of requirements that communicate as if they were con connected together in a normal fashion on one switch regardless of their physical location. Okay, so let's take a look at what that means. We've talked about the fact that a switch has the ability to know the device at the end of the port. Mm -hmm. So hey, this is device one, this is device two. So a virtual LAN allows us to group those devices together. So hey, devices on ports one, five, and 10 are on a single network or yeah. virtual LAN. And what that allows me to do is it, it lets me take a switch, which is not necessarily a, the smartest of network devices. It's not built for subdivision. And it lets me subdivide. It lets me say ports 1, 5, and 10 are isolated. I want those three computers to talk to themselves. I don't want them to talk to anything else or anything else to talk to them. So in this case, we've got computers connected to you know, three servers, three workstations, and a wireless access point connected to six of the 10 ports on this hypothetical switch and we've divided it according to the table on the left. This is called tagging. You're gonna go into that switch, you're gonna pull up the configuration for those ports, you're gonna VLAN tag those ports with an ID. In this case, the IDs I've listed on the left, one and two, we've basically divided this into two different networks. So ports one and two, if we go from the upper left to the lower right, the way we normally read, the first two computers, the first server, and the third server, are all in the same VLAN and the wireless access point. So those two PCs are wireless devices and two of the three servers are talking to each other, connected to each other, fully functional as a network. However, port three, which is our third PC, and port seven, which is our second server, are isolated. They're still connected to each other. They can still talk to each other. They cannot necessarily talk to the other devices on that switch. And so an example of this might be your accounting department. Maybe you don't want your accounting department the information there, uh, maybe they're working on super secret projects, or you just don't want accounting information on the rest of the network, you can separate the accounting area out. And so none of the servers, even though they're all on the same physical network, 
logically, they can't talk to each other. Correct. And I could use a router to do that. I mean, I could use a router to physically separate those networks, but they're expensive. Part of the reason VLANs kind of came to be, it's a slightly less, well, in some cases, a considerably less expensive way to do this isolation. So basically, we're using software implementation instead of a hardware implementation for this virtual network. Yep, in this case. Okay, network topologies. Network topologies basically is how the network is physically laid out. Uh, there are different types of network topologies, bus, ring, star, mesh, and tree. If we look at our graphic here, the bus, ring, and star, mesh, and tree refer to a physical layout. So bus, basically in line. This is old style coax ethernet. Uh, basically what you would have is a single coax cable that would run from one area to another. Uh, as you hook devices in, you had a little T connector. Uh, you would start uh, the cable, you'd hook it into one area of the T, so you have basically this T connector, the cable comes in one area, this connects to the device, this cable runs out this area, and then this device is now in line with the rest. The end device, you would have to basically put an end cap on to finish it up, and if any of the devices got disconnected or the signal didn't go quite right, your whole network went down. Yep. Uh, the best way to think about that, Christmas tree lights. Who hasn't fought over Christmas tree lights? The one bulb goes dead, all your bulbs go dead, and now you're sitting there, you know, drinking your sorrows away. Not that I advocate drinking, um, but drinking your sorrows away because you got to sit there with, what, a bazillion bulbs, and then try and pick one out, put the new one in. And so, basically, that's an example of that topology. Yep. All not, that Christmas light drinking thing, all for that example. Exactly. Not much that you're going to see, luckily, for the sake of Thomas's not advocating drinking, luckily not a topology you see much anymore. Uh, ring. Ring is basically things connected in a ring fashion. And typically when we refer to ring, that's more a logical topology than a physical topology. Yeah, the, the funny thing, we have a slide here in a minute that talks more about rings and mentions that the ring topology, even though it is a circle, actually is a number of devices connected to a central device. So it's one of the fun things I've had teaching over the years when I'm in different classes talking about networking, is that we show these graphics that are very simple representations of a bus, a ring, and a star, and then I say, well, technically a ring is going to look like a star. But it, it works logically as a ring. As a ring, yes. Okay, which brings us to star and we've seen evidence of this before. If you think of that middle piece, that purple piece, that's the hub. Or the switch, yeah. Or the switch, and then all the green is the cable, uh, the purple is all the devices, and um, basically all that interconnection. Mesh, mesh is Ted Nugent double eyed free for all. Yeah. M mesh is basically everything connected to everything else. Mesh is what you would have to do if you wanted a star without the central device. So I want to connect my computer to the three other computers on my network. I don't have one box that I can plug one cable into that the cables from those are plugged into as well. I have to physically, and I've never actually seen, I, I don't know if this is good or bad, I've never seen a mesh implementation at this level, at a network level. I, I haven't either. Uh, mesh, they, they tout that it's for fault tolerance, but nowadays, and, and I think that was kind of in the day when hubs and switches uh, were, tended to fault a lot more. Uh, and I think now with hardware being the way it is, switches, hubs, routers being as decent as they are, we've kind of gone away from mesh. Well, you will still see mesh in some instances. The biggest thing I can think of right off the top of my head where you'll see a mesh topology is in fiber channel. If you're doing sh uh, centralized sh shared storage, what's called a SAN, which we won't cover in this class, uh, the connectivity to SANs in the back end in a server room, they tend to create a mesh topology. You're going to have multiple switches connected to a SAN. Those switches are going to connect to multiple servers. And in most cases, those servers will connect to both switches. The switches will both connect to the server or the SAN in the back end. It is a fault tolerance. It's exactly what it's for. It's to make sure that there's always a path between the storage and the server. So that's the best example I've seen mesh topologies in the world still today. You usually won't see it at the host level. Well, and tend, they tend to use mesh 
at also a router level. So all your routers tend to be more interconnected than not. Yep. Uh, one thing that they'll, they'll refer to that's not on the slide is hybrids. And that's pretty typical. So you'll have an area of mesh, an area of ring, an area of star, uh, and all of these kind of collapse together. Yeah, potentially. And then finally, tree. I think Christopher was thinking about hiking when he wrote the slide, so I'm going to throw a tree to Christopher. Sure, throw, throw a tree to me. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy for tree. I mean, it's not, again, it's not very common. We just kind of put it on here because it's information for people to have. It's, it just kind of exists. It's, it's almost like bus. I should move bus down to the bottom of this list only because it's just, it's not around anymore. Okay. So, not fair. something you'll need to know. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So we've talked about network topologies. Uh, let's dive into star topology a little bit more. Again, we've seen examples of this numerous times. Uh, it's the most common topology. Basically, this is your switch hub router device, and then all your uh, network devices are connected to it, per the example here. Uh, the next one, mesh. Uh, again, we, we've talked about this. Not real world for computers. It, it's more like you said for SAN storage or routers or, but basically you see here that all systems are interconnected to every other system. A little expensive, that one. Well, and if you, things that people don't think about is you need a network card and network port for each of these cables. So for everything that's incoming, you're going to need network cards, you're going to need cabling. So as Christopher said, this can be kind of expensive. So ring topology. As we mentioned earlier, although it logically functions as a ring, it physically works as a star. Uh, token ring uses this. Fiber distributed data interface, FDDI, uses this. But like I said, typically the physical layout is a star layout. Device is plugged into a central connecting point. Uh, the typically token ring uses a star topology, and actually it's, next that's slide. Very fitting, yeah. Next slide. So token ring. The idea for token ring is you have the talking stick. If you don't have the talking stick, you don't get to talk. And in this case, the talking stick is a token. Mm -hmm that's passed around in, in an orderly fashion. And when a device receives the token, the you can talk token, if it needs to talk, then it puts information on the network. If it doesn't need to talk, it says, hey, I don't need to talk, and basically passes the token to the next designated device. And then the data passes the same way. So if I get the talking stick and I'm allowed to talk and I need to talk to computer four, and I'm computer one, I'm gonna send data. That data is gonna, very similar to what we talked about earlier with the hub, it's going to visit each device, and those devices are going to say, you're not for me. You're, this is my data. Pass it on to the next one. Not the most efficient. And then finally, Ethernet. Ethernet is a physical topology. It's from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, and it's standard 802.3. So we talked about standards, the English language, protocols, this is the protocol or the standard that allows devices to physically connect to a network. Uh, it mentions that internet is, or Ethernet is the de facto standard. There's multiple types of standards here. There's uh, ones that have been voted in uh, that a whole bunch of groups agree on and say, hey, we're going to make this the standard. There's also the de facto standard. So this is the standard that we've used forever, so we're just going to agree that this is what we're going to use. Yep. Some examples of some Ethernet include 802.3U, or fast Ethernet that runs at 100 megabits per second, or 802.3AB, or gigabit Ethernet. Which is 1,000 megabits per second. Hmm. So we have Ethernet, which is a representation of the physical media and how information is put on that physical media. Well, information is put on the physical media in frames. Basically, the way to think of a frame, 
you could think of it like a postcard. A postcard has areas that you write in. It has an area that you write information to, uh, dear Aunt Joan, I'm having a great time, uh, glad you're not here, okay, no, I really <laughs> miss you. Um, so it has the, the body of data. It also has the address information and the from information. So th that's a really simple way to think of a frame. A frame is going to have very similar type of information. Yep. And the slide covers some of that. We've got this broken down into pieces. I didn't, I didn't define all of the pieces of a frame. These are actually representative of the areas of a frame, but I didn't label them all because it's not that level of detail is not required. But in this case, our preamble is going to be that that to and from. Where's this going? Where's it coming from? The data, which is the bulk of obviously what we're sending, and then at the end, CRC is a checking to make sure that the the, the frame is complete when it gets when it gets received. So basically, a CRC allows when Aunt Joan receives her card, she can look at the CRC and ensure that nobody wrote other information on that card. Well, in this case, it's more, it's the same idea, yeah, just to make sure that the card's complete. In this case, you're going to look at the postcard and see that it's got all four corners and all the stuff's written on it. There's no eraser marks, there's nothing torn off. That's kind of what CRC is. Now, we're, going to, uh, we're actually going to mess with this definition pretty considerably later on as we go through the layers of the OSI model, which we're going to talk about, and frames are just one piece of between if I'm sitting at a computer and I want to send a file to you between me telling the computer to send that file to you and it getting to you that file undergoes a number of changes and frames are just one of the stages of change but we'll talk about that more in right. detail later right uh, as mentioned uh, the frame is layer two of the OSI model teaser there's seven Layers of the OSI model, which, as you said, we'll talk about later. Centralized computing. There's a couple different types of computing. Uh, one is centralized. This is computing done at a centralized computing. So basically what this allows is a central device has all the computing power, it's not uncommon for the systems that are interconnected to it to be referred to as dummy terminals. Mm -hmm. uh, this is more a mainframe environment. And in the mainframe environment, these dummy terminals boot up, and any processing done is done by the mainframe system. Uh, the dummy terminals typically have a keyboard and a monitor, and that's about it, at least in a mainframe environment. Uh, they're, like I said, they're referred to as dummy terminals. And these devices solely are keyboard and monitor. Well, and I think to myself, in my head, my first thought is, the people watching this video, go ask your parents what a green screen is, and they might be able to tell you. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's the first thing I get in my head when I talk about terminals, I talk about green screens back in the day. So it hurts me that I'm now the person saying, kids, go ask your parents. What go that ask means. your parents about it. Well, the old Weiss terminals. Yep, exactly. And all the, Weiss still has terminals. Well, I'm not trying to say Weiss is no longer valid. Well, and... There's a saying, and it holds true in IT very, very well, which is what was old is new again. So 25, 30 years ago, there were these dumb terminals, these green screens connected to mainframes. Nowadays, we have terminals, still Weiss terminals, or there are various different vendors that create these, what are called thin clients. It's a box that doesn't really have an operating system on it that connects you to a server that gives you a full, in this case, Windows operating system. We're not getting into those details. Uh, remote desktop services is the overarching, which you you can speak to at some point in the next couple of modules, uh, is the overarching technology, but we're not going to cover that in this course much. Okay, fair enough. So after centralized computing, we have client-server model. In a client-server model, as I mentioned earlier, a client requests services. A server fulfills services. Uh, server uh, systems could be Windows Server 2008, Windows Server 2012, a client could be Windows 7. Uh, a server could also be Windows 7. Could be, technically. Yes, yeah, and we'll actually talk about that next in peer-to-peer -peer networking. In peer-to-peer -peer networking, we've talked about a client, a device that requests services, a server, a device that fulfills services. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, a device can function as either or. 
It can request services from another device, or it can fulfill services from another device. File sharing is an example of a peer-to-peer -peer system. And in some small offices, they may find that a peer-to-peer -peer network works okay for them. They don't need a centralized server to run their systems. Certain expenses related to that centralization. So if you've got five to 10 computers, it's a decision point, I guess you could say. Exactly. Yep. After peer-to-peer -peer networking, distributed computing. Distributing computing is basically a hybrid type of environment. It includes both client server and peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, every device has its own processing power. So now we're getting away from, say, dummy terminals, and we're getting more into, as you mentioned, thin clients. So each device has the ability to process its own information, but it may still request information from other devices. Yep, and, and in this case, uh, distributed computing, we, when we say both client server and peer-to-peer, -peer, we're at Microsoft. Microsoft is very much a client server environment. We have servers, we have clients, but it doesn't stop me as a user from creating a folder, putting content in it, and sharing it out to the network for other users to access. I'm now making kind of a peer-to-peer -peer connection on this very large client server network. Hey, look, remote desktop services and remote sessions. Shocked that that slide made it in here. <laughs> Shocking. I think I put this back in here. Uh, as we mentioned, as Christopher mentioned earlier, everything old is new again. Uh, centralized computing's made a comeback of sorts. Remote desktop services and remote sessions to computers are based off the centralized computing model. So basically what we have here is in remote desktop services is the ability from one system to do what we refer to as presentation virtualization. So now over the network, I'm just getting a screen. So all the processing power is done at a central location and all I'm receiving are screen updates. Thomas, you may say, I don't understand the benefit of this. Well, in a large network, uh, thousands of clients, maybe you're looking at you're running an older version of your client OS, and you now want to update what client OS your systems are running on. Time for 8.1, when it's available. Exactly, exactly. So now, what we might want to look at is instead of that hardware cost of updating all those clients, to enable them to run the new OS, as a method, you may want to use remote desktop services. So now, my older client can run a newer operating system, but the operating system isn't run locally. Another example of why you might, I can do this all day. Well, I was gonna say, I was gonna say the reverse might actually be true. We've decided to put all of our new, or our, we've decided to send all of our old computers out to pasture. It's time, the 10 years old, we're running Windows XP. We don't want to run Windows XP anymore, which nobody should be running Windows XP anymore. Um, but there are applications I have that have been written for XP that only run on XP. Well, we're going to get every computer out of the building and we're going to replace them with brand new shiny hardware and Windows 8.1. I can't run my applications on Windows 8.1. Someone on the network, some administrator can set up remote desktop services to allow me to remote in and run that application in an older environment, in XP and Windows 7, elsewhere. And at that point, all your data... Uh, is held uh, at a central location. Oh, uh, potentially. Yeah. So as an uh, employer, what you could do is you could have your centralized server running remote desktop services. You could have people that remote desktop service in, use remote desktop connection, connect in. Now you have a bit of security added because if they lose their data or their, or not their data, but their laptop, their physical device, all their information is still stored in that central location. Absolutely. To get them up and running, all you need to do is get them a new device, they connect to the remote desktop, and boom, they're up and running yep. again. Servers. So servers, again, the easy definition, they provide services. Well, what type of services do they provide? Uh, what don't they provide? In this case, we've just put a couple of on here that are the most obvious examples, file services. 90% of the people out there, regardless of IT career or just user in an office or at home, are familiar with file sharing, with getting a file off of another computer, 
um, getting a file in some cases off a central computer. That's the easiest example. Uh, print services in most offices, especially here, I don't have 100 printers connected to my computer at my desk. But I might want to print in color. I might want to print in black and white. I might want to print different sizes. I might want a plotter so I can print posters. I'm not going to plug all those devices into my computer. And there are 100,000 people who also might want to use those printers. I can plug all of those printers into a centralized server and provide those printers through services to the entire network. Uh, the rest of these database, messaging, email, web, it's similar to some of our other lists we've had. These can go on for days and days and days. So we have a list here of client and server operating systems. This, no, this list is by no means uh, inclusive of everything. We've just listed some Microsoft ones here. It's weird. Weird that this would only show Microsoft huh. software on it. Huh. How did that happen? Hmm. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, crazy. And as we said, uh, remember there's client, there's server, there's peer. And some of these devices can kind of, or some of these operating systems can basically function as both. Yeah. Peer to peer or P to P uh, has recently taken on additional meaning because we're kind of used to, hey, offices, or I'm sorry, devices in our office uh, have interconnected. Uh, the secretary wants to share something with the manager using peer-to-peer, -peer, they share that file. Now there are specific file sharing networks. Uh, Napster, Nutilla, G2. The public file sharing networks. Public, correct, correct. Um, other technologies also that we may not even think about take advantage of P2P file sharing. Skype, voice over IP, or cloud computing. We're not going to go to near cloud computing. We could. We could. We could spend another week on, we could oh, spend a month on cloud computing. There would be good stuff to be had. That's a great conversation. Yeah, it is. Keep it, in fact, we're going to hope to have more of those here in MBA. So if once you've learned networking, you decide to go from the beginning end to the finishing end in terms of knowledge and, and architecture, we're going to have lots and lots of cloud content eventually. Well, and I believe that you can download these. So you can listen to them on your device as you ride the bus or while somebody else is watching a TV show in your house that you don't care about. Absolutely. Or whatever. So, I mean, you could consume these. I watch NBA sessions at the gym. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. I'm kind of, I'm kind of an uber geek. <laughs> Get me on a treadmill and I'll just listen to an NBA course on Server 2012, what's new coming up any, anytime. It's just a good way to keep up on the different technologies. Technology, there's two things. It's a treadmill. It never stops. And it's a fire hose. Information comes at you at such a high rate of speed that, yeah. So think fire hose, think treadmill. Uh, but also, there's a lot of information to be had. As I've mentioned earlier, think hug because we're going to give it to you in a really gentle, nice manner. And just make sure that you get the good stuff. Hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully you think it's gentle and nice. We'll, we'll see how that, you know, we get evaled <laughs> on all this. So you can let us know. Okay. So now we're kind of at a summary about what we've talked about. So we've talked about understanding local area networks, uh, LAN elements, design perimeter networks, IP addressing, and LAN types. We've talked about understanding network topologies and access methods. Uh, topologies, star, ring, mesh. Uh, we've addressed ethernet architecture, client server, peer-to-peer -peer networking models. We've actually covered quite a bit of content. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, you should, and this is just the tiniest tip of the iceberg. But the great thing is, is they can hit pause, walk away, go get a refreshment, go outside. They may already be outside. I'm actually thinking, well, yeah, they, we should work on that. <laughs> I'm thinking at some point that, uh, that we're, we're about to go get a refreshment as well, I think. I, we're, yeah, we're about, so let's look at some additional resources and next steps. And you're actually going to see this slide as we, as we go through each of these modules. Uh, we like to give you next steps. We don't want to give you this information and then just leave you sitting there like, well, now what do I do? Well, step one, I mean, obviously, next step, go get a new job if you want to. Hey, I learned some networking essentials. Let's go get a job. Hey, not saying your current job is bad. Exactly. We're not labeling. No labels here. But if you want to do something new and fun, this is a good start. So from a Microsoft standpoint, we offer some books. In this case, we have a, we have a specific study guide for this exam, the 98366 MTA Networking Fundamentals, it's a Microsoft official academic course. You can buy that book just about anywhere. Instructor-led courses, this one's a little more complicated. I put four of them on here because 
once you've done the networking MBA course, you may want more depth, you may want more breadth, you may want more information, you may even want some hands-on. You may want to go into a room and play with cabling and play with network cards and connect some computers together. We offer courses, instructor-led, in-class courses for this course, for the other courses that were the prerequisites, operating system fundamentals and server fundamentals. And then the last one on there is the actual exam. If you feel like after this course you want to go give that a shot, if you want to take an instructor-led course and then go give that a shot, exam 98-366 is our Networking Fundamentals Microsoft Technology Associate exam. I think that's pretty much all we have for this module. So, I, I uh, think that's it. Yeah. I mean, we've covered some really good stuff here. We've covered some really good basics. Uh, I, I would say people are, personally, I think people are ready for more. I think so. So we're going to let them get a drink and we're going to come back and give them some more. Okay. We'll see you really soon. Welcome back. We're here for some more networking fundamentals. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed what you've seen so far. It's not too much, too little, just right. Again, referencing Thomas's comments earlier about a hug of knowledge as we present more and more of this to you over the next couple of modules. Uh, we're gonna dive right into our module two. We're gonna start talking about the OSI model today and I'm gonna hand it right off. Okay, so module two, defining networks with the OSI module. Again, uh, let's talk about skill concepts for purposes of testing. Uh, the skills and concepts here are understanding OSI basics, defining the communications subnetwork, and defining the upper OSI layers, and defining the communications subnetwork. Standards. So we talked earlier about the English language, and because the English language has rules, that gives Christopher and I the ability, even if since we've grown up in different parts of the country, to still be able to communicate effectively. And maybe English speakers from other areas, uh, we can still communicate effectively with those people. Standards allow devices, well, different manufacturers from, for hardware and software to be able to create hardware and software that intercommunicate. Uh, there are a set of rules that ensure this communication. Uh, some examples of org organizations that coordinate standards include the International Organization for Standards, the ISO. Now you may think, hey, organizational or International Organization for Standardization, ISO, well that doesn't match up. Well actually, since it's international, different countries have different names for this, so they've just standardized on the ISO format. And this is basically federation of standards from multiple nations, as I said. The American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, responsible for coordinating and publishing computer and information technology standards in the US. And then finally, the IEEE, International Electrical and Electronics Engineers, a uh, professional organization for the electrical and electronics field. Uh, people probably have heard of uh, IEEE 802.3 or IEEE 802... There's 802, really. It's, 802. There's a whole suite of standards within the 802 standard that we use all the time. Correct. Wireless, the, biggest one probably right now. Wireless, wired, Ethernet, all from these IEEE standards. Yep. So these standards are things that we use every day and don't even think about it. And that's part of the, uh, that's the good part is the idea of a network is to be able to seamlessly access resources without you having to think about it. I can pick up my device, I can access my Facebook account, internet, web browse, uh, my files in SkyDrive, Dropbox, whatever. And again, it's seamless. I, as a user, don't need to know anything, but as people wanting to become more familiar with networking will learn that these are the standards committees that help make that happen. Yep, they're the ones that make it simple for everybody to talk to everybody. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, the OSI, Open Systems Interconnect. This is what makes network communication possible. Essentially, yeah. Is this model. Uh, the model's divided into seven layers and each layer provides services above and below it. 
So let's take a look at these layers. We're going to talk more about them later, so we're just going to give real brief overviews of them here. Uh, layer 7, application layer, enables users and applications to access network services. People do get confused that they think that this is, as a user, a program that I use to access network services. It's not. It's the protocol the program I'm using uses to access network services. So just to clarify, layer 6, presentation layer, translates data into a common format. So we talked about ANSI. Another one is EBCDIC, and these are basically keyboard formats. Maybe different computers are using different formats. Uh, the presentation layer can translate that for you. The session layer, layer 5, establishes a communication session between devices. We've all been on the phone with somebody who they pick up the phone, you have your conversation, you've initiated a uh, conversation with them, uh, you've established connection, and then at the end of the conversation they don't say goodbye, they don't end the session Cleanly. seamlessly. Yeah, yeah, there's no clean, yeah, they're just hanging on, there's dead air, you don't know what's going on. So they don't have a very good session layer protocol is the problem there. Uh, layer 4, transport layer, manages message fragmentation and reassembly. Uh, layer 3, network layer, this manages data routing and creating subnetworks. We've talked a little bit about subnetworks when we talked about LANs. Uh, layer 2, data link layer, provides error-free transfer of data frames. And then finally, layer 1, physical layer, physical network media and signal strengths. Now, this model may seem kind of daunting, but again, this is the model that enables network communication. And people are always like, how am I going to remember this model? So, Christopher, you had one that you use. What, which one did you use? Um, so they're mnemonics. You can build mnemonics for this, this seven-layer system to remember uh, what these are in order, hopefully, to remember. The one I had, there are a couple. Uh, the one that I've always known is all people seem to need data processing. Top down. All, application, people, presentation, seam, session, to, transport, need, network, data, data link, processing, physical. All people seem to need data processing. Okay, can I give you mine now? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so, so my one that I've always been fond of, starting layer 7, application layer, a priest saw 10 nuns doing push-ups. Politically correct? Probably not, but you're going to remember it, aren't you? <laughs> there you go. You are welcome. And just for, just for fun, we also have one from the, from the bottom up. If you want to start layer one, please do not throw sausage pizza away. Just in case you want to Maybe it's about direction. lunchtime, you're it's, thinking about food. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. It works. So the funny thing is, I've been in IT a long time. I know the seven layers. I've known them the whole time. But I'm building this slide the other day, and I'm replacing you know, the, the, a graphic and turning it into an actual table so we can do more with it. And I actually use the mnemonic to write it out. So even though I know the layers, I'm like, oh, all process. I wanted to make sure that I had them all in the right order. So right, right. I refer to mnemonics I've been using for 15 years to. Oh, uh, they're they're really helpful. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of them. And those nuns doing push-ups, they're a fan too. So the OSI model layers, basically what we have here is as we mentioned, it allows devices to intercommunicate. So what you see here is one device on the left-hand side under the title uh, it needs to intercommunicate with the other device. Maybe it's requesting a web service, a file and print service, uh, maybe it's printing, whatever, there's communication. So the one starts, it goes through the different layers, and on the right-hand side of the table, it shows you what the data unit is called. Data, and then we get to segment, packet, frame, and then once we get to the physical layer, it becomes bits. It goes across the wire, that's our physical media, goes up the next one, and then basically it just gets deconstructed or reconstructed. So as the message goes down, it kind of gets deconstructed into the appropriate layer. As it hits the other side, it gets reconstructed. Well, and the terms I use, I didn't want to go into too much detail as I was building these slides because we want to give people the right amount of information for this exam and to have the information they're going to need to do the job, but not necessarily so much information like, you know what, after three slides, I don't need to watch this anymore, I'm going home. Uh, this, the, the protocol data units on the right, you're not going to hear that term very often, but what happens as the data moves from top to bottom, you start with a piece of data at the application layer, 
that is actually added to as you go from, from top to bottom. So you, it's either added to or, or in some cases broken apart. I start with a given amount of data, the next layer adds headers to that. The next layer breaks it into smaller consumable pieces to actually put on the wire and may add more information to those smaller pieces. So we're not gonna dive into the actual technical details of what happens to each layer, but that's what this is describing, is that that information is being, the data itself, your actual chunk of data is being modified, manipulated, broken apart, tagged, and built in a way that when it gets to the physical layer, those bits can be sent across and then successfully reassembled up the stack on the other side. So now let's go ahead and start taking a look at the different layers. Layer one, physical layer defines a physical and electrical media for data transfer. Whether this is wired or wireless, they need standards of some kind. You need to know how to build the media. Uh, for wireless, what signal strength do I use? What signal channel do I use? For wired, uh, what type of wires and cabling do I use? What type of jacks do I use? Uh, physical layer components include cables, jacks, patch panels, punch blocks, hubs, and mouths. Physical layer concepts, and we've talked about some of this already, topologies. So what the network physically looks like. Analog versus digital encoding. Uh, when we think of analog, think of the old style analog clock. So it can be any of a time uh, versus a digital. Digital clock is discrete. So it's either uh, 10.05 and then it becomes 10.06. Maybe your clock does, digital clock doesn't have seconds on it. So let's take seconds away. So your clock is 10.05 and then it flips over and becomes 10.06. The gradation displayed to you is just, it's one and then it's the next. For analog, so you have the analog, you have the hands on the clock, it can be any value within that system. So think of it that way, hands on a clock or digital media. Bit synchronization, baseband versus broadband, multiplexing and serial data transfer. We'll get into these topics more later. And the unit of measurements at this level is bits. So ethernet standards, we've talked about the ethernet. Uh, ethernet standards is basically the standard for communication over networks. Uh, this has a frame type, so how data is packaged and sent over the wire. It has a physical media that can be described. As Christopher mentioned earlier, 802 is the Ethernet standard. Well, dot three, uh, dot 11 are the different standards of Ethernet that describe frame type, uh, physical characteristics, electrical characteristics. All those are described in those standards. Uh, define physical and data link layers, so the first two layers. Uh, 100 base T is an example of an Ethernet standard. And to kind of break that down, the 100 stands for 100 megabit. Uh, the base is for baseband versus broadband. And T is for twisted pair cabling. Which we'll look at later as well. Yes. Baseband uh, refers to the fact that the networks use di digital signaling over a single frequency. Uh, broadband systems use analog signaling over a range of frequencies, enabling multiple channels over the same physical medium. So again, if we think of digital and analog, not to hammer this, but I think this is kind of an important concept to understand. Uh, for digital, if, you, um, if you're looking at here, digital is discrete. So with digital, the data is, so zeros and ones. It's here or it's here. So it's very discrete. For analog, it can be anywhere within this range. So anywhere within this range up here or down here can be analog. With an analog channel, devices can speak anywhere within this channel. For digital, you have these two areas. It can be here or it can be here. So again, something to think about, hands of a clock versus digital clocks. Layer two, data link layer. So the data link layer establishes, maintains, and decides how transfer is accomplished over the physical layer. So basically now what we're talking about are frame types. How is that content encapsulated and put over the wire? Christopher earlier mentioned MAC addresses, media access control addresses. 
They're defined at the data link layer. These are hexadecimal addresses assigned to a physical network card for or to uniquely identify these cards. And this, in this case, MAC addresses ensure, in theory, although I don't think I've ever seen an example of this in the real world, they ensure uniqueness worldwide for network devices. Correct. They actually, okay, so this is a little bit older, they had a problem where they gave, so for hexadecimal addresses, they assign different manufacturers different addressing schemes or different addressing assignments. For a while, they had, and I don't even remember the names of the companies, they gave them the same assignments. So okay. now they were putting out network cards that had the, the same, same max. The same max. I was at a training center, and again, this was a while ago, when people had problems with network cards and you had to be really careful with static electricity. Where So in a training center, you're moving, um, you're moving hardware. You're ripping open the case. You're removing network cards. So moving network cards, you use static would blow the address. So now you might have multiple systems that have the same MAC address. And the error that you would get is you'd bring one system online, it would be able to use the network. When you brought the other system online, it would blow the first system off the network. And then as you used each system on the network, it would blow the other system off the network. So, <laughs> Sounds uh, like fun. Oh, it was really interesting to troubleshoot. I imagine. I would say it was good times, but it was not good times. It was the opposite of good times, actually. So network interface cards and bridges are examples of devices at this layer. And the unit of measurement at this la layer is frames. So media access control, which we've talked a, a bit about already, uh, ensures unique addresses for the different devices. Uh, we've talked about what happens if devices don't have unique addresses. And manufacturers are typically assigned ranges of addresses. There are six octets in length written in hexadecimal. And we're actually going to see an example here on the next slide. So It's animated, so not just by clicking. Okay. We'll get to an example in just a moment. And props to Christopher. This is some of his graphic magic here. So know that all this graphic amazement is coming from Christopher. Unless you hate it, in which case it was someone else entirely. A vendor did it, yes. I guess. Um, layer 2 switches are hardware-based and use the MAC addresses of each host computer network when deciding where to direct data frames. We've talked a little bit about switches already. So ports on the switch are mapped to different MAC addresses on the system. So if we look here, we'll see that, hey, these two uh, ports are assigned to these two MAC addresses. So when a packet comes in, for a specific device, it will only send to that specific device. Yeah, and in this case, two things to note here. At the very top, it says layer two switches. That is a valid term, although 99% of the time when you hear the word switch, it's a layer two switch. We probably won't get too complicated in this session or, or in this course and talk about layer three switches, which do exist. Little, little much to go into, considering it's actually overlapping with routers and switches. We're not gonna go there. So usually when you hear the term switch, it's a layer two switch. And these addresses, they're not assigned per se to say the ports on this device, whereas a router is gonna have IP addresses on the device. These, it just keeps track of. The switch knows what's plugged into it. It creates a little table, so it knows port one is that first MAC address. Port six is that second MAC address. It just knows that itself. And so people aren't confused. People now will see devices that are switches and routers. So a lot of things that you'll see in the marketplace now, consumer-based devices, have multiple functionalities to them. That's true, and a lot of it, it's a couple of different things. One, it's the combining of functionality. A traditional router would have a network card for a network and a network card for another network, and that's what would plug into it, and it would do the routing between the two. What you see now at home, especially if you're seeing a router, you know, you go to the store and you buy a router for your, your internet, that is a router in that it does route traffic from your network to, in this case, the internet. It's also a switch because they've provided you four ports to plug computers in your home or in your small office into. So it does both. It's not one device, essentially it is two devices in that box. It's, it's a switch and a router at the same time. 
So VLANs, we've discussed VLANs a little bit already. Uh, layer two switching can also allow for virtual networking or virtual LANs to be implemented. Again, this enables you to segment different areas of the switch. So entire bandwidth isn't thrown over either the switch or you can allow communication of different segmented areas using the same switch. Mm -hmm. Another fun little, little animation for this one. Okay, so basically, like we just said, you can associate, hey, these four ports are one network, these three ports are another. Uh, maybe you have accounting on one network, you have management on another. You do not want those to intercommunicate. You can use a virtual LAN to mm -hmm. do so. Okay, so layer three, network layer. This controls the operation of routing and switching to different networks. So it's using the network layer that sub-networks are created. This translates logical addresses or names to physical addresses. So as a user, I go to www.microsoft.com. Mm -hmm. uh, the network layer is the one that translates that from that address or from that name to an address. So when this happens, since we've already gone over the first two layers, we could talk about this now in a, bit, in a broader context. I want to go to www.microsoft.com. I do that. There's a process in the background that goes on that sends an IP back to my computer. It says that name has this address. And here we see Internet Protocol is the network layer protocol. There are services that will translate the name to the number. Like we just talked about in layer two with MAC addresses, there are also services that translate that IP into a MAC address. Or throughout my network, ways to figure out that that MAC address isn't on my network and I need to route it out somewhere else to find it. So this name translation or number translation happens at multiple layers. It's another one of those things I was talking about where, where the packets are being modified as they go up and down. Each of those layers has protocols and applications within it that are doing things to make sure those packets get where they need to go. Uh, devices that work at this layer are routers and IP switches. Network layer components include IP addresses and subnets, and the unit of measurement at this level is packets. So we talked about layer two switches. Layer th three switches are basically switches that work at the network layer. So now instead of using the MAC address, we use the IP address. They have the same functionality, they just work at addressing at a different layer. Layer four, the transport layer. So we've talked about the physical layer, the data link layer, the network layer. Now we're going to talk about the transport layer. I'm sitting here listening, making sure he gets them all right. <laughs> As we're going through, Christopher's he's, he's testing throwing these out of my mind. We'll see how it goes. Uh, this layer ensure messages are delivered error free and in sequence with no losses or duplication. Protocols at this level perform segmentation, ensure correct reassembly, and perform message acknowledgement and message traffic control. So if I have a 10-page document, and with this 10-page document, let's go back to our postcard analogy. I have a 10-page document, and I can only fit 10 words on a postcard, and postcards are how I need to transmit information to Christopher. So as this goes down the stack, at a certain level, the transport layer, this 10-page document starts to get cut up into different smaller bite-sized pieces. These get put on postcards. When they hit the network level, it says, oh, oh, and another thing that the transport level does is, so now I've cut all these up, I've put them on postcards, well, I number them. I say, hey, this is number one, this is number two, this is number three. So when Christopher gets this information, he can reassemble in appropriate order. And make sure I'm not missing any. Exactly. So. Do my postcards, network layer, I address them. Uh, I get to the data link, that's me walking to the post office box, opening the uh, mailbox, and then the physical is me throwing it in, and then the mail carrier uh, handing those off to Christopher. Christopher gets them all and receives them, gets them out of the mail. Now, what he needs to do is, so it went down my stack, 
and now back up Christopher's stack, he needs to reassemble and reattach all this stuff. And because I've numbered them, he can look at them and say, oh, I didn't get 15, you need to resend me 15. The unit of measurement used here is segments or messages. And this layer contains both connection-oriented or connection-less uh, connections. So if we look here, connection-oriented communication, this requires both devices involved in the communication to establish an end-to-end -end communication. And I see Christopher smiling over here. I think he has something pretty exciting these for are, us. These are two of my favorite slides to have built. This is okay. actually kind of fun for me. So let's see what we have here. So at this point, okay, so the PC is saying, is basically, hey, I'm a PC, I'm going to need services. The server, hi, I'm a server, makes an acknowledgement. I want to send you something important. Okay, I will watch for it. So we have this back and forth communication of, that's a connection oriented communication. We're, we're aware that something's going to happen, we're making sure it happens correctly and properly and in order and in time. And again, as we mentioned, packets not received can be resent. Yep. So now let's look at connection less. So connection less, end to end connection is not necessary before data is sent. So connection oriented, Maybe I'm looking at a file transfer. Maybe I'm looking at a web page. Connectionless would be streaming a video. I don't necessarily need every frame, but I do need certain information. Um, so that information is kind of sent. We go back to our radio analogy where somebody's just talking. They don't know if the message is getting received or not. They're just sending the information out. That's kind of a connectionless communication. Every packet is sent. Still has a destination in the header, but we don't necessarily know if it's going to be received. So here the server, I have communication for you, listen to me, and here the client's kind of sleeping because there's no response. There's just, they're just listening. Server sent it out. Hopefully someone's listening. Yep. So connection based protocols. The transport layer contains both connection-oriented and connection-less. We have TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, that provides a connection-based system, and UDP, which provides a connection-less, unreliable transport system. TCP and UDP, so TCP transports used for logging in, file and print sharing, replication. So basically, when you need acknowledgement, you use TCP IP. UDP is used for one-to-many communications, broadcast, multicast, IP datagrams, audio streaming, uh, things of that nature that don't need to be acknowledged. Yep. Hopefully someone's listening and if things get dropped in transit. It, this is actually a protocol used in situations where packets can't be resent. Uh, the, one of the best examples I have of that is VoIP, voice over IP. If I have a phone that's working on an IP network and I'm having a conversation with somebody anywhere else, if the packet that I'm creating by talking into my device that's getting assembled and run through the layers and sent across the wire, if that packet doesn't make it, I can't rehave that millisecond of the conversation. It's just gone. So. Otherwise you get chop, jitter, Yep, which you'll uh, hear, you'll stutter. hear, you'll hear gaps and that's because there are packets that may not make it for any one of a thousand reasons and if they don't, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. Well, and there are certain things that say a, a conversation. If, as Christopher and I are having a conversation, I have to acknowledge every word he says, that's really going to delay the conversation. Uh, versus we go to a more connectionless system where he can speak uh, long sentences and then I can respond in long sentences. That's more of a connectionless system where he's hoping I'm getting most of his words and I hang on 85% of them. Um, <laughs> and he probably hangs on 75% of mine. I'm, I'm not sure, but so we'll there, go with we'll go with that. Is how much <laughs> of the how much of it I'm remembering. Uh, so keep in mind, there's certain overhead to a connection-oriented system. Yeah. So ports ports are a layer four protocol that a computer uses for data transmission. Uh, they're logical communication endpoints for specific program on computers for delivery of data sent. For example, we have two computers communicating, 
uh, one computer is requesting web services from another. If I just send to the IP address a request for web services generically, it's not going to know how to respond to that. So what I need to do is specifically give it a port. I don't do that. The, the protocols do that. Give it a specific port to say, not only is it this address, it's this specific program I'm talking to. So go back to mail, our, uh, our postcard analogy. Let's say Christopher and I have multiple postcard conversations going on. So I might address this postcard conversation as uh, port 80, which is our term paper. Uh, another postcard conversation we have might be port 443, which refers to some other conversation we have. Uh, so basically ports allow you to not only say this specific device, but this specific application or process within this device. Is what I'm looking for. The, the analogy I used to use was a house. I'm sitting home on my couch, my doorbell rings. Now the analogy at this point is IP addresses. Someone out there in the world has found my IP address. That IP address is how they're going to find my house. They're, they use a street, a city, a state, a zip code to narrow it down. And an IP address is just that. They've narrowed it down to my house. They come to my house, they knock on the door. I, all I know is someone's at the door. I have to walk over the door, and I have to look through a peephole or out a window to find out what they want. That's what those ports are, is what they want. If it's a guy in a you know, little brown outfit with shorts on, holding the box in his hand, I know he wants to deliver me a package. I'm going to open the door, I'm going to take the package, I'm going to sign for it. If it's a guy also possibly with shorts on, but in blue outfits and maybe wearing a hat, he's probably got some mail for me that I'm going to want to open up and read. And I might actually have to go get some mail and bring it to him to take with him when he leaves. So the ports act as almost the uniform. What are you here for? What do you need when you get here? And as another part of this analogy for fun, we talked about firewalls earlier, which are sort of secure routers. That's what the people on your door is. So you can look through and see. Oh, oh that's, very nice. That's the, very nice. That guy's wearing a, a little brown outfit with shorts. I probably want to open that and take that package from him. That guy's got a knife in his hand. We're going to go ahead and keep the door shut. We're not going <laughs> to open the door for that one. Well, so, I mean, you might. What if you want to live dangerously? Or what if that's the knife that you ordered from the... So Yeah, but the fact he's holding it in his hand might be a little suspicious. <laughs> yeah, might be a little worrisome. I would think that would come in a box, but I guess maybe <laughs> if that's how you deliver things. Okay, so that basically outlines ports. And then base in this next section we have the generic ports. Well, not generic, these are very specific ports. So, these port numbers are always associated to these protocols. 21 FTP, so when you get on a site and try an FTP, you're using port 21. Port 23, Telnet. Uh, I mentioned port 80 before HTTP, so any web browsing you do is using port 80. Uh, if you want to do secure browsing, 443, uh, HTTPS. Um, and then you can kind of look through this list and see the different ports that are associated with the different programs. So the way to impress your friends, if you, you know, are that kind of geek, you have contests at your house. Who can remember the most port numbers and what services are assigned? People will flock to your parties if you start them off with port competitions. How could you become more popular than that? You can think of a couple of ways. <laughs> okay, so layer five, session layer. Session layer manages session establishment, maintenance, and termination between network devices. Example, when you log on or log off, again, we go back to that phone call analogy. When you start up on a phone conversation, hello, how are you? You initiate the conversation. I've called about blah. Hey, Christopher, I've called about... Uh, this presentation. So Christopher would answer, we'd go back and forth, and then when we were fin finally finished, he'd be like, okay, goodbye. And then if he had a decent session layer protocol, he would say goodbye also, and we would cleanly disconnect the session. Uh, this layer also controls the name and address databases for OS, such as NetBIOS. Uh, NetBIOS, Network Basic Input Output System, is a protocol that works at this layer for naming, creating names and associating names to computers. And actually, Microsoft was one of the people or one of the companies that implemented this mm -hmm. for a way to associate names to computers. Yep, a long time ago. This was, this was one of, 
one of the protocols Microsoft implemented. It's not so widely used anymore, but it's still out there. You'll still see it. Layer six, the presentation layer, translates data format from sender to receiver in various OSs that might be used. Uh, concepts include character code conversion. Remember I mentioned maybe ANSI versus EBCDIC, the different keyboard types. Data compre or not necessarily keyboard types, but data representation. How do you represent an A in this system versus how do you represent an A in this system? Presentation layer is the one that translates that. Redirectors work at this layer, such as map network drives that enable a computer to access file shares on a remote computer. Again, a translation system. And then finally, layer seven, application layer serves as the window for users and application processes to access network services, uh, end user protocols, FTP, SMM, SMTP, Telnet, and RAS work at this layer. Again, this isn't supposed to be confused with the application that you're working with. This isn't mail. This isn't the mail UI that I'm using. The mail UI that I'm using that sends information down the stack, it hooks into the application layer. The program itself isn't the application layer. And then again, the OSI model revisited. If we take a look at the slide here, uh, we see application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. We see the different protocols associated with each layer, uh, and then different devices that might be associated. One thing to keep in mind or that I always thought was kind of interesting, is notice TCP and IP are at different levels. People think that TCP and IP are, diff are opposite of the same thing. They're actually not. It refers to a portion of the transport protocol and a portion of the network protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, in the scheme of things, not overly important, but a fun geek fact. Again, ways to impress your friends at parties. Exactly. We're exactly. chock full of ways to impress your geek friends at parties. Obviously, Christopher and I don't go to a lot of parties. We do not. But if we did, we would have knowledge to share with you and would be happy to do so. The TCP model. So we've talked about the OSI model. Uh, the TCP model is actually a little bit different. It's similar to the OSI model, and it allows interconnectivity between devices and allows intercommunication. The TCP model is only comprised of four layers. The application layer, which defines the TCP IP application protocols. The transport layer, that provides communication session management. Internet layer, packages and routes data. And then the network interface details how data is physically sent through the network. Something interesting about the TCP model is that the TCP model doesn't really designate on the OSI level, a physical or data link layer protocol. They only give information for the upper layers and then figure, hey, data link and physical, we're not going to worry about it. We're not going to worry about those layers. Uh, other companies or other areas can worry about that. We're just going to worry about the upper level transport. Let's take a look at the OSI model compared to the TCP model. Again, you see here the OSI model, seven layers, the TCP4 model, four layers. Uh, the application and TCP model is equivalent to the application, presentation, and session layer in the OSI model. Transport layers are equivalent. Network layer routing in OSI model is similar to the internet layer routing in the TCP model. And then again, the network access layer in the TCP model isn't really concerned. They're like, oh, okay, well, you can use Ethernet, you can use FDDI, you can use whatever you want, we don't care. Uh, we're more concerned with the upper le levels. And most of you probably already know this, but if you don't, TCP IP is the uh, protocol used for internet standards and is the protocol used for internet communication. Wow, we're at the summary already. Who, who would have thought that we did? Got through all this information time, already. Time flies when you're having fun. It, it flies sometimes when you're not having fun, but hopefully everybody's oh, having wish, a good time. I wish you did that more often. Yeah, they better be. Uh, so basically the summary here, understand the OSI model by defining each of the layers from a theory perspective. Seven layers. 
application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. I nice. see, well I see, done. Well I done. see Christopher over here like ticking them off as I go down. Uh, pre saw 10 nuns doing push ups was kind of going through in my head. Uh, you need to be able to separate the functions of the lower levels of the OSI model from the upper levels where message creation begins. Basically, what they're talking about here is understand the physical areas of the OSI model compared the physical and routing levels compared to basically packet assembly, fragmentation, reassembly, uh, session connection, connection oriented, connection -less. Those are kind of different areas. Understand the differences between layer two and layer three switches. Uh, layer two, MAC address, layer three, uh, networking or IP addresses. And differentiate between the OSI model, seven layers, and the TCP model, four layers. I feel like we need a, a burrito mnemonic a somewhere. Bur a burrito? Every time I hear seven layers, every time I hear seven layers. You're it's thinking all, burrito? I'm thinking burrito, yeah. And, and we just had lunch, too. I know. That might I mean, be why. It, that could be why. You're, you're thinking food. I, I guess so. Finally, additional resources and next steps. Christopher, what do we have? So we just we saw this one in some of our other modules. It's, it's the, same, the same information. The uh, MTA Networking Fundamentals Microsoft Official Academic Course Book. Our instructor-led courses, there are four of them. Two specifically that pertain to networking fundamentals. One of those is a five-day two-pack to save you some money and some time networking and security combined, and then exams and certifications. The reason we're here is to hopefully get you started on preparing and able to pass the 98-366 Networking Fundamentals Microsoft Technology Associate exam. Those exams never get any shorter, that's for sure. Those titles, just they just get longer. Uh, believe it or not, sadly, we're at the end of this module. So we've talked about the OSI model, we've talked about standards committees, we've talked about TCP, uh, we've talked about burritos. Uh, have I missed anything that we discussed? I don't think so. Once we got burritos, we were good. I, I, I Module think, closed. Yeah, I think we're pretty much done with what we need to say here. Uh, thanks for listening and uh, watch the other videos. Why not? Yeah. Welcome, welcome back to 98366 Networking Fundamentals. Christopher Chapman, say hi Christopher. Hi, how's it going? How's everybody doing? Hopefully still with us. Thomas Willingham, we're here to talk about understanding wired and wireless networks. So we have discussed previously the OSI model. Now we're gonna talk about the layer one, physical layer, and we're gonna talk about wired and wireless networking. So if we look at, again, the skills and concepts for this, we're going to talk about recognizing wired networks and media types and comprehending wireless networks. So let's just dive right into it. First of all, we have twisted pair cable. Twisted pair cable is the most commonly used cable type in local area networks. Uh, relatively easy to work with, flexible, efficient, and fast. Uh, contains eight wires grouped into four twisted pairs. The four twisted pairs are basically like blue, green, orange, and brown. Uh, and the twisted wires reduce crosstalk or noise and interference between the wires. Which we're going to talk about more in a little while. We will. Uh, this shows a graphic of what a twisted pair cable might look like with all the wires spread apart. Yeah, I so, thought about actually getting a cable. I mean, we have some in here. We could technically just you know cut one apart and show it on camera, but one, I'm not sure we have the zoom capabilities, I'd have to walk up to the camera with it and show it to everybody. And two, I don't know if the studio here would you know, be that appreciate. appreciative of us cutting their cables up to show students a demonstration. Oh, that's good, that's the response I would have expected. We're not going to talk about what I just saw from the back of the room. <laughs> we, we received feedback from the back of the room, uh, we'll just say it wasn't positive, it was more of a negative type of feedback. Apparently the graphic is going to have to do. Exactly, so let's go back to the graphic. <laughs> So we see the four twisted pairs here, blue, green, orange, and brown. Uh, typically, this is just the cable. You're probably more used to seeing a jack on the end of this. Uh, but all these wires are kind of moved apart. They're, they're separated. They're shoved into the jack. 
and then you use tools to basically crimp that down. We'll talk about those tools in a minute. Twisted pair categories. So there's different categories of twisted pair. And this basically rates the speed that can go over that category. So we have category three, 10 megabits per second. Uh, category five, cat five. And typically you just say cat five, cat it, three. You may have heard that term or will hear that term in the future. Uh, cat five, 100 megabits per second. Cat six, ooh, 1,000 megabits per second plus. 1,000 plus. Plus. A plus is important. And then tools for twisted pair cabling. Uh, if you've basically done any type of this, you're very familiar with these. Uh, on the far left, the plier looking things are strippers. Um, we can say that because we're referring to tools. Yes. Strippers. Yes, indeed. And basically what this does is strip the outer wiring off and allows us to get to the metal component within the wire. So... Uh, the jack you see kind of in the middle here above the tester, the jack, you would basically take the bare wiring, shove it in there, and then crimp it. So to, to clarify real quick, the strippers we were talking about on the left side, these are the tools of a seasoned professional because it's not an actual wire stripper with a gauge on it that you put the wire in and it just pulls off the cladding because it's the right diameter. These are actually wire cutters. You get a spend some time just making sure you're cutting the sheath and not the wires inside. These are professional wire strippers, is what I call these. Finesse. There's exactly. some finesse involved. Maybe a little frustration. I was actually going to say, when this slide came up, you see that first tool on the right, and uh, if you know what that tool is, you probably don't have fond, pleasant, joyful memories of using one ever. I do. Yeah? I have some love fun. Love some wire crimping? I love me some wire crimping. It was totally back in the day, but yeah, I've done my share. Uh, the next one over, the ones that have the little like thumb holder in it, uh, that is basically wire strippers for the rest of us. Yeah. So you can put the wire in here and basically just close it and it has already an offset of where it is. It'll just strip the cable off for you. Uh, the orange handled devices, uh, those are jack crimpers. So basically you can put that, the jack in there, you can put the wire in there, uh, punch it, and it just punches everything down. And then finally in the middle, Christopher, what do we have in the middle? Tell oh, the have, audience what they've won. We have a cable tester. So once you've, once you've taken a bare wire, pull it out of a box, pull it out of a wall, taken it out of your you know, living room, connect to the computer because you want to try this at home, and you've cut the ends of it off with, those, with the clippers on the left, and you've stripped them down to just the bare wires, and you've got these little, these little jack ends, these little connector ends in your hand, and you've separated out those pairs in the right order, which we're gonna show you what the right order is here in a couple of minutes, and you've finagled those eight individual wires into that cable end just right, and you've stuck it into that crimp tool, and you've crimped it down, and by this point, if you're me, you're in tears because this is bringing you back memories of hours of your life that you'll never get back. You can then take both ends of that cable you've just made and plug it into that box in the middle, and you push that button that says test, and then when those lights don't light up, you cry some more because you've got to cut the ends back off and try it all again. Hopefully, again, once you've spent those hours, and that's really, I think, like the earning your dues part of oh, IT. Oh, yeah, I think that's totally paying your once dues. Once you've created about a thousand of these cables and you can spin up this process in about five minutes and plug that cable in and push that test button and it lights up on both sides, you'll be happy that you'll never have to do it again. Well, and due to networking communication, it's very important that you have the appropriate red, blue, green, uh, put in the jack correctly, and it's the same on both ends. Maybe. We're gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes. True, Maybe. but typically, it's the same on both ends. Well, yeah, typically it is. We'll give you some, some bonus knowledge for those of you who wanna go above and beyond in your potential current or future IT environments. Stay tuned for Stay said tuned bonus indeed. knowledge. So, we have types of patch cables. We have straight through cables, and these are cables that I was referring to, the most common type. Uh, the wiring on both ends of the jack are exactly the same. Uh, one wire is for transmit, one wire is for receive, so the different wires have different functionality. Well, if you've ever, without a hub, tried to hook a computer directly to another computer, Christopher, what happens? Nothing. Typically, nothing. Because you if have... You're, if you're using one of these straight through cables, nothing's going to happen. So this relates to the next slide, although we're going to kind of back and forth here for a minute with some of the slide material. 
if I plug one computer into another cable with a regular straight through patch, or one computer into another computer with one straight through cable, I'm not gonna get any connectivity. Those computers don't have the right kinds of ports on them to accommodate that setup. So I need to create what's called a crossover cable. I need to take, and a little more bonus knowledge, again, for all this trivia in the parties you have with your geek friends, um, of an eight wire unshielded twisted pair cable like we're talking about, only four of those wires are actually used by most NICs. Um, those wires are in pairs, and to create a crossover cable, you build one end the normal way, and then you build the other end with the two pairs reversed. And that's called a crossover cable. You can plug that into two computers directly, no hub, no switch, no other interconnecting devices, and communicate between those two computers as if you're on a regular network. So that's a little bit of the bonus information. You can make your own crossover cables, know when to use crossover cables. But the question that comes to me when I'm talking about this is, how come I can plug a cable into a switch and it works? Let's find out. So MDI, medium dependent interface, <clears throat> a type of ethernet port connection using twisted pair cabling. This allows computers to communicate with other devices and the wires have to cross somewhere, which is what Christopher was just talking about. Instead of using crossover cables for direct connect, there are also MDI X ports, medium dependent interface crossover. And these are ports that take care of the cross. So you can use a typical network cable, plug them into these MDI X ports and plug a device directly into another device. Now where this gets a little confusing is most switches these days are auto sensing. They'll actually have MDI and MDX. That, the reason we specify both, or we show you both here, is there used to be devices, switches, hubs, routers, that had specific MDIX ports on them that you would know you could plug a straight through cable in and it would be a crossover. You could plug a crossover and it would straighten it out and wouldn't really work for what you were trying to do. Most switches these days have auto sensing ports that'll be listed in their features. They know what kind of cable you're plugging in and if they do or don't need to make that electronic crossover for you. So we have ports. We also have patch panel and RJ45 wall jack. So now we're kind of getting into the behind the scenes networking. Uh, your patch panel is typically in your wiring closet um, and takes wiring and basically in a one-to-one -one fashion specifies a specific position on the patch panel to a specific wall jack. So wall jack in uh, Bob or Jane's office is associated to patch panel area five or, or patch panel port five. Mm -hmm. And you can see on these, they actually give you a little bit of assistance. Uh, and there may be times when people watching this video will have to actually build out closets or build patch panels that you're installing into an empty rack that aren't pre-cabled. You're actually going to be running this cable in your facility, so you're going to have to punch this down using another tool we're going to see in a couple of slides. You'll notice they help you out a little bit by putting colors on some of the points so you can know which wires go in which spots for colors to get that, that lineup correct. The one on the bottom, you can see, I don't know if you can see it, on the edge is where they kind of put that guide. They don't have room on the top, so it's down on the edge or even on the other side where you can't really see right now. So for the wall jack, basically here, and for the patch panel, here, 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 and here. And once again, uber geek knowledge, if you want to impress your friends, learn the order of wires in a typical RJ45 connector in order, and then the crossover order. And then the friends will crawl out of the woodwork wanting your knowledge. You must be really popular you at know, parties. You know, <laughs> I go outside all the time. <laughs> so we've talked about patch panels. We've talked about RJ45 jacks. We've talked about crimpers, uh, the tools to make the cables. Here's some of the tools needed to create the patch panel and to create, um, to test some of those connections that we've made. Uh, RJ45 jacks, the cutting tool, the wire stripper, the punch down tool. We also have a continuity tester. So once you've created the cable or you've created the patch panel wall run 
Uh, you need to ensure that the cable didn't get crimped somehow. Uh, maybe your hand went crazy while you were using the stripper and you cut into the cable or something uh, midway, midpoint. Uh, the continuity tester will just verify that the cable works well. Yep. Pretty sure I've used that one too. So typically what you would do is at the wall jack, you would plug in. So if we look... Um, Actually, it took a second trying to figure out that picture, how all the pieces fit together. Yeah, so here, this is what you'd click into the wall jack, just so this represents the wall jack. This is what you'd click into the patch panel or the hub that's connected to the patch panel. This basically sends a signal. It bounces back off this and comes back, and then it tells you basically how good or bad a wiring job that you've done. So some things that we have to deal with as we basically do this physical cabling, or actually any network has to deal with this, physical or wireless, mm -hmm. attenuation. So attenuation is basically the signal degrading over distance. Yep. So as distance is, um, is, is traveled, uh, the signal becomes less. Uh, if you're a fan of the Big Bang at all, you'll know that uh, Sheldon for one Halloween dressed up as the Doppler effect. <laughs> and the Doppler effect basically being that as a device gets closer to you, it gets louder. As it goes further away from you, it uh, gets quieter. And that's kind of an example of attenuation as it gains further distance and that sound has to travel more distance to get to you, it's lower because of attenuation. And that's simplifying. And I'm sure there's somebody out there with a science degree who'll want to argue with me. Knock yourself out. I'm, I'm sure you're right. Um, yep, that's just feel, a really simple, basic explanation. Feel free to yell at this video all you want. <laughs> hey, yeah, we will, definitely. We will listen attentively. Exactly. You pause it. Pause it can, in a yeah. way that it makes like we're listening. Uh, in fact, maybe we'll set aside some area of the video that quality listening time. Sit here very attentively. Yeah, we'll both be like... And we might even nod knowingly. <laughs> so, you know, because I'm, again, I'm, I'm gonna keep that in mind, actually. Yeah, we're here for them. It's true. Christopher, this is all about them learning That's very and true. them getting what they need. So, attenuation. Along with attenuation is interference. And interference is basically things that disrupt the signal or modifies the signal in some manner that travels along the wire, or this could also be a wireless mm -hmm. issue. Interference could be wired or wireless. Uh, interference could be caused by electrical sources, lights, electrical outlets, motors, appliances, uh, anything that uses an electrical signal of some kind or a wireless radio signal of some kind can be interfered with. Well, in the case of wireless, I'm thinking walls. Yeah, exactly. Hills, if you're not line of sight, trees, cars, a lot of things. Uh, an example of interference, there was a teaching class, there was a student uh, who explained the circumstance to me, told me it took them a while to figure it out, you're gonna like this. So every day between basically seven and nine and three and six, their network would degrade considerably. It, it would degrade really, really bad. What they found was their wiring closet was right by the elevators. So during peak traffic time, when people are going up and down the elevators, the elevators would cause interference are, with their network signal. Those are big motors. Yep, yep. So you never know where interference is going to come from. And troubleshooting, which we're not going to really deal with here, but troubleshooting is an art. I mean, people think there's science, to, and there is science to it, but you got to be really creative and really think outside of the box because nowhere is there going to be a checkbox that says check elevators by your patch yep, panel. Nope, that is not going to be on our troubleshooting list anywhere. EMI, electromagnetic interference. Uh, disturbance can affect electrical circuits, devices, and cables due to electromagnetic conduction and possibly radiation. I like that this says possibly radiation. I'm pretty sure if that's an issue, I'm not going to worry that much about troubleshooting it. I'm going to worry more about leaving. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you see radiation, 
I'm not thinking, oh, I wonder if I got good network signal. I wonder why the signal's so degraded. Huh, I'd be thinking, why am I glowing? It's time to get out. <laughs> Uh, any type of electrical devices can create uh, EMI, TVs, air conditioning units, motors, unshielded electrical cabling. Um, the best example I have of this is not a networking example, but it is a data example. Uh, again, dating myself, 10, 15 years ago when we were using phones still, those, those phones plugged into the wall, and they were wireless, they were cordless phones. So you take it off the base, you could walk around your house. This was the greatest thing ever. Oh, I remember the days. And... There were two problems. One, microwaves. You start your microwave and your little phone base sitting right next to the microwave. Got to heat your burrito. And all of a sudden your, your, your phone call is all staticky and terrible. But more related to networking, directly, I actually had to deal with this in a couple of customers' houses. I owned a consulting company. We did house calls and worked on networks in people's houses. And I was in the house and she's telling me, our wireless network just keeps failing. It just keeps failing. We don't know why. It just keeps failing. We're on it. It's going great and just stops. And I'm in the house troubleshooting testing, checking, websites, pinging, why is this not working? And I hear someone pick up the phone in the house. And it was when 2.4 gigahertz wireless oh, phones, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on the same phones channel. had they were just on the come same out. Channel. Yeah. And they would turn that phone on and kill the wireless. Yep. So some good stories about, uh, directly in this case, uh, electromagnetic and magnetic, or in that case, the next slide, radio frequency interference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are, so we talked about interference generically. Now we're talking about specific types of interference. Yep. So radio frequency interference, uh, AM, FM transmissions, cell phone towers, uh, typically considered part of the EMI family. Uh, filters can be installed on the network to help eliminate signal frequency uh, anyone, being broadcast. Anyone using DSL? You may have seen those little filters they make you put on your... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because there's actually, in the case of DSL, interestingly, there's interference from the same wire because that wire is carrying two signals. Crosstalk. When the signal that's transmitting on one copper wire or pair of wires creates an undesired effect on another wire or pair of wires. Undesired effect. That sounds so minimal. Oh, look, an undesired effect. How much hair have you pulled out due to crosstalk? Um... I don't know, honestly. It, it comes down to that troubleshooting again. When, and, and unfortunately, when it comes down to interference, you kind of shotgun approach it. There are these 20 things. Okay, let's just go through the list of the big things that could be causing this problem and get rid of them. And you get rid of them and then the problem goes away. You never actually figured out which one it was because you were in a hurry and don't really have a process for one at a time and then test and then one at a time and then test. So probably a fair amount. Well, and the really difficult issues to troubleshoot are the ghosty issues, the intermittent issues. Things like, um, you know, the network's down from seven to nine, three to six. Those, those are a little bit more hard and fast, but say we, we, we talked about the Mac, um, the Mac numbers that were the same, uh, the Mac conflict, that was so ghosty because sometimes a computer would come up and we'd have a class that would use two computers that had the same Mac address, mm -hmm. so it would kick one off. Other times we didn't. So sometimes this would work, sometimes it wouldn't. So those ghosty issues can be really hard to, yeah. to deal with. So crosstalk, uh, we've talked about unshielded twisted pair. Next we have shielded twisted pair. Notice uh, each cable, they're individually wrapped, uh, kind of like a candy bar. Sort of. I was actually thinking, as soon as you said individually wrapped, I'm like, mm, I want some candy. Yeah, see, candy bar. See, look at that. We're, we're not only giving people knowledge, we're bringing a little bit of joy into their life. Candy, uh, things that taste good. What more could you want? That's true. We got burritos and candy so far. This yep. is the best class ever. 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 Uh, this, you'll need a little bit more specialized tool to uh, strip and remove because you not only have to strip the uh, overall cable, you need to strip the shielded components, uh, you need to get the wire. So this can be a little bit more difficult to, um, to deal with. You also need a bigger budget. Yes. It's more expensive and a little bit more difficult to handle. So shielded twisted pair is not terribly common in the world as we know, at least not that I've ever seen. No, I actually, I haven't either. I haven't either. Plenum rated. Plenum rated basically deals with if the cable catches on fire, how much is it going to smoke? 
How, how much of a toxic cloud is it going to release as it catches on fire? This is stuff uh, for wiring between in walls that you can't really get to. Um, that sprinkler systems that when they flip on, they can't get to it. Uh, so they have a Teflon coating that makes them a little bit more impervious to fire. Uh, used in situations uh, because standard twisted pair cables have a PVC jacket, which can emit, like I said, a gas as they get heated up and as they burst into flames and cause problems. Uh, an undesired effect, an as it undesired were. Undesired effect. Yeah, we do, we don't want that. Burning of your network cables. That's right. As a, well, and causing gas and polluting the environment. That's true. Because that's what, that is effect. what I'm going to be worried about while my building's burning down around me. Hope this gas isn't toxic. <laughs> Fiber optic cable transmits light over basically a plastic or glass type wire. So now we have the transmission of light instead of electricity over a cable. Uh, the benefits here that we get, you don't really get any interference unless the cable gets kinked or managed somewhere. Uh, people are unable to snoop uh, fiber optic type network. They're really good for high speed, high distance, um, and high capacity yep. transmission. Uh, when they first came out, people would, uh, do these by hand, would do fiber optic by hand. I've heard those stories. So there were, there's two cables. There's a send and receive because again, uh, it only goes one way on the channel. So yep. there'd be a send cable and a receive cable. You'd have to very carefully, and this is bundled with all kinds of like Christmas goodies around it. So you have the, the sheath and then you have a shielding and then you have a plastic component around that and then a couple other layers and then you have the actual core to it. So you would have to snip the cable and kind of get your way through this to the core. And then you would have to burnish the end of the core so you could hook that to a connector to get it to work. Uh, we ha I had somebody in one of my classes bring one of those systems up one time, uh, bring one of those systems in one time. It was really difficult. Mm -hmm. it, it, it definitely was challenging. Uh, but with fiber optic cable, again, High speed, high capacity, um, long distance. So, so, so given all that, all I'm hearing is good things. I, my brain wonders, why don't I use this everywhere? Why don't I use this at home if it's so much faster? Why can't I connect all my computers with fiber optic versus these shielded and unshielded twisted pair cables that are subject to interference and crosstalk? Why not just fiber everywhere? That's a really good question. The problem with fiber optic, if you can call it a problem, it's a trade-off. It's very expensive. And... I'm not quite sure how to say this, but you need a much higher level of skill to deal with it than Twisted Pair. Twisted Pair, I'm not saying that you, a one-armed monkey, can do Twisted Pair. You need a skill set to be able to do, do Twisted Pair. But the tools needed and the um, skill set needed to deal with fiber optic is just kind of that next level. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to find some cost while we're sitting here talking about trying to find some comparison. I'm thinking about, uh, it's saying about a thousand times. Thousand. The expense is about a thousand times. That's a different. big number. Yeah, they're talking about per hundred feet of cable. Hundred feet of Cat five. I mean, these days cost you twenty bucks. Exactly. Thirty. Exactly. You're not going to find fiber. Plus, well, and the cost isn't necessarily the cable. The cost is the the devices to plug the cable into. Fiber switches are exorbitantly expensive. It's it's good technology. It's great technology. It has its advantages. It has its speeds. It's expensive. You're going to use it in data centers. You're going to use it as your backbones. You're going to use it as Connecting data centers together over large areas. Okay. Uh, so your fiber optic cables, here's your cabling standards, your mediums, and your maximum distances. And I'll preface this slide because when I was in the boat that some of our viewers at this point may be in sitting at home watching this video right now thinking, do I really have to memorize all of those? I think I have yet in all of the certification exams I've taken and all of the networks I've worked on to need to know all of this information. I'm not a fiber optic installer. I'm not, um, I, I'm not in a position or never been in a position where I need to know all of these fiber standards and all of the information that goes along with them. Okay, but, but let's take a look at what we know so far mm -hmm. and take a look at these numbers uh, because we can still get information from this because- well, and, and if you're a designer, you'll need this. You'll need to know. If you get to the point in your career, you're architecting data centers, you're 
creating geographically dispersed solutions, you're building backbones for networks, which I never got to the point where, from a networking standpoint, I was building out fiber solutions to connect data centers. So, Well, if we look at these cable standards, uh, before we talked about 10 base T or 100 base T, here we have 100 base FX. So we, although we don't understand these standards per se, we still have information. So 100, so we need, know we're dealing with 100, 100 megabit per second. Yep. Base, so it's a baseband technology, not a broadband technology. Mm -hmm. And FX, okay, so that gives us the idea that, okay, well, it's not a twisted pair thing, mm -hmm. so we need to figure out what that FX thing is. So even though we don't necessarily know these standards directly, we still have information that we can pull from yep. what we have here. Or used to build them. Yes. Like somebody says, what's a fiber standard? Well, I know it's 100 megabit, I know it's baseband fiber FX. Yeah, there you go. So, so far we've talked about our different types of wired networks. Let's talk about wireless networks. You notice that I don't even have to look at the slides now. I, That's I'm, good. That's my, awesome. Yeah, my presenter skill sets. Like, I think I've gained like another little dot here that I can apply to a skill set. There you go. Your, your presenter skill set has gone up one. Ding. Sweet. Now I don't have to look at the slides anymore and I can move that over. Although periodically, if you see me look down like this, or if you see me look right there, I'm looking at slides. So wireless networks. So basically we've talked about wired networks. Uh, the device is physically connected by wire of some kind, by a physical medium of some kind to the hub switch router. Wireless, remember we talked about wireless access points. Wireless allows a device, smartphone, tablet, uh, laptop, whatever, to connect to a network with no physical media. So it enables connection without a wire, or it enables connection without wiring, uh, provides a degree of portability, uh, extends connectivity to pre-existing wireless networks. As Christopher and I talked about earlier, uh, wireless networks don't typically stand alone. They're typically an additive portion of a wired network. So I have my wired network, and then I have wireless components to my wired network. Yep. Uh, some wireless devices can be connected directly to each other, point to point. Wireless network adapters. So whether it's a wireless system or a wired system, we still need the ability to connect to the network itself. And that's where these wireless network adapters come in. Uh, again, they allow connectivity between your device and the network, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Uh, USB, PC card, internal PC, PC Express adapter card, numerous types of adapters. Simple phone, built in right here. There we go. As Christopher, Christopher's showing his phone right now. There, uh, is, there is a wireless adapter. There are actually two wireless adapters, one for the network for the cell provider and one as an actual Wi-Fi adapter. Okay, so really good example of a device that connects to the network uh, that has multiple connections in it, uh, the phone connection, the wireless connection. Uh, I can pull information down, it becomes a client. I can push information up, or somebody can request service from it. I can text, uh, and again, all this happens seamlessly on the client. Wireless access point. So again, it enables wireless devices to connect to the network. Uh, they can also act as a router, firewall, and IP proxy. So basically we have the gra graphic representation for a wireless portion of the network. And here we have some lights showing uh, the use WLAN, it's a wireless G, um, and, it's, ooh, and we're connected to the internet. Yep. So the fact that we see that this is wireless and it's connected to the internet, what do we know about this device? Um, well, this is very similar to what we talked about earlier as the kind of new definition of router or almost the consumer version of a router where it's going to serve multiple functions. It's going to connect those ethernet ports. That means there's cables plugged into this. It's connecting my wired devices and my wireless devices both together and out to the internet. Okay, so this might be a switch it might be a router. So again, a device that has multiple functionality yep. to it. 
Oh, and because it uh, connects wireless to wired, it's a bridge. Yep. Wireless modes, uh, different modes to connect to a wireless network, infrastructure, uh, wireless clients connect to and are authenticated via WAP, a wireless access point, or ad hoc, used when all the clients communicate directly with each other. And, and I don't know if some people know this or some people don't know this, that similar to a computer at your house, you don't have to have a hub or a switch to get your computers to talk to each other. We mentioned creating a cable that's got the wires reversed on one end. You can plug that crossover cable into both of your devices and they'll communicate with each other. With wireless devices, if I have a laptop and a tablet and a phone at my house, I can set those up to be ad hoc and they'll connect to each other without the use of a central wireless device. What benefit do I get having that central wireless device? Um, centralized manage, centralized security, centralized connectivity outward. Uh, if you've got these three devices in ad hoc mode, you have no connectivity outside of those three devices. They can talk to each other, but that's it. A centralized access point or router will allow you to connect to the internet, connect to a wired network elsewhere on location in your LAN. It will also allow you to, to centralize security policy, the encryption that happens during the wireless communication, which is a big issue that we're going to talk about in a minute as well. Okay. Wireless LAN. Uh, again, composed of at least one WAP, wireless access point, and a computer or handheld device that connect to the WAP. Uh, devices are Ethernet based, but built on other networking architectures. Again, what we're kind of reinforcing here is the fact that wireless networks don't stand on their own. Mm -hmm. Most of the time. Uh, ensure compatibility, the WAP and other wireless devices must all use the same IEEE 802.11 standard. That one's mostly true. What you do get is you get devices that will be backwards compatible. You may have a wireless access point that supports 802.11 A and B and G all at the same time. So I can connect any of those three types of devices to one central device. But in, in this sense, that the, the access point and the endpoint device both have to subscribe to A. Correct. 802.11a or 802.11b. You just make it devices that support more than one at a time. And then wireless fidelity, Wi-Fi, this is what people are most familiar with, is a trademark to brand products that belong to the cat a category of WLAN devices. Other wireless devices include a wireless repeater, and a wireless bridge. A wireless repeater is basically used to extend signal. Uh, a wireless signal only goes so far, uh, typically about 100 feet or so, uh, depending on the environment, well, maybe a bit longer, maybe a bit shorter. A lot shorter. <laughs> yeah, you have it in your house, and you notice that sometimes you put it in areas of the house that it doesn't work that well. You put it in other areas of the house, it works better. Typically, in the house, higher is better. I found. Yeah. Uh, so wireless repeater extends coverage. Wireless bridge. Uh, bridge can connect different 802.11 standards together. Uh, as Christopher mentioned earlier, wireless A, wireless B, G, N, allowing interconnection. Yep. Uh, so we've talked about a switch, a hub, a bridge, a router. And again, don't be confused by the fact that a lot of the times consumer devices, you'll see that they're a mixture or hybrid of device. So if you go out specifically looking for a bridge device and don't see it, uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That just means, hey, you know, that possibly incorporated into that router that you're looking at or that switch that you're looking at. So as you buy a device, Ensure that you're really that you look at what's included in the device, what functionality well, is included. And by definition, they don't really use the term bridge anymore. Bridges were, by definition, ways to connect different types of media. So you'd have coax on one end and Cat5 on the other. Um, with a wireless access point, it is a bridge. It has to be because you're connecting that wireless client to a wired network. Your media is different on either side of that device. They've just kind of lumped that term into or that functionality into no, number, numerous other devices. Right. So again, we're back to standards. So our WLAN standards include 802.11. And 802.11, the IEEE 802.11, is wireless. And then within that, there's different categorizations of wireless. And then you see here, A is 54 megabits per second, B, 11. 
G54, 11N, ooh, 600, woo, ding, ding. Uh, and then they work at different frequencies. And what we don't have on this table, because you kind of wonder why was A54 and B dropped down to 11, and then G came back up to 54, a lot of this was a distance thing. They had 54 megabits per second, but it was very short range. They went with B, they had to slow it down, but they got exponentially more range out of it. Then with G, they were able to take that same range and bring that 54 megabits per second back out that distance. And now it's just taken off and we're getting faster and farther and bigger and better. And I don't have 2.4 gigahertz wireless so that it won't interfere with my wireless mouse and keyboard, right. which most people may not know is an issue. Let me look real quick. Let me see if this is, this just says wireless. I'd have to actually tear it apart a little bit to see if it's, if it's a 2.4 gigahertz device that might actually mess with my wireless network. Again, interference and it's, things that we may or may not think about, which would give you the opportunity to troubleshoot. Opportunity indeed. <laughs> Wireless encryption options. So let's go back to the postcard analogy. Uh, I'm sending information to Christopher. I'm using postcards to do it. I have my 10 page report. I've cut it up. I put it on the postcards. Well, you know, if you're familiar with postcards, anybody who picks that postcard up can read it. So if I can gain access to the postcard, I can read it. Networking standards are the same, typically without encryption. As this data goes over the wire, anybody who can gain access to the data can read it. And remember with the hub, that information is broadcast everywhere. So if I can pull that data out, I have the opportunity to read that. Yep. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. So with wireless uh, being as easy access it is, as it is, that's kind of the double-edged sword. Um, and, and let's kind of step back a minute and talk about security at a really high level. Security and networking kind of doesn't go together because the, the idea of networking is to give people information. Get it all out there. Get, to give people access to information. The idea behind security is to keep people away from information. So they kind of don't go together. So security when it comes to networking is a little bit different. Security when it comes to networking is ensuring those that need access to the data have continued access those that aren't supposed to have access to the data don't have access. So with that in mind, uh, there are wireless encryption options. If we look at the chart here, we see our wireless encryption protocols, WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy, WPA and WPA2, Wi-Fi Protected Access, and notice the different encryption level key sizes on the right-hand side. Uh, so one thing that you do need to do is ensure that your wireless access points and your wireless devices use the same encryption option. Yep. Service set identifier. Service set identifier, typically known as a SSID, is what you associate to a wired network. Uh, this is typically the name of the wired wireless network. Uh, kind of browsing around the, web, ah, around the web and looking at different stuff. One of my favorite SSIDs that I saw, FBI surveillance van. Tell me that's not going to make your neighbors that's nervous seeing my, something like that. In my last apartment, uh, neighbor, some of my neighbors had that as their, as their SSID. See, not only, not only technical, but fun. Absolutely. So now when a client wants to connect to the network, they need to know that name, that, that friendly name or unfriendly name, depending on how you associate it. How your sense of humor works. Yeah. Exactly. You could go back to the hexadecimal bad beef. Um, so there, there's different things that you can do. But as a device connecting to this uh, wireless network, they need to know the SSID. Uh, for security purposes, the SSID could be um, hidden. So not broadcast, typically it's just broadcast. Uh, as you've gone into like Starbucks or uh, different areas that have free Wi-Fi, I don't know why I'm air quoting free Wi-Fi, but they have free Wi-Fi. Uh, you'll, you'll see on your device, you'll pull it up and it'll say, hey, can connect to, maybe it's Starbucks, can connect to Starbucks. That's their SSID. And they've allowed that to be broadcast so you can connect to it. 
Uh, some people don't want their SSID broadcast, at which point you have to know it directly to gain connection to it. Although nowadays you can get teased. A lot of wireless devices, the endpoints, phones, tablets, laptops, will show you all of the networks that have SSIDs you can connect to. And some of them will show you all of the networks you can't connect to. It'll just say unidentified network, unidentified network, unidentified network, just to tease you. These are networks you can't connect to, but they're here, yeah. just so you know. Someone's yeah. trying to hide something. Not for you. I don't want to see that. It Not for you. I want to figure it out. Yeah. So wireless settings. So basically what we see here are different things that we would set up as we set up a wireless access point. Uh, notice enable wireless, yes or no, the wireless network name, so the SSID, mm -hmm. uh, 802.11 mode that we talked about, AGN. Uh, some devices, you don't have to figure this out, they'll arbitrate automatically, so as the device connects, it'll arbitrate. Uh, enable auto channel scan, so we've talked about what gigahertz is it going to uh, be at. It can basically do different channels, uh, what wireless channel, what transmission rate, uh, the channel width. So you have some uh, different things that you can configure. The security mode, this is where WEP or WPA, you'd configure that information. Use, by the way, just a little helpful pointer, always WPA, always. Um, WEP, we won't actually bring any up, but if you do a search using any search engine for crack WEP, it takes about five, six minutes. Oh. So use WPA all the time. How did we get to the summary already? What happened here? How do, how do we, we're having such a good time. We keep forgetting that the end of these modules keeps coming up. This, this makes me a little sad that we're through this material already. Oh yeah? Yeah, it does, it I does. Think we, I think we can come up with some more for you. For you and for the audience. I think they want more as well. I, I'm ready, but let's, let's wrap this one up before we talk about more. Fair enough. So, summary. Uh, to recognize wired networks and media types, uh, and includes identifying twisted pair cables, cabling tools, and testers. So basically, really understanding the wired network, the media type, and the tools needed to configure the wired network. Yep. And then basically to comprehend, that's a really good word, to comprehend wireless networks. Uh, so understanding wireless devices, wireless settings, configurations, standards, and encryption protocols. Yep. Once again, I get to do my little additional resources. Our book, MTA Networking Fundamentals, Microsoft Official Academic Curriculum, uh, available for purchase just about anywhere. A number of instructor-led courses, if you like what you're seeing here, in fact, this is a good module for this because what we do is we talk about it. We show you some, some images, we create some graphics, and we talk about what we're going over in terms of the topic. In one of those instructor-led courses, at least if they're one of my instructor-led courses, you're going to get to come to class and you're going to play with this stuff. I'm going to have a box of cables and crimpers and strippers and we're going to tear some cables apart and make some more. Well, I like these videos, but what if I have a question? What if I want to ask the instructor a question? Oh, I still might ignore you. That's hurtful. Well, it depends on how good an instructor you are, I guess, maybe. <laughs> I don't know whether ignoring students makes you a good or bad instructor, honestly. I guess it depends on the class. But yeah, you get to talk to people face-to-face. -face. And, and one of the things I think a lot of students miss or, or overlook beforehand, before they've taken some courses, is it's not just the instructor. You're going to be in a course with other people in the same position, learning the same things. Or in some cases, you're going to be in a course with somebody who's been in IT for 20 years and is learning something new. And they may have things they can teach you right then, sit next to you at a desk that you'd never learn on your own. Or asking questions about things you've never thought about yep. or that help you, stimulate you to think about other things. Absolutely. So a lot of advantages to instructor-led courses. Um, I used to do courses where we would break things, like intentionally, like hammers, hard drives, snapping cables, and breaking connectors off. And they were fun classes. So... It's a nice advantage for this module because we looked at tools and media where you'd actually maybe go to a course and get to play with that. Well, yeah, and get, be able to get some hands-on with yep. those. So I'm really a fan of this uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy, this online learning, uh, accessibility to knowledge. I, I think that's great. Uh, but there may be some people who find the classroom environment just a little bit more helpful for them. So I... I wouldn't dissuade anybody who's like taken this video or, or watched a couple of these videos to not take a course. Take a course. I mean, you might get a lot out of it. Uh, take a course on something. Maybe you've gone through one of the MVA modules 
and were like, hey, I'd like to gain more information about that, or, okay, so I have a pretty good idea about this. I want to learn about these other things uh, more in depth. And so take a class. I, I, I'm a huge proponent of going in and getting classroom learning. Well, I'm too. We're, I'm, I'm in the business. So yeah, take courses. It's kind of what we do. My job depends on it. <laughs> take some courses. Uh, and last, the exam, the certification we're here to prepare for. So exam 98-366, Networking Fundamentals. And I think that pretty much wraps us for this one. I think that wraps up this module. It Again, does. It we've, does indeed. we've had a really good time. Well, at least you and I have had a good time. Hopefully, <laughs> they. about them. I think we offended them at least once talking about cutting up their cables. But uh... well, no, I, I'm I'm less concerned with behind the camera than I'm concerned with watching the video. Well, I'm telling the students that they they have to watch out for offending people too now because we're giving them bad ideas. If they're sitting at home watching this video, like, oh, hey, there's this network cable right here. I'm just gonna reach down here and. I can just cut this off and see what that looks like. Of course, what's going to happen is the video is going to stop. <laughs> and now once the video stopped, we're not going to be able to teach you how to fix it. How to fix it. So you can just sit there with a broken cable and just try and figure it out for yourself. So have fun with that. Yeah. Good luck, and uh, hopefully we'll see you real soon. And welcome back. We are here for more Networking Fundamentals, Microsoft Virtual Academy. We've been tearing through this throughout the modules you've seen so far. We're going to have more for you. This isn't even the end right here. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, well, it's a good thing it's a video. You can pause it. Have Take a, a break. Yeah, we, we just got back from a break, so hopefully you're taking breaks adequately. And we can tear right through these with everybody watching. Oh, Christopher Chapman, Thomas Willingham. Oh, yeah. Hi, Christopher. How's it going? In, in case you're just joining us, yeah. if you're just joining us, hey, welcome to the 983366 Networking Fundamentals. Look at, I'm not even looking at my hand. It's pretty impressive, actually. Um, Thomas Willingham, Christopher Chapman, we are your presenters. As I said, if you're coming back, welcome back. If you're new, see what you think. Welcome. There are other modules that you might want to take a look at. Yeah. So we're going to uh, jump right into Module 4, Understanding Internet Protocol. And I'm going to, one more time, hand it off to the gentleman to my right, Mr. Thomas Willingham, to kick this off. Okay, understanding internet protocols. Again, back to our objectives. For our objectives, we're talking about working with IPv4 and working with IPv6. So, internet protocol version 4 and internet protocol version 6. So Internet Protocol version 4, IPv4, is the fourth version of the Internet Protocol, yet it's the first version to be widely deployed. It's the frequently used communications protocol for the Internet, and IP resides on the network layer of the OSI model, seven layers of the OSI model, uh, application, presentation, session, transport, network, physical, or, oh! Data link oh, and physical. I almost go. had there it. There we go. I almost had it. Um, so seven layers of the OSI model, four layers of the TCP model. Clearly, as witness now, clearly you're going to need to know all seven of those layers every day of your IT career because we've used them so much that we remember them without any hesitation. Without fail, without hesitation. Point. So our IP addresses. So we've talked previously about MAC addresses, media access control addresses that work at layer two. Uh, IP addresses are addresses associated with the TCP IP protocol that uniquely identify devices on the network. They consist of four octets, eight bits, between zero and 255. At what layer? At what layer? The networking layer. And that would be layer three of yep. the OSI model. Awesome. So examples include 125.5.24.2. So you can kind of read through these, 192, 168, 354. So these are just some examples of some different addresses. Uh, in order for an IP address to function, there must be a properly configured IP address and compatible subnet mask. To connect to the internet or any remote network, you'll also need a gateway address and a DNS address. Classful network architecture. So the IPv4 classification system is known as a classful network architecture. It's broken down into five sections. Class A, 
through E. Class A is your IP range, your first octet, 0 through 127. Your default subnet mask, 255.0.0.0. Let's step back here for a minute. We're, we're talking about uh, network architecture. We're talking about classes and subnet masks and ranges. So we've talked a little bit about subnetting already. And subnetting, the idea behind subnetting is having a network portion and having a ID portion of the device, of the address. So the network portion designates what network is my device on. The host ID designates, well, what's my specific ID number? So 192.168.0, uh, all our devices are on that network. My specific device is dot one. So my network ID, 192.168.0, my host ID, dot one. Uh, the subnet mask is basically what shows what the IP addressing scheme is. So what's the host ID versus, or what's the network ID versus what's the host ID. The subnet mask is basically what differentiates those two. Different classes have different default subnet masks. Uh, you can make your own mask. We'll talk about that later. So class B, IP range, uh, 128 to 191, your default subnet mask, use the first two octets, 255, 255.0.0. Notice the network ID, dot .net, dot .net, dot .host, dot .host. So the first two octets are used for network ID, the second two octets are used for host ID. We talk about networks possible and then usable addresses. Notice for usable addresses, it's the number the bit number minus two. Why? Well, all zeros is the, let me make sure I get this right, is the unicast address. All ones is the multicast address. Is that correct, Christopher? Did I have that right? Or um, is that backwards? I don't know what zeros. You got the, the all ones is broadcast. Broadcast, there we go, broadcast. The multicast is two, I don't remember, 240? 240. Okay, okay, so, Basically, you have to strip off the lowest address, all zeros, and the upper address, all ones. The lowest address is the, now I'm blanking out again, is the broadcast address. The upper one it represents the network. The 255 represents the network. So, and, and when he's talking about zeros and ones, something we, I, we cover in a, in a couple of slides, is that an IP address is a base 10 number system representation. Numbers we understand, 124, 25, 6. The, the base 10 representation of a binary number. An IP address is actually binary. It, from, from the machine standpoint, it's a binary number, zeros and ones. So when we say all zeros, we mean 0.0.0.0. .0, .0. When we say all ones, we mean 255.255.255.255 .255 because that's the representation of all of those binary digits being one versus zero. And we'll get to that, like I said, in the next couple of slides, we're gonna teach you about subnetting and then you're gonna never wanna watch one of our videos again. <laughs> Subnetting's fun, it's good times, good times. Loop back testing. So as we've mentioned, not all of the addresses are valid within the range. Uh, the range for class A is zero to 127. 127 though is used for what's referred to as a loop back address. And loopback testing allows you to basically ping your own machine. So if you want to basically gain access to your own machine, you would ping 127.0.0.1. If we want that, to see a little demo, I got one sitting here waiting. Oh, hey, Christopher has a demo for us, so why don't we go over to Christopher's machine here, and he can demonstrate. Not right there. So we haven't talked about the ping tool. We're going to talk about that in this course but it's a way for me to just make sure something exists on the network. In this case, as Thomas mentioned, 127 is a loopback address. It's an address my computer is going to use to check itself. Yep, my computer's functioning correctly. The TCP IP protocols are working correctly at this point, from what I can tell. And part of troubleshooting, as you're troubleshooting your system, is you want to troubleshoot, first of all, connections to a FAR system a server of some kind, if, if, that work, if that doesn't work, then you'd want to test 
intermediary devices, so your switches, your routers, if that doesn't work, then you need to go back and test your own connectivity to make sure that your own TCP IP stack's working. Yep. And using the loopback address is how you do it. Uh, also, if you're doing, say, web development, and you are doing some preliminary testing of a website or a web program, uh, you can use 127.0.0.1 uh, to basically get internet on your own, or I'm sorry, web services on your own machine. So usable addresses. Usable addresses are going to be, as we mentioned, two less than the mathematical amount. The all zeros and all ones are taken out. The first and last addresses cannot be used. Uh, the zero for the host address is the entire network. Uh, all ones, so 255 for the host address, is the broadcast address. Uh, class D and E's are not used by regular hosts. Class D's for multicasting. Class E was reserved for future use, but has been given away to IPv6, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And IPv6 is neat stuff, so you should stay tuned. Yeah. I Warn warned you. I warned you this was coming. So War now we get okay, to Okay, so really quick, warning, math alert. So we're going to have a little bit of math. We're not going to have a ton, but we're going to have some. So we're used to base 10. Base 10 uh, in the one column, 0 through 9. Then the next field, 0 through 9 again. So 1s, 10s, 100s, 1000s. That's the system we're used to. Binary. Uh, the first field is 0 or 1. The second field is 0 or 1. The third field is 0 or 1. And what these 1s represent is the first one represents 1. The second one represents 2. The third one represents, Christopher? 4. 4. So if we have 1, 1, 1, 1, if we have 4 1s, what does that represent? That's going to give us 15. 15, yes. So it's just a different way or a different method to represent numbers. Uh, binary is typically what computers talk, binary or hex, hexadecimal. Uh, we're not going to get into hexadecimal here, but we will talk about binary. So this little conversion chart here that is uh, displayed basically shows, hey, here's the different fields. So we see 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. And then the decimal equivalent of numbers on the right-hand column. So now we're going to go over to Christopher's machine, and he's going to demo using the calculator how these different numbers look. Yep. So let me clear this while we're getting everything converted over. Now we're going to do some conversion. I've got the slide up behind me so you can actually see the reference we're talking about. And you see this decimal equivalent 224 in this binary representation. We're going to do some checking real quick. We're going to type in 224. We're in decimal. We're just going to switch binary. Let's take a look and see if the, uh, the computer and the slide match. And in fact, they do. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We've got five zeros and three ones. Uh, just a moment ago, Thomas asked about what would four ones be. Well, let's find that out. We're in binary. Let's type out four ones. Oops, not five. And go back to decimal. 15 is indeed the answer. So this is a great, if you want to use these slides, the calculator, it's very simple. It's got this conversion. You are going to have to go into programmer mode to get the decimal and binary options on here. And you can do these conversions and honestly do as many as it takes. There's For me, binary was an aha moment. I'd heard about it. I'd read about it. I tried to figure it out. I tried to figure it out. One day it just clicked. It just worked, and I knew how to do it. So do conversions, play around with it, uh, experiment with what numbers you can get. In this case, you know, 253. Think about what that's going to look like. Now, in this case, because of the, the fact we're in the programmer calculator, you're sort of going to get the answer right here ahead of time even before you convert to binary. So what you might want to do is start with the binary because you can see that and then convert in your head to the decimal and then check it here. So. And I don't know about the test nowadays, but back in the day, uh, when I took the test, you actually had to know a bit of binary. You had to be able to convert. Uh, do you have to convert on the test oh, now? Or? I remember. I just took the MTA a couple of months ago. I don't remember. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but it, this is more... So this knowledge, for the sake of the test, like I said, I'm not really sure you may or may not need it. But for the real world, 
if you're creating subnets, if you have a need for subnets, you absolutely will need it. This is, it is dry, it is math, it is kind of boring from time to time, but it is absolutely crucial information to have. Yeah, if you're gonna do any type of network architecture, uh, where you're dealing with subnets, you're creating networks, you will have to know subnetting. It's as simple as that. Yep. IP conflicts. So we talked a little bit earlier about MAC conflicts, media access control conflicts. Uh, there can also be IP address conflicts. So two devices share the same address. Uh, the, there's a Windows error, there's an IP address conflict with another system on the network. Um, well, how could that happen, Thomas? You might ask. Well, let me tell you. So you might have a system that's currently asleep that has an IP address and another system comes up online. Let me step back. Let me talk about DHCP very, very quickly. So DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, ha ha, nice, see, fun, nice. again, fun with abbreviations. Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, what this does is, as a machine boots up, uh, remember the, oh, this was in a different module, uh, the very nice graphic that, with the two computers talking to each other where the one computer was like, hey, I need information, and the server was like, here's information for you, and the server or the client was like, I love you, you're the best ever, and the server's like, I know, I rock. Remember that slide? <laughs> okay, well, when this first comes up, it's like, I need an address so I can communicate on the network, and a DHCP server will basically say, well, here's an address for you, and will hand a... Uh, address out. Uh, if a system's asleep and currently has an address associated with it, the DHCP server may not know, So and basically say, hey, this address is reusable, give it to somebody else. So when the system that's asleep comes back up, now we have address duplication. And the two, remember what I said about MAC addresses kicking each other off the network? You'll get an error and you'll basically have conflict. Besides DHCP, you can also create a static configuration. So we're used to, as we boot a device up, we automatically get an IP address. There's the ability to statically configure an address and associate a specific address. You could create duplication that way. So there are address conflicts that can occur. Uh, you'll need to resolve that if they do. If it does, the addresses will kick each other off the network. I can give a great example, real world example of kind of a side story in terms of IP conflicts and keeping track of them. I actually managed a network at one point for on a, for, on a consulting basis. They had a network. They didn't have any IT people. It was about 250 devices. That network did not have a DHCP server. So 250 devices with manually assigned IP addresses. So my method for avoiding IP conflicts was a spreadsheet that someone had printed years before, not even electronic at this point. It was a physical piece of paper, or multiple pieces of paper in this case, that had IP addresses 1 through 255 that we would write in names of devices when we gave them that address. And I would get a call once a week. This went on for about a year that I got a call once a week. Hey, we're adding a new computer. I'd drive over there, take my list, give it an IP, write it down, go back to my office. This is three or four minutes worth of work. And we build an hour minimum every time. That's how consultants work. So after about a year of doing this, I'd started having conversations with the manager on site about maybe putting in a DHCP server to, one, make life easier because you know, I'm billing them a certain amount of money every time I drive out there every week. And then the conflict, the, the potential for conflict is amazing. As computers have come off the network that we haven't documented that they may not tell us about, that as the range fills up and I start reusing back at the beginning, it could be a nightmare. I finally did convince them to spend, I think, about $100 on a piece of software that actually ran on a client that did DNS and DHCP so that we didn't have to manually assign addresses anymore and eliminate the, uh, the, the greatly increased potential for IP conflicts. Not a problem you want to have to deal with, especially on a network that size where you don't know where anything is. So even if the computer comes up and says, there's an IP conflict with a device on your network, I now have 250 computers over five city blocks of, it was a, oh, I won't talk about what kind of business it was, a big business, big uh, geographically, dispersed business, five city blocks of space, that I would have to go to dozens of buildings to find the device that has that IP to change it or to fix well, it. Or it could be a server in a closet. 
So you may not even like walk the floor and see it. It could be a server in a closet. What, it what's, could be what servers? Oh, or it could be maybe a router or yeah. a hub. They had that, access points. They had they had switches. They had all sorts of devices. Half of them we probably didn't even have documented at the time. It was it was potentially a nightmare. So the fact we got them to put in a DHCP server was a huge, huge benefit. Right, and that goes back to the documentation phase. So ensuring that you have appropriate documentation for your network. Uh, to just help it be, to be easier to run. I mean, it should be easy to, to manage. Public and private addresses. So IPv4 addresses are further classified as either public or private. Public IP addresses are ones that are exposed to the internet. Private IP addresses are hidden from the internet and other networks. So it mentions some private addresses. For class A, it starts with 10.0.0.0. B, 172.16, C, 192.168. Uh, for most of those with a home network that possibly have a DHCP server running, you may not even know you have a DHCP server running. It might just be part of your switch slash router that your uh, internet provider brought to you and you have DHCP running. Uh, we'll show you in a later module how the tools that you can use to check your address information out. Take a look and you'll probably see one of these sets of addresses associated with the devices in your home. Probably true. Static and dynamic addresses. So Christopher has talked about the horrors of static addressing. And it's not even necessarily that <laughs> static addresses are bad because there's certain devices on your network that you want static addresses for. Your servers. You don't want your servers constantly changing addresses. Your routers. And your routers. They're kind of required. Correct. So for those devices, you'll have static. So the idea is to minimize the static devices or the static addresses in your environment. And then the rest that come on, request services, possibly come off, they get dynamic IPs, Absolutely. and that would be uh, served by a dynamic host configuration protocol server, a DHCP server. I like how we're using that whole term. Well, yeah, I like it. I like you it. have the knowledge, you got to use it, right? That's true. A PIPA, A P I P A. So if you've ever booted a device on a network, and oh, first of all, sorry, a PIPA, automatic private IP addressing. Mm -hmm. If you've ever booted a device on the network and were unable to get network connectivity and you kind of did some troubleshooting and were like, well, I have an IP address and it's 169.254.blah, zeros, whatever it is. Um, this is a number. So as I said, as a device comes up on the network you, with DHCP, DHCP server here. So you have your DHCP server. Your client comes up and says, I need an address. And the server says, I have an address for you. And sends the address and then remember the huge love fest. I love you for giving me an address. And the server says, that's okay because you're a great client. So now if a device comes up and is unable to get to the server, it basically says, well, okay, I asked for a DHCP server or address and I didn't get one. So I'll just make my own. And then that's where the 169.254 comes in. I'm going to give myself a 169.254 address. Well, then it can't talk to anybody. So now it has this great address. Woo, I have a great address. Yay, me. But I can't talk to anybody. So then it's sad and lonely. So what's the advantage of that, though? Why, if, if, if all it does is create isolation, why do we have it? Why does it exist? What's, that's a good question. What's the advantage to a PIPA? So let's assume you're a small business or even at home. And maybe for some reason at home you don't have internet. I know the odds are very remote, but it's possible. Small business is a little bit more likely. We started a business, we have people using computers, we don't have an internet connection, which means we don't have a router to potentially su supply DHCP services. And we're business people, we're not computer people, so we don't know what DHCP is or how routers work or that we need any of this stuff. We just bought 10 computers and they came in and we plugged them all in and turned them on and they came on just fine. The advantage to a PIPA is in an environment like that where I don't have a device providing DHCP, those 10 computers are still going to communicate with each other because they're all going to give themselves the same a PIPA network ID. And the host IDs are dynamically generated but don't matter in this case as long as they're unique. And as, as each of those devices comes up with an a PIPA address, it's actually going to send out a little request saying, are there other a PIPA devices I need to know so that I'm unique on the network and can now talk to the other devices. 
So even if I don't have a DHCP server in my environment, I can still have intercommunication yep. between devices. If you've got a switch and cabling and you plug those 10 computers on and, or in and turn them on, they're still going to be able to communicate with each other via PIPA. Do you know what this tells me? This tells me TCP IP is swell. It is. It takes care of you even if you don't have a DHCP server in your environment. Default gateway and DNS server. Okay, we've talked about the different networks and subnetting. Typically, your device will only speak to devices on its own network. If I need to speak to devices that aren't on my network, that's where a gateway comes in. A gateway gives me the ability to talk to devices on other networks. So basically, I can access my own network just fine, but now I need to access a device on the other network. The minute I see, or the minute my device sees, hey, I'm going to try and talk to a device on another network, now it knows I got to go to my gateway. My gateway will allow me to communicate with devices on my other network. What kind of device will that typically be? It could be a server. A could server. Be. So we talked about uh, services that a server provide. A gateway could be a service that a server would provide. What would that service be called in the Windows world? I thought it was called the gateway service. Not anymore. Oh, it's not? Routing and remote access. Ah, routing and remote access, again, you learn something all the time. So in this case, you're turning a Windows server into a router. This is one of the things I actually, I don't want to say I wish it would change. The, the title default gateway is a misnomer in that it's almost always a router you're, you're pointing to. Whether it's a, an internet router at home to get to the internet or a router at work to get to other networks, they say default gateway, but it's not a gateway device by the standards of what we've talked about this in these modules. So a little quick... Quick misnomer to hopefully avoid confusion later when you're going, we don't have any gateways on my network. Well, you do have routers, and that's what a gateway should be. And basically, this is the default device. So if I'm trying to access another network, and it's not on my network, I can say, hey, I'm going to send this to my default gateway, and I know it'll take care of it. Yep. DNS. So we've talked about names. Names being associated to IP addresses. IP addresses being associated to MAC addresses. DNS, Domain Name Server, uh, it basically has the ability that this name is associated to this address. So www.microsoft.com is associated to an address, and the DNS server is the one that associates that name to that address mm -hmm. for me. So I don't need to know the address of the machine. I just say www.microsoft.com, DNS arbitrates, translates that, into the IP address and then sends me where I need to go. Absolutely. Uh, we have a demo. We do indeed. Christopher, so we're going to talk about IP address properties, default gateway, routing and remote access. Indeed. Uh -huh. And then the DNS server. All right, so I'm back on my, on my little demo environment here. This is all set up. It's got an IP address. I actually run the HTTP server in this environment, so it's all there. We're going to jump into our command prompt. And we're going to, I'm actually going to give everybody about 30 seconds to think about what I ran earlier in a, in a previous module to get information about my network adapter's addressing information. And while I'm talking, I'll just let them think about it, see if they can remember what it was before I actually type it on the screen. To get that information from a command prompt, I can use IP config, and we're going to go over more of this in a, in a future module as well in much greater detail. Now, the downside of this is it doesn't quite give me everything we're looking for. I get an IP address. Awesome, that's my IP address, 10.0.0.39. I get a subnet mask, and I get a default gateway. What am I missing? What else are we trying to find in this information? DNS. DNS. I need name servers. Anybody know, I'm wondering if somebody at home knows and is probably screaming at the computer right now trying to get me to hear them, what I can do to get that information out of this tool. Is there a switch that you could use? There is indeed. If I use the all switch, I get much more information. And we'll come back up to this same network adapter. I now get the network adapter type. It's physical address. This is the MAC address we've been talking about. I get my IP4 address and subnet mask, as I saw before. 
I also got DHCP information in this in this screen. Lease obtained, lease expires. This tells me how long I've had and will have the IP address I have from the DHCP server I got it from. And then right down, and also the DHCP server itself. And down here at the bottom, DNS servers. I have two configured. That's for various different reasons that we I probably won't cover in this course for the sake of depth. And this is this is all the information I might need to know. And then we'll talk about IP6 later on. For now, we'll just cover the IP4. Okay, so let's talk about network address translation. Awesome. So we talked about IPv4 being four octets of numbers, so basically four series of 0 to 255. The problem with that being is that's a limited amount of addresses. I mean, sure, that's billions of addresses, for about 4.3 billion addresses. The problem being is as we start to add devices, uh, this is global. They, everybody, and now the proliferation of devices, nowadays it's not uncommon for a single person to have three, four, even more devices that access the internet. So your phone, uh, nowadays people have watches, uh, Fitbits, um, tablets, computers, laptops, all of these need their own addresses. A billion globally can get used up pretty fast. It can. So basically what we had, what we had, what they came up with is network address translation or NAT. Basically what this is, is a method for translating addresses from one network onto another. So as we mentioned earlier, the 192.168, uh, if you're in a small office, home office, or you're on a home network, you'll probably see that address. How is it all these different environments can share the same address when we've said that people need or devices need unique IDs to connect to the internet? Well, that's where network address translation comes in. With network address translation, it translates addresses from one network, 192.168.0.1, to another network, typically internet-facing address. So now, you or your company can be assigned one physical address on the outside. So internet facing, you have one physical address. Inside, you can use 192.168 and have a whole bunch of devices internally. The NAT device allows that translation. For, for some more geek knowledge, I've got on my screen right now, if we can uh, get it up here. There's the comparison. The numbers of available addresses in IPv4 and IPv6. So there's a little bit of a difference in IPv6 for how many are available. So NAT, very required or very necessary in the days of IPv4, which we're still in. Not so much in IPv6. And that's one of the benefits of IPv6 is more addresses, is yep. getting away from that scarcity of addressing and you have to remember, TCP IP, when they first created, they were just starting to talk about networking, uh, interconnectivity of devices. Um, it kind of went back to that 256 megs of hard drive. Who would ever fill that up? Nobody will ever fill up 256 megs hard drives. Well, then video, uh, Word documents, blah, 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 and then stuff started to fill up. So IPv4, the same thing. Initially, there were a certain amount of addresses, uh, devices interconnected. But now with the prol proliferation of devices, there just needs to be more addresses. Well, and here is just for, again, I, for some reason I like doing this particular demo when I'm in classes. I just added a number to this that's the number of IP6 addresses per person alive on Earth right now. Oh, there we go. So yeah, so for some, for some good gauges of... You could have approximately, I don't even know how many numbers that is, but that's how many devices any person could have and still get a unique IP address for every single a one couple. of them. A couple. Yeah, a few. A couple. So that will, that will cover my five devices. Go, go grab another phone. I'm just saying, let's, let's take advantage. Go what kind it. of phone go. might somebody grab? Any kind of smartphone. Preferably, preferably Windows, Windows 8. Preferably grab Windows, Windows 8. Phone. They're nice. Windows They're 8, nice. Surface, 
grab one of those. And connect to the internet. We will give you IP addresses for days. Yeah, yeah, we're happy to. We are. We're indeed. happy to. Okay, so network address translation. If you look at the slide here, uh, as we said, it's the process of uh, giving addresses or modifying addresses from one system to another. And you basically see we have some devices here, uh, 10, 11. We have a hub or possibly a switch uh, to allow those to intercommunicate with each other. But then we have a network address translation device uh, here that translates our internal network to internet facing. And again, your device that you get from your internet provider probably has NAT translation in it, or network address translation in it. If it doesn't, it probably doesn't connect you to the internet. So probably. odds are probably. that technology is there and working. So there's a network address translation. So in this graphic here, you see connection type, DHCP client, quality of service engine, active, cable status, connected, uh, network status established, connection uptime, uh, your MAC address, your IP address, your subnet mask, default gateway, DNS, so primary and secondary DNS. Now notice, so our address is for the WAN, wide area network, the LAN is your local area network. So between your local area network and your wide area network, your network address translation is occurring. So to create these networks, we use a process called subnetting. And this is where that math comes in. So it's a subdivision of your local or your logical IP network. Uh, by default, all computers are on one subnet, and you need to use the subnet mask to configure this a bit. Uh, by modifying the default subnet mask, you can store your subnet into uh, your network onto smaller networks. Um, so you look, your type, your class A, class B, class C, see the decimal equivalents and the binary. Equivalence. Yeah. So our subnet IDs, here's some different subnet IDs, the binary equivalent, the host IP range in binary, and the host IP in decimal. I'll just leave this up. There's nothing really, you can kind of review this a little bit. You might want to pause on this and kind of read it if you're a little bit more interested. Subnets, so your net ID, subnet ID, your host ID, your mask, number of usable subnets, and number of hosts per subnet. So, so this one demonstrates one of the concepts behind subnetting. We've talked a lot about the default subnets in the prior slides, 255.255.255.0, that first one. Um, the, the option or the process of subnetting beyond that in this slide, you see how the mask changes. It doesn't end in zero. We've looked at 255.0.0.0, 255.255.0.0. These don't end in zero. And what subnet masking allows us to do is allows us to take a, a range we've been given and break it into smaller networks without adding more networks or adding more routers. Let's say we don't have routers. We can't create these distinct networks using hardware. It's another software method to do it. We use a subnet mask to sort of borrow bits from what would be the host ID portion of your IP address and lend them to the, the network portion, network ID portion. Uh, in this case, this table demonstrates or, or shows us how the bits break down in terms of that borrowing. The, the net ID, the subnet ID, and the host ID, um, they're, they're giving us those second two, the second and third columns numbers of bits. In the top so, yeah, example. So the host ID we're using all three octets yep. for, or I'm sorry, the net ID, that we're using all three octets for the net ID. The subnet ID column shows you how much of the host ID, how much of that binary from the top we're gonna borrow. And then the host ID shows how many bits we have left over to create hosts. The actual host, yep. So this is a topic that it's very difficult to cover, especially via video. Usually I'm on a whiteboard doing 
multiple different translations, creating subnet IDs and breaking them into the number of networks and the number of hosts. This topic is one we may delve into in a subsequent video. There may be other resources to look at. Subnetting is a very important topic. It's one everyone should learn. Uh, there are, I hate to say this because I didn't use any of these when I learned. I'm not even sure they were out yet. There are calculators out there to help you determine and build subnets and subnet masks if you need them. I would say don't use them. I'm a purist. I was, I'm, I, although I sound like, you know, I used a slide Back rule to do a multiplication. Day. I used calculators. My parents used slide rules. I did this on paper. Kids nowadays, kills me to say that, will have calculators to do subnetting. So. I, I, I think we've, I think we're kind of done with subnetting. I you think. I think so. It's a tough one to try and cover in a video, honestly. Oh, it, it really is. It it's really, difficult. Well, and there, there's that whole Q and A thing. There that, is. That, that's really kind of difficult. So, um, we're giving you some really good basic information. Um, don't be afraid to go and search and and look up additional information on these topics. If you see a topic and you're like. I still don't quite get it. Feel free to search for additional information on it. Bing is chock full of content. Bing it. IPv6. So we talked about IPv4, fourth generation. Now we have IPv6, the new generation of IP addressing for the internet. Uh, solves some of the limitations of IPv4, such as scarcity addresses and security. Uh, they're represented by eight groups of four hexadecimal digits. It's not backwards compatible with IPv4. It's a 128-bit system versus IPv4 was a 32-bit system. And this kind of uh, gives you some information Christopher already gave you. Uh, IPv4, about 4.3 billion. IPv6, uh, 340 undecillion. That's, the, that's that number, undecillion. Undecillion. So our address types, there's a unicast address, an anycast address, and a multicast address. A unicast address is a specific, is a packet designed for a specific network interface. So this is a packet uh, for a single network interface for a single device. There are two types of unicast addresses, global unicast address, which are routable and displayed directly to the internet, and link local addresses, automatically configured addresses to communicate with devices on the same link. So these aren't globally routed. So link local is very similar to your APIPA. Okay. It's sort of the, the IPv6 equivalent. I say sort of loosely. There's IPv6 is like subnetting. We're not going to get to go into nearly oh, the yeah. depth. No. No. There's an anycast address. Uh, this identifies multiple interfaces, but the packet is sent to the closest one per routing. Multicast address, the packet is delivered to multiple devices and multiple hosts. The address components, they're broken down into three parts. The site prefix, the first three groups of numbers define the network. The subnet ID is basically similar to a subnet mask. And the interface ID is the host portion. So demonstrated here on the slide, an IPv6 address, notice how large it is. And then the, the table here breaks down the site prefix, which is 48 bits, the subnet ID, which is 16 bits, and the interface ID, which is 64 bits. And now we have a demo of IPv6. So in this demo, um, not terribly involved. It's really just a matter of we're going to bring up this same tool we looked at earlier and have a look at IPv6 in action. I have IPv6 on this network. Now, I'm not using any sort of IPv6 DHCP or any sort of, which, again, I wish we could dig into this more. I wish we had more hours in the day. Uh, to go into IPv6 now, it differs from IPv4. DHCP potentially may not be used on a network using IPv6. Hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Look up some more, some more information. Maybe we'll do an IPv6 deep dive video one of these days. Um, this is actually a, uh, what's called a link local address. This is an automatically generated IPv6 address on my computer. And you can tell that by the prefix FE80. Uh, they're very similar to a PIPA is 169.254. Link local generated addresses are FE80 or FEC0. I believe there are two different ranges that could be assigned. Well, and I would have the, uh, the watchers 
notice here, the video watchers notice here that the, there's a link local IPv6 address and yet there's still an IPv4 address. Absolutely. This is referred to as a dual IP, st IP stack. So both of those stacks are running simultaneously. Absolutely, and that allows me to communicate with IP4 devices on my local network as well as IP6 devices on my local network or out on the internet. Uh, there are a number of sites, public sites now working on IPv6 that are running and using IPv6. So the, the goal at this point for a lot of providers, internet providers especially, is to make this transition seamless. At home, you'll never even know you've been changed to IPv6. In corporate networks, it's gonna be different. It is an effort, it is an actual project that has to be undertaken to implement it correctly and make sure that there is no interruption of service. Uh, and, and part of the issue is all your intermediary devices, switches, hubs, routers, gateways, they all have to understand th this new uh, referencing ID, yep. this new uh, addressing system. And that, so there's cost involved. There's, there's upgrade, whether it be hardware or software, there are upgrade costs involved to get this working. Or training. Or training, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, more, training. more training. And remember, how much are these MVA courses, Christopher? Uh, let's see. These cost uh, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Again, a hug of knowledge for you. Indeed. Okay, so I talked about the dual IP stack. That's the next slide here. So I'm going to blow past this. We talked about it while Christopher was doing his demo. Uh, IPv4 mapped addresses. So basically what this is, is the ability to map IPv4 to IPv6. Directly in this case. Correct. Correct. So if you look at the last bullet, notice we have the first 80 bits are set to zero. And that's designated, if you're looking at the last bullet here, by the dual colon sign. Mm -hmm. So that means the first 80 bits are set to zero. The next 16 are set to one, shown as FFF. And the last 32 bits are populated by the IPv4. So there's that 10, 254, 254.1 address that we're familiar with. So this is a way to encapsulate an IPv4 address into an IPv6 address. Absolutely. There's also IPv4 to IPv6 tunneling. So an IPv6 packet can be encapsulated inside an IPv4 datagram. Uh, it talks about for a Microsoft operating system done with the Teredo adapter, virtual adapter or swoop, sw oh my God, I'm Suedo interface, pseudo interface. Oh my, I, I, my mind went blank. It happens, it's been, it's been a day. Uh, not a physical network adapter, and then it gives an example, the F80 colon colon, which I think we just saw F80 somewhere, didn't we, Christopher? We did indeed, that's a link local address right there. Okay. So yeah, IP4, IPv4 to IPv6 tunneling is very handy for implementing IPv6, but not fully. I want clients to get IPv6 addresses, I may want servers to get IPv6 addresses. Let's say that my routers and switches can't handle IPv6 yet. Well, I can implement that, that technology on those servers and clients, wrap those addresses in IPv4, and then route them through those routers and those switches that will recognize them, and then the server and client on the other end will unwrap them and use the IPv6 addresses. So we could use this as a method of migration yep, absolutely. for IPv4 to IPv6. Yep, and there are a number of these technologies available, so more, more research for people doing IPv6 implementations. Okay. We're at the summary already. We are. I, we keep. It seems to me like we're blowing through this content, and now we're just at the summary again. We need more like transitional slides so we can tell it's coming more than just oh hey yeah, you're done. Yeah, I feel abrupt. I, I feel like we're going somewhere, going somewhere, and all of a sudden we're here. And you know, it's a little jolting. Well, yeah, but that gets people to watch the next one. It gets, it gets you on edge. Hopefully. Oh, there's more. Oh, they can't stop now. I gotta go to the next video. Yeah, cliffhanger. That's what we're trying to do. Cliffhanger. So summary: be able to categorize. IPv4 addresses using classifications such as A, B, and C. We've talked about default gateway and DNS server, what they are and how to configure them. We've talked about defining advanced TCP concepts such as NAT, subnetting, and how to create network subnets. We've talked about the basics of IPv6 and a little bit about how to configure IPv6. 
And we've talked about the IPv6 dual stack and tunneling technologies. Yep. Christopher, once, additional resources and next steps. Yep, once again, we get to talk about what to do next. After this, we've got the MTA book, Microsoft Technology Associate Networking Fundamentals from Microsoft Office Academic Course. We've got our instructor-led courses in case you, again, want to get more hands-on, want to use these tunneling technologies in a lab environment, want to implement an IPv6 infrastructure, want to see how those uh, the Teredo interface works, way to do that, and then the exam and certification that we're hopefully preparing you for right now, exam 98-336, Networking Fundamentals. We're at the end. Um, there's so much more I want to tell people. There's so much more to be told. Uh, I, I, I don't want the video to end. You can stay if you want to. Well, I, I feel really bad. We, we have so much more to tell people, well, and you, this is just over. I'll let you, I'll let you keep talking. I'm going to go ahead and, and slide out this way right off camera. Well, no, I mean, they're, they're done with this one. But, they are for now. But there's just so, so you need to come back. The there, beauty, there's the beauty for us, we're going to make lots more of these for you to come back and watch more of. So come back. Hi, Thomas Willingham here with Christopher Chapman, and we are here uh, for course 98366 MTA Networking Fundamentals, and we are here to talk about TCP IP tools. We are indeed. There are, there are a couple of them that we're going to go over today, so we should spend a couple minutes on one or two dozen tools that we have for TCP IP networking. Might even demo a few, show people how things work. and We'll, we'll see how I feel. Okay. I'm thinking okay. about it. We'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Okay, let me use the command finger to advance the slides. Look at there we go. So skill so concepts that we're going to talk about using basic TCP IP commands and working with advanced TCP IP commands. So basically we've talked about TCP IP and how it is a protocol used for internet communication. As you set up TCP IP, it's helpful to have tools to verify connectivity, to troubleshoot connectivity, to verify routes, which we can talk about. Uh, and these are some of the tools that we're going to talk about. The command prompt, IP config, ping, and trace route. So the command prompt. The command prompt is Microsoft's version of a command line interface. You can use the command line as an administrator, also run, known as running in elevated mode. And then these tools are referred to as command line tools as opposed to window-based tools or GUI-based tools because you run these in the command line. There are other sites that may have uh, Windows-based versions of these tools, but the tools we're going to talk about are command prompt-based. IP config. IP config allows you to view the current configuration of the IP stack on your network device using TCP IP. This command line utility has switches, one of which is slash all, and this switch can be used to view additional details about each adapter. You can view information such as DHCP information, DNS, your IP address, your subnet mask. You can also use the IP config utility to refresh your DHCP and DNS settings. Ping. Ping is a very low level way or method of verifying connectivity. So you verify connectivity with a ICMP echo request message. And if we look at the demo here, or we look at the graphic here, thanks to Christopher for these amazing graphics. It's what I do. It's what I do. So basically, you have the first device saying, hey, are you awake? The second one, yes, I am. And basically, that's all there is to ping. Ping is actually for, stands for Packet Internet Groper. It actually means something. It can be used to test IPv4 and IPv6 connectivity. Traceroute. Traceroute is, allows the ability to determine a path taken to a destination by sending an ICMP echo request message to the destination 
and then incrementally de increasing time to live field values. Time to live is basically hops in the packet. So used to trace a network path, and it's useful if the local device is testing okay, but you're not sure the route is correct. So basically the network device, the client says, hey, how do I get there? Sends a message. And then you see, as you hit each device, it forwards it to the next device. And you basically get a, a path of from your source to your destination. Mm -hmm. So Christopher, why don't you show us how these command line utilities actually look and how they work? I suppose. I suppose I can do that. So we're going to jump into my already existing demo environment. I've got it up and ready to go. I'm sitting at what you'd see when you get to a typical server desktop. You're going to have server manager open. It opens by default. I have added command prompt to the taskbar via the start menu. So I'm going to close server manager. I've also added it to my start menu. So if I go to start, it's, uh, oh, I guess I have to be on the right computer first. It's also right here. Uh, okay, so really quick, uh, you had multiple start menus there. I'm remoted in, so I'm, I've okay. got my main desktop and then the computer I'm remoted into, okay. so apologize for that. So just to clarify, you yes. are using remote desktop? I am. Okay. So I have the command prompt. You won't find this here by default on a server. You've got to add it via the all apps option, or this will actually change a little bit in the next version, so you'll have to navigate through the next screens to get to it. Uh, the reason I put this here and on the task menu, I did want to demonstrate right-clicking and run as administrator were you to want to do that. Now I'm logged into this server as an administrator, so it's going to do that all by itself. You can tell at the top when I click it says administrator command prompt. So on a day to, you, so you mentioned you're logged on as administrator. For day-to-day -day working purposes as an administrator, is it a good procedure or is it a good process to be logged in on your server as an administrator? Typically, well, it depends on what you're doing. Typically you're going to be managing servers from a desktop that you're going to be logged into not as an administrator. You're going to use run as, you're going to use different consoles logged in as different users. You're not going to be just sitting at a computer logged in as an administrator, typically. If you're remoting into a server, depending on that server and what its role is, you might because you may have to. If you're troubleshooting a domain controller, you're going to have to log in locally as an administrator unless you've changed permissions on those domain controllers to allow non-admins to log onto the desktop, which may or may not be a great idea. So it depends. Okay. So here we are. We're going to start right away. I'm going to use this to ping some, some internal addresses first. Uh, I've got some pretty generic names on this network, so I can do that. And the IP addresses are all internal, so it makes no difference. And That's, then notice the server name is resolved to an IP address. Mm -hmm. And then you get a reply from those, that IP address. Yep. And then we talked about before in the IP, when we talked about TCP IP, uh, kind of le let's let people think about this, but what service or what protocol allows that name to be uh, coordinated with that IP address? So let them think about that for a minute. Yeah, does anybody remember? Well, I hope they do. I hope they're hanging on every word or they at least every be. other word. It's only been like five minutes since we talked about this. So Okay, so DNS. DNS, DNS is, is the domain name service. Yep. And that allows IP addresses to be converted to server names. Yep. Uh, typically, we interface with server names. It's easier for us as people. We remember server names. Uh, and we do that over the internet, www.microsoft.com. We remember that. The DNS server is the system that uses or transfers that name to that address. Yep. Gives us, gives us a name to remember. It gives the computers the numbers it needs to actually function. So our next one, we're going to ping something external, see if we get the same result. Now in this case, you'll notice something weird happens. It says pinging, it resolves to an IP address, but nothing happens. I keep getting requests timed out. The reason that's happening, in this case, the endpoint, outlook.com, they've configured their network devices to not respond to ICMP requests. So I can send my ping packet that says, are you here? Their router's just completely ignoring anything going on. But notice we still have DNS name resolution. Yes, and we do get the IP address, so we at least know 
DNS is working. Now, this could also mean that the host is just down. This could mean a number of things, but in this case, I'm assuming Outlook.com is not down at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock on, on any morning of the week, so hopefully. Uh, so it's the same idea. You can ping any address. You can ping by name. You can ping by IP if you want. You'll also get results. The other thing you can do, we talked about this briefly in a previous module, you can ping the same name with different protocols. So I don't want to look IP4, I want to see IP6. So, oh, that's not the way it's supposed to come up. Oh. I'm trying to think of an external address that would actually work. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but you can with, the, with that switch, despite the fact it didn't work here, and that's not going to work because it's an IP4 address, uh, despite the fact that this isn't working on my demo because I don't have IP6 configured correctly on the, net, the test network, with that dash 6 switch, you're going to ping IP6 and you'll be able to see those results. The next one, uh, I'm going to throw a little fun one in here, CLS, clear screen, for anybody who doesn't know that. We talked about IP config. I'm kind of going a little out of order, but should be okay. This is going to give me information about the, the host I'm sitting on, in this case, the server I'm sitting on. Now, you do see an IP6 address on the screen, so this one does have IP6. It is working, but what wasn't working in that last one was that the, it can't resolve. I pinged my name, IP6. It couldn't resolve the name to an IP6 address. So even though it has an address, it couldn't be found. Uh, IP config with the switch we talked about gives you much more detailed information. It lets you know what kind of adapter this in case In this case, I'm running Hyper-V. So my main network adapter is actually a virtual adapter. It's not a physical hardware network card. IP6, IP4, this adds DHCP information. If it's being used, in this case, this is a server, so it's not. I've got a static IP. NetBIOS over TCP IP enabled if you're using it. Just more information, much more information. That physical address, which is the MAC address yep. we talked about previously. We did, so that's right here. Now that's, well, we won't go too far into that topic. I was going to say this is virtualized, so that's a different conversation. And you will notice you can actually see, um, I did IP config all. There's the Hyper-V network adapter, and that's it. There's no... It appears as though there's no physical network adapter in this computer, in this server, and that's because I only have one network adapter, and I've allowed Hyper-V to take over and use it. So let's clear screen again. We'll do one more. We'll try traceroute, and in this case, I do want to use a public address that I know works. And this is that graphic I had where I'm saying to, the, to something on the internet, are you here? How do I get where you are? And then the devices between the client in this case, which is a server, and the server I'm going to are going to respond each one at a time and let me know where it's going. And some of this is kind of telling. You can actually trace your packets, Bellevue, Burien, Seattle, Seattle. Um, I've done pings in classes where I'll be sitting in a class in Seattle, ping a server at my house in Seattle, and the packets go through Virginia, Florida, UK in rare instances. Uh, in this case, we're going to San Jose. So this server probably lives somewhere, somewhere in the Bay Area. Try one more, just for fun. That's what happens when you trace around something that's sitting right next to the server you're using. Oh, also, can you ping, we talked about localhost? Yes, we did. Uh, 127.001, uh, let's ping localhost and well, see what happens. And I'll do this with the name first, so you'll notice I can use localhost. It doesn't resolve to 127.0.0.1 by default. Because this is server 2012, IP6 is the protocol it's going to try first, mm. and the local host IP6 address is colon colon one. I can still ping 127.0.0.1, absolutely. And that works like a champ. Great. Hopefully, because this demo would be drastically impacted if pinging local host was not working. So I think that's it for the first round of tools. It is. Uh, now we have our advanced tools. So we've talked about some basic connectivity tools. And again, the idea behind this is opening the command line. Uh, you've set up a system. Uh, maybe TCP IP isn't working quite correctly, or it has weird issues. So you can use these tools to troubleshoot your connectivity. 
So let's look at some of our advanced tools. Some of our advanced tools include NetStat, MBTStat, PathPing, NSLOOKUP, NetShell, Route with the dash print option, Net and Telnet. So NetStat, this displays active TCP connections, ports on which the computer is listening, Ethernet statistics, the routing table, statistics for IPv4 and IPv6. Used without parameters, NetStat displays active TCP connections. So active TCP connections, this is connections to other systems, whatever those other systems may be. Maybe you're browsing the web, so www.microsoft.com. Uh, maybe you have a Telnet session going. Maybe you're doing a remote desktop session. Uh, these would all be remote. Oh, maybe you're using file and print services. Maybe you're using a printer. Those would all be uh, active TCP connections. NBT stat. This displays net BIOS over TCP IP, net BT, protocol statistics for local and remote computers. Net BIOS. Net BIOS is kind of an interesting thing. It was developed in the 80s to allow applications to communicate over a network using the session layer of the OSI model. Okay, that's kind of interesting. What does that mean? Basically, Net BIOS allowed computers to have names similar to DNS, but before Microsoft really implemented DNS. This is when uh, Microsoft used NetBuoy as one of their default protocols. NetBIOS was the naming scheme that was used. And NetBIOS tended to only work on local computers. NBT Stat uh, displayed this NetBIOS information. PathPing, a command line routing tool that combines features of basically ping and trace traceroute, including some additional information sends packets to each router on the way to the final destination, and then computes results based on the packets returned from each hop. And each hop, a hop is basically crossing a router or a router device. Uh, PathPane can also sh show the degree of packet loss at any specified router, so this can give you a little bit of troubleshooting information. NS Lookup. NSLOOKUP can be used to diagnose domain name system issues, and it allows you to look up the name of a host to see if you're getting proper DNS name resolution. Uh, you should probably have a bit of familiarity with DNS before you use this tool. NetShell. NetShell isn't so much a command as it is a scripting utility. And what I mean by scripting utility is NetShell and then an option or a command allows you to perform different options. Uh, commands work on local or remote computers. It provides a scripting features that allow you to basically run a group or a batch of commands against a specified computer. Again, either local or remote. And you have the ability to save the configuration script in a text file in case you want to have like a little testing script that you're running on systems, you can save it, pull it down, and run it on the system. Route. Okay, so you have your local IP routing table. Your IP routing table defines what goes where. How do I get to... So if I'm, if I'm thinking about going somewhere, I'm at Bellevue, Washington, and I want to get to Seattle, how can I get there? Well, an IP routing table can give you the paths to get there. I could take 520, I could take I-90, I could take 405 to the top of I uh, to the top of the lake, I could take uh, 405 to the bottom of the lake. So these are all freeways that I could use to get to my destination. The IP routing table has similar functionality. The route print command can be used to display the routing table and is very similar to netstat-r. The route command can also be used to add and delete static routes, and we'll talk about the difference between static and dynamic routes later. It's very exciting, you should stay tuned. Net, uh, many commands use uh, the net command that begin with the word net. 
It's not specifically part of the TCP IP stack, but can be used to test network connectivity on your system. Telnet. Telnet isn't so much a troubleshooting command as it allows you to communicate with a remote computer using the Telnet protocol. You can initiate a Telnet session by saying Telnet and then the host name or IP address, at which point you get a Telnet prompt. This is a low level prompt that you can perform basic commands at. Uh, again, the network administrator can connect using Telnet IP address or Telnet host name. You can also test to see if different ports are working by saying Telnet server and then a specific port name. Back in the day, really good times were you would Telnet to the email port of a server, initiate a connection, and you could have an email directly from Santa. True story. Christopher, why don't you show how some of these utilities can work for us? I can do that. I'm actually installing the Telnet client right now, so we'll have to wait on that last one for just a minute. But it'll be installed by the time we get back to here. So I made a list. I had to keep track of which tools we're looking at. So we'll start right at the top, NetStat. This one's pretty straightforward. This is what it shows you. It shows you those TCP connections. Uh, in this case, Windows 8, like I mentioned, I'm remoted. So it tells me that this server is being remoted into by another computer. Um, Microsoft DS, directory services, so my Active Directory, in this case, domain controller, also staying in sync with this machine. The rest of these are, I, I couldn't tell you, I'm just looking at them. They're all ports that, probably dynamic ports generated by some other service. Well, and, and let's, let's go over that, Christopher. You said that you weren't familiar with all of these uh, ports and IP addresses. There used to be a class, the service and support class, that talked about access to tools and access to basically resources. The idea as a good network administrator isn't to know everything. Uh, technologies constantly evolve, they constantly change, they're constantly different. Uh, things are tweaked. Uh, what worked one day may or may not work the next day just because the system's evolved and, and a little bit different. So the idea isn't to know everything. And if you're like, holy crap, I'm never going to learn any of this. There, there's just way too much. I'm drinking from a fire hose. Well, one, yes, you are drinking from a fire hose. Two, there is a lot to learn. But three, you don't have to learn everything. That's not the point. A really good administrator knows where to go and knows how to access resources. They know what the good sites are, and you'll start to find this out because different systems, you'll have different protocols, different hardware, different software involved. So you'll find sites that you need to use that will help you search this stuff out. So if you're looking at this stuff and go, wow, I'm, I'm never gonna remember all those addresses, I'm never gonna remember all that stuff, don't worry about it, you don't need to, that's not the point. The point is, if you look at that and go, you know, I don't know what that is, but I remember it being about, I found that using the netstat command, I know this is an IP address, and from the colon colon one, I know this is an IPv6 address. So you can pick up basic information, and then using that basic information, you can go and research more. Well, on this particular screen, that's even more true in that the local address, colon colon one, I know it's IP6, I also know that it is the loopback address. It's the IP6 version of 127.0.0.1. So these connections are self-contained connections. It's this server, some service on this server talking to either another service on this server or itself in some instances. So that is netstat, pretty simple. Our next one, as long as I can figure out how to type, MBT stat. Now this one, unfortunately, we're not gonna get a whole lot of information because I don't run NetBIOS, I don't have NetBIOS clients, I don't have Win servers, but we can at least see how it works. This is one of the few tools that if you just run it by itself, just MBT stat, it's going to ask you for more information. It doesn't have a default state. So I need to tell it to do something with a switch. And it lists all the switches here. A very important note about this tool, this is one of not very many tools that is included in any Microsoft product that is case sensitive. You'll notice the switches. There's an A and a capital A. There's an S and a capital S. Those switches mean different things. 
Uh, in this case, we're going to do n. It's just a list of local NetBIOS names. The only names on here are the name of the server I'm on and the domain I'm on. So not a whole lot to MBT stat. These days, you probably won't use a lot of MBT stat or see a lot of information within it because it's not widely used. What's my next one? PathPing. So PathPing is going to look like a combination of two tools we've already seen. It's similar to ping in that it's going to get us some information about resolution, but it's like trace route in that it's going to give us this, this, this route, exactly like it did in trace route. Now, at the end of this, this is where it's actually interesting. We get through this all the way down to the bottom. It doesn't take that long. Two more. Ta-da. And now it says computing statistics for 300 seconds. It's actually going to track basically response times through this path from where I'm at to the endpoint that I'm trying to get to, and it's going to give me a report when it's done. It's an interesting tool. It's not one I've used a whole lot. Uh, when I'm troubleshooting network issues, it's usually just a matter of is something working or is it not and why. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this. We're not going to wait the 300 seconds unless everybody wants to sit in silence for five minutes and wait, which we can do. Our next one, I like that I have to jump back and forth to keep track of all the tools. NS lookup. This tool has saved, well, clients and dollars and networks and jobs in some cases a lot in my life. NS Lookup is a great tool for getting lots of information. And I'm going to do a couple of demos. I, I could actually spend probably an hour on this tool. I'm going to try not to do that. So for now, NS Lookup gives me a couple of pieces of information right away. Default server and address. It's going to grab the default DNS server IP from the server I'm on or the computer I'm on. And it's going to use that as the address. Now, what you might see where it says default server is you might see a name unknown or unable to resolve issue if you don't have your reverse DNS entry set up correctly. We haven't talked about that a whole lot. I'm not going to go into detail. But reverse DNS is a requirement on an internal network for this to resolve to the name. It won't necessarily impact functionality as long as the IP address is correct. So we've got our server up. We've got an address. Let's get started. This one, you just type in what you're looking for. And it responds with an address. And then notice, like Telnet, this brings us to a command prompt environment. Yes, we have options. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate in just a moment. So we start with just very simple. I'm looking for a host. Give me host information. And it gives me that information. Gives me that information. It's a good little tool. But it allows me, this is a DNS troubleshooting tool. It's not just a name resolution, just pure names to IPs. I can do other things. Let's say I want to find out the mail server for a domain. There you go. This is actually going to give me the mail exchanger addresses for the domain I put in. I set the type to mail exchanger. I give it a domain. It gives me all the answers. Now, so, it says non-authoritative is a little bonus information. It says non-authoritative answer because my server, this 10.0.0.10, does not have this information. It has to go out and get this information from somewhere else and bring it back. And just real quick, so people understand, when you say type equals MX, you're telling DNS that, hey, I want to use a mail exchange. I want to get mail exchange information. Yeah, that's a, it's a record type in DNS. We didn't really go into too much detail. Uh, I can do the same thing. With aliases, and I'm trying to think of one I've actually got set up that would work. No, I don't have I don't have an alias for SharePoint on my internal network. Uh, I actually set up a, an A record. So to go back to the default, again, little bonus information: the default record type when you launch uh, when you launch NS Lookup is A. A records. These are default DNS name resolution records. So now, this is going to be a little confusing because A records are typically associated to hosts, to endpoints. C names are aliases that assign a name to another host, which is what I should use for this SharePoint resolution, but I'm actually cheating a little bit and using SharePoint as an A record that I've created to point to my web server. <coughs> Um, I've used this, most of the time I use this to test when I'm doing public domain work. If, if I've set up a new domain, I'm hosting a domain, someone else has a domain they're trying to test, they're moving from one host to another, they're hosting mail in one place and web in another, 
you can use NSLOOKUP to make sure that all those records are being resolved correctly to the right endpoints. Oh, no, not seal it. That's not going to work. Exit and clear screen again. So NSLOOKUP, great tool. Like I said, we could spend an hour on it. It's, it's tough for me not to. Net SH. Ta-da. There it is. We're back to a prompt. We are. Now, the problem with NetSH or NetShell, this is, it's just that it's a shell. We're basically in a little operating environment for doing multiple things against local and remote servers. This one is another, it's even worse than NSLOOKUP in terms of we could sit here for an hour and look through NetShell. We could sit here for a day on NetShell if we wanted to. So this is just a demonstration of what this is going to look like. Um, as, as Thomas mentioned earlier, one of the important things to know and I thought about something while you mentioned that that I'll talk about in just a second. Sitting in a NetShell prompt, it doesn't give you anything. If you don't know NetShell, you haven't used NetShell, you're new to NetShell, or even if you have used it but you want to do something new, how do you have any idea where to go? Question mark. There's your, there's your simple starting point. And the reason I go over this, the reason this rings in my head right now, is just last week, I'm going to exit NetShell, and just last week, I was watching a jump start, one of our jump starts, by two of our good PowerShell associates, Jeffrey Snover and Jason Helmick. And one of the things they said right at the beginning is, don't memorize this. Which is an IT pro, it hurts a little bit. You, you're used to memorizing port numbers and names and servers and buttons and checkboxes and interfaces and screens and wizards and how to do as much as you can so you don't necessarily have to look things up. You want to be fast and efficient. PowerShell's gigantic. NetShell, not as gigantic, but it's the same idea. It's a shell that you may not use all the time you don't have to memorize it. It's got the tools built into it to look up the things you need to look up on the fly. So there's your list of what you can do. You can do set, you can do trace. Um, all of these are different contexts and that's why this is complicated. If I go into the HTTP context, let's do that. I have a whole new list of commands. So the commands are context sensitive they are. depending on what context you're actually in. Absolutely. And I have new ones. So see, I've got advanced firewall, I've got firewall, I've got IPsec. Now we go into firewall. And I'm not even setting things yet. I'm just using this to go into different interfaces. And right here, I do like this. In future versions of Windows, Microsoft might remove this functionality. PowerShell is the new standard, but we're still showing you the tools that do exist. So it's I could go four, five, six layers deep and then start setting options using the set command. I'm not going to go that much into it. Next one, route. This is one that you just type it up. It's going to give you additional information. It needs something from you as a user or as an administrator to do something. And it gives you all of your options. Manipulates network routing tables. I don't like this description because it doesn't manipulate by default. If I do route print, or route P. It's not manipulating, it's just showing me what they are. We are gonna talk more about routing in, I believe, the next module. Uh, we have talked a little bit about it in the past. This is a network route table. This is something, in this case, that we don't manage by hand, although we can. And all this is is a way to tell this computer what networks it's connected to and how to get to other networks that it may be connected to. Um, you can do route add, route remove. I mean, there's, there's a whole list of route commands if you want to do route tables by hand. It's very similar to, we talked about earlier building Cat5 cables. Get the little wires and little crimpers and put the little ends on them. Fun the first time, never want to do it again. You know, route tables are not, not built for managing by hand. Well, and initially we used to have, uh, for DNS, before DNS really took off, we had host files. For NetBIOS, we had LM host files. So all these entries had to be made manually. And you're thinking, oh, well, that seems pretty overwhelming. Well, initially, there wasn't all the devices that are on the internet today. There were a lot fewer devices. These devices were more within a school, within a lab. So it was much easier to, within the lab environment, to control a host file that you put on clients that allowed clients or and servers to access the 20 plus hosts that were in the environment. The environments weren't that huge. As the environments became bigger, then they needed solutions 
for more dynamic arbitration of this information. That's where things like WINS, DHCP, that's where those kind of tools and utilities kind of cropped up to overcome these uh, static manual entry systems. And we'll learn, in, in a routing context, we'll learn more about that in, I believe, again, the next module, how we've applied those same principles to routing to be able to connect multiple networks and not have to manage necessarily which networks are connected to which in terms of updating route tables manually for all of the devices on them. Um, our last two, we've got net. This is another one that requires additional information. I just type net. It doesn't do anything for me. I need to look at something, manage something, create something. Uh, net use is a common one for anybody who's doing scripting or has done scripting, especially startup scripts via group policy. You can use net use to map network drives. Net use, let me see, what do I have available? I don't even know what I have. Server for shared. Done. Okay, now when you say map a network drive, uh, let's just ensure that we're all on the same page here. What, what do you mean by map a network drive? I see you have M colon there. What did you just do? So what I just did, I'll go to my start screen and open up my computer. I have created an additional, what appears to be an additional drive, M. And so, this is a drive that's connected, you can tell by the icon here, and the fact it says network location, this is connected to a share on another server. So now you have access to a remote resource as if it were local. Yep, So using drive. A, so using a local drive, M, you now have access to a remote device, and again, this is seamless to the user. Yep. And it's the same effect as right-clicking on computer and mapping network drive. Same idea. Uh, this just isn't scriptable. It's an interface. I have to go through and click buttons and next and finish. Whereas this, I can script. I can create a script that says just in it, net use m, back back server vert, back shared. I can put that script on a server, put it into group policy, and it's going to run on every computer in my enterprise every time it starts up or someone logs in. So you could map a user directory, shared folders. Yep. There are, there are worse and better ways to do that. I mean, there are a hundred different ways to do it these days. This is just an example of net, not necessarily an example of how you would map network drives for every user in an enterprise at this point. This was the way at one point, but now there are much more and better. Login scripts. There, there used to be login scripts yep. where you would have to create a script that when a user logged on, it would run a batch file type of environment that would set the environment. You would map drives, uh, you might set temp values, you might set system settings using this login script uh, as you, and then you might have it set by groups. So accounting got this environment, uh, management got this environment, production got this environment. Now we're into group policy, and that is, that is a pit we do not want to get mired in today. But look for more classes. There will be plenty of courses that cover group policy as well in great detail. Our last one, Telnet, which I just installed. This is another one that it's just a prompt. So it seems like we have, we have three options. We have a tool that you type it in, you hit enter, it says, I need more information, here are your options. We have a tool that you type it in, hit enter, and it actually does something. And then you have the scary ones, which are you type it in, you hit enter, and it just brings you to something with no information. Well, I don't know. It doesn't seem that scary. It said welcome. Welcome to it Microsoft does, Telnet Client. It does say I welcome. Mean, it does everything but wave at you and give you a hug. What that's more true. do you need here? I, I, that may be it. I mean, if, if that's all I need, I can just start this up and just stare at my desktop feeling good about <laughs> Feeling good feeling about Feeling good about day. the command line. Yep. Uh, Microsoft Telnet. So this is a way to connect to other servers via specific interfaces. Uh, I'm going to exit this out and come back into it the way I used to. Uh, usually do. Sorry, it's quit, not exit. Telnet. Now what I'm doing is I'm connecting to a server that in this case is an email server that I know via a different protocol, SMTP 25. I'm now talking to my mail server via Telnet. Could you create an e uh, email from Santa? I could. I could do that. I won't go through that right now. It's, we don't have the time to go into that much detail. But I could right here in two, three, four, five commands, email myself from Santa or email someone else from Santa as long as their server accepted that it was from Santa and didn't reject it based on that information. So yeah, Telnet is a nice tool. It, same idea. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of different things you can do with it, interfacing with other types of servers, troubleshooting different problems. Uh, same idea. And exit. 
And that's it for the advanced command line tools, I do believe. It is, actually. Sadly, we're at the summary already. Are we? We are. I mean, we've kind of blown through some stuff here. We've talked about the basic TCP IP utilities, uh, ping, IP config. Uh, we've talked about some more advanced utilities, path ping, um, trace route, NS lookup. Uh, and again, these are just utilities that allow you to verify or troubleshoot TCP IP connectivity. Uh, Christopher, I'll hand this to you for the additional resources and next step slide. Oh, that's right, we've got the cool slide. So this is next steps for this course. Once you've watched these modules, you think to yourself, what am I gonna do next? I feel like I've got a good start. I feel like I've got some good information. How do I, how do I apply it? What do I do next with it? One of the options is a book, exam 98-366 MTA Networking Fundamentals. It's a Microsoft official academic curriculum course that you can use to further study the topics we're covering in this course. There are instructor-led courses, again, four of them in different variations. Some of them are packs that come with, at a discount. There is, at the very bottom, Networking Fundamentals MTA Exam 98-366. If you want to take what you've learned here into a classroom where you'll get instruction from an instructor similar to what we're doing, plus peers who may be doing this in an, an enterprise environment or in any environment, plus potentially hands-on. I like teaching Network Fundamentals courses because we get to break things, we get to make some network cables, we get to cut some things, make some routers not work. And then at the end of any of this, or even at the end of this course, if you want to give it a go, there is the exam and certification 98-366 Networking Fundamentals for your Microsoft Technology Associate exam or certification. Now, we've talked, you've talked generically about the exams, the certification. Uh, why would I want to take an exam? Why would I want to get certified? What benefit do I receive as a networking professional or somebody who wants to get into the networking profession? Well, then you can go to parties with other networking professionals and show off how awesome you are compare transcripts. You can actually print them out, take them out, show them to your friends. Compelling. They'll, they'll love it. Compelling. Uh, the biggest reason is it's, it's proof of skills. Uh, potential employers, even potentially existing current employers, can see that you're demonstrating uh, adoption of new skills, application of skills, or the ability to apply those skills in potentially a future job. Well, and one thing that I typically tell people is um, people are familiar with the CPA for accounting. Mm -hmm. It's like a CPA for accounting. Uh, you, you have this title, you've passed, you studied, you passed a series of tests, you have a certification. Uh, the certifications that Microsoft have are similar but for networking. So you now have a networking certification that basically just says, hey, I have a certain level of skill. Or in servers, or in clients, or in exchange, or in any one of a hundred other things. We have, a, we have a pretty extensive cert program. So I think that's it um, for this module. We're, it's the end slide already. Awesome. It, uh, it's a little sad. I say already, it's, not... it's been almost an hour. I'm watching the... Uh... I, I don't know. Like I said, we get to this end slide. I'm a little torn. I'm, I'm happy we've got through the information, but this is, this is our time. We're, we're done at this point with it this just, module. It just means they got to start the next one. Okay. Of course, so, it means, of course, it means we have to start the next one, too. That's true. That's true. So we're looking forward to seeing you at the next module or possibly at a certification class or taking a test. Yeah. Come see us. Welcome or welcome back to 98366 MTA Networking Fundamentals. I am Thomas Willingham and I'm here with Christopher Chapman. Hi again. We're here to talk about network services or roles and services that you may see on the network. Let us dive right in. So our objectives, setting up common network services, we'll talk about what those are, defining more network services. So we've, we'll talk about common network services and then amazingly enough, we will talk about more. Then we'll also talk about defining name resolution techniques. So let's dive right into the exciting stuff we have on hand. The first one is dynamic host configuration protocol. In the last module, Christopher and I were talking about the fact that initially there were host files or LM host files that allowed for names and IP addresses to be associated to different systems. That is not this topic. That would be DNS. This is DHCP. Oh, there you go. So 
That is a good one, though. DNS is important, but we're not there yet. We're it's at on, DHCP. It's on the slide. No, it's DHCP. It's, it's in, but it said DHCP. Oh, it did say, okay, you're right. It did say DNS, but that's not quite what we're at yet. We're at DHCP. Dynamic host configuration protocol. So let's go back to, we were talking about manual entries, static entries. So initially, uh, computers or devices had to have static entries for their IP configuration, their IP address, their DNS information, their gateway, all of this information had to be added uh, statically and configured manually on the system. DHCP allows for automatic configuration, not just automatic, automatic. but there's magic in there. So it's a client server protocol that enables configured client computers to obtain IP addresses automatically. Not just any device can get a DHCP address, it needs to be configured to receive DHCP. The information that it can receive is an IP address, a subnet mask, and if we remember from the TCP IP section, the IP address uniquely identifies a system on the network. The subnet mask defines what the network address is versus what the host address is. We also have the gateway address. The gateway address it allows or enables if the address I'm trying to reach is not on the network I'm on, what do I do with that packet? Well, that gets sent to the gateway address. The D DNS server address, which again res resolves the IP address to name. Uh, DHCP server provides the following benefits, reliable IP address configuration and reduced network configuration or administration. Previously, Christopher has discussed being in an environment where he had to manually assign IP addresses. To 200 some odd clients. How'd that work out? Well, I was a consultant, so great for somebody. Because you were paid hourly, exactly. and there were some hours involved. Every time they put a new computer on the network, we spent two minutes, grab the sheet of paper that kept all the, that we had all the IPs on, drive to the office, find the computer, put an IP on the computer, go back to the office, Send him a bill. It's a pretty decent consulting gig, actually, in terms of you know, effort for dollar. But uh, not great for the customer. And not great for us if there was actually a conflict. It, the list we had was one list on paper. It wasn't electronic. It was updated by multiple people. It had been in use for multiple years. So the risk of having devices with the same IP, the risk of having IPs that were in use that weren't documented as in use, or vice versa, we start thinking we're out of IPs when we actually have 30 or 40 free ones because we're not documenting devices no longer in use. It's a nightmare. So DHCP really addressed some of these issues and allowed for this to be much easier to manage. Yeah, and we were able to finally, after a bit about a year of weekly consulting spends by this company, able to convince them to spend the hundred some odd dollars they spent on a small piece of software that actually ran on a client to manage DHCP for the network. Great. So the DHCP server. So before a DHCP server can start leasing IP addresses to client computers, that's what the system is called, is when a client computer uh, receives an IP address from a server, it leases an address. Yep. Uh, the following steps must be performed. Well, so first of all, you need to install the DHCP role service. You need to configure an IP scope, so a range of addresses that the server will host. Once you configure the scope, you need to activate it. So you basically need to click that button that says, hey, let's go ahead and allow these addresses to be leased out. You need to authorize the server. Uh, basically in your environment, say, hey, this is a valid DHCP server. Uh, for test purposes, I'm sure that uh, people have brought up a DHCP server in their office to test. I want to test something. And they bring up a DHCP server, and Christopher, what do you end up with? Oh, this is actually pertinent to everybody watching this video because as you're watching this, if you're sitting at your desk thinking, I'm going to do what they're doing while they're doing it. Let's just go along and go ahead and get this installed and configured. What you end up doing is creating what's called a rogue DHCP server. Rogue! A rogue, it's indeed, rogue. exactly. You, you're going to create a server that starts handing IP addresses out to your network that may not be IPs in the network 
as it's configured, you may cause network disruption issues, you may cause internet disconnectivity or even uh, other remote networks to be disconnected from those clients or servers that say have reservations. I mean, there's, it's a huge risk. I'm gonna do some demos today with DHCP. Luckily, the activation and authorization components of DHCP now protect us from lighting up a DHCP server that is instantly uh, sending out IP addresses. So you won't have the, the issues you had 10 years ago, but it's still a risk. So make sure if you're testing DHCP, do it on an isolated machine. We don't wanna, we don't wanna mess up any networks. Rogue! Yeah. Bad. And, and the fun part, the, the flip side of this for the people watching this video, once you get that, that next level help desk troubleshooting support network administration job, and you're thinking, this is gonna be fun, and somebody calls you one day and says, my computer doesn't get on the internet anymore, and you determine it's because it's got a DHCP address that's not on your network, now you get to figure out how, on a network of anywhere from 200 to 5,000 computers, which one has DHCP installed on it. Okay, how many emails have you received that said, please let me know who set up the rogue DHCP server that's handing out addresses? I'd have to say I've received two or three of those. Yeah, I think, I think I've seen a couple of those. I've been much more the person running through trying to find it. Like my computer, you know, three or four people, and it happens over time, you'll get one person calling. Uh, this happened in my consulting role at this company as we put the DHCP server in and we kind of had that transition phase. One person will say, my computer doesn't get on the internet anymore. Okay, easy enough, we'll go troubleshoot. Notice the IP is different. While you're there working on that one, a second person will call. My computer doesn't get on the internet anymore. Half an hour later, hour later, someone else will call. My computer doesn't get on the internet anymore. So you spend this time trying to track down the server as more and more computers are getting IPs from it and falling off the network. So I've had a fair number of those calls. Well, and that goes back to the lease. So your lease is of a certain amount of time. Yep. Uh, and then when your lease is up, you go back through the DHCP discovery process. Well, it's a, it's a configurable amount of time. So the default is eight days, which is a good amount of time. And if you put up a rogue DHCP server, it, there are a number of factors that figure in. If you've brought up a DHC, DHCP server today, and all of your clients got a lease today, they're all gonna renew at the same time. Now, a little technical fact about DHCP in Windows, they actually renew halfway through the lease. So if you've got an eight day lease on day four, they're gonna renew that IP lease. And that happens regardless, if you set it to a day, halfway through a day, they're gonna renew that lease. So you hopefully avoid issues where, say they run out, even on a legitimate network with DHCP configured correctly, you don't have clients not getting DHCP addresses because something's gone wrong. They've renewed quickly enough and rapidly enough that they at least have a period of time to operate without a DHCP server if one's gone down. And then it talks about configuring advanced IP options such as setting up a DNS server, default gateways, things of that nature. Yep. Um, demo, oh. Christopher. Oh, it's my Seth, turn. It's your turn. So we're gonna run through those steps. Uh, we're gonna start with installing the service. I've again got my demo environment up. We're gonna go ahead and add roles and features. Okay, actually, really quick, can we go back to the server manager? We can. Uh, this is the 2012 server manager dashboard. Yep. So those of you not familiar with Windows Server 2012, this is the new dashboard that you'll see. Uh, great taste, less filling. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, I personally have done some work on this server manager, the remote desktop management services component. I helped Over create. Over here under, uh, is it somewhere, which one am I looking at? Where's your, where's your piece? You, haven't, you have to install remote desktop services first. But Why is that? I would think you'd have that done by default. Once you, well, you know, we, <laughs> we want to ensure that people know what they're doing when they install it so they can look at it and go, wow, this is really good, as opposed to just stumbling on it. Well, and as opposed to just installing everything by default so that your server's slow right out of the box. Exactly. Every exactly. service known to man running right off the, out of the gate. So okay. we, are, we are going to jump into this from the standpoint of this is a relatively new server that I've put up that I haven't, I don't believe, I need to verify this, I haven't installed a lot on here. I've started installing some prerequisites for what this server will eventually be. But for now, there's not a whole lot on it. It's, it's a different wizard. If you're used to server 2003, 2008, 2008 R2, this is dramatically different. So I encourage you spend some time, get used to server manager, set up a test box, click the buttons, push the, the buttons and options and check boxes and see what happens. Select a server and in here we've got our first setup which is roles. There's a DHCP server role. I get a box right away that says there are 
features that are also required for this role to function, in this case, the remote server administration tools for DHCP, which I'm just going to add. Next, this does not take long at all. I'm not going to install any separate features and install. Now, one of the nice things about Server 2012, on a kind of a side note, this is going to run, and as you note down here at the bottom, you can close this wizard without interrupting running tasks. I can close this, and it's still doing what it's doing. I can go do something else. I can actually rerun the roles and features wizard. In 2008, 2008 R2, I would have to wait. I'd have to sit there and wait for that window to get done. So it shouldn't take too long. It will actually notify me as soon as it's finished. I have up here notifications, feature installation, and this one is running. It gives me real-time status. And then one thing to note on these is some role services that you install are going to require a reboot. Yes. DHCP does not, I don't believe. I'm going to say does. it does not. I don't think it does. It's weird. I've done this a thousand times, and my brain is still like, uh, are you really maybe, sure? Maybe, maybe not. I don't think DHCP requires a restart. So we'll wait for this to get installed, and then we'll move on to the next step, which is... Actually, I think this might... What's the demo on this one? Uh, install and view oh, the install DHCP and view. service. So we do have to wait, because I know that in a subsequent demo, we're actually going to configure a scope and, and look at the activate and authorize options. We're not going to authorize this one because I don't want to mess up my test network, but... That's the saving grace. I can do this confidently without worrying about setting up a rogue DHCP server. But rogue! Don't, but don't try this in your enterprise without a separate network. Look at me talk. Oh, it won't take long. This is going to be fast. And we wait. I hmm. wonder if we have Jeopardy music that we can install. That would that be we terrific. Can overlay here. Well, in the meantime, what I can do as a, as a refresh to one of our previous conversations... I'm going to pull this up. Let me configure it real quick so you can actually read it on these screens. And 24. Click OK. And we're going to look at IP config. Oh, no, you know what? I, let me come back to what I was doing. I'm going to go to a different computer and do this on a different computer that has a DHCP assigned address, I believe. Yes, DHCP enabled. Now, a couple of interesting things to note about this screen. It is enabled. It has an IP4 address. Notice it says preferred. What does that preferred mean? Do we know? People like it better. <laughs> People like 10.0.0.39 better than all of the rest of the 10.0.0.0 well, yeah, addresses. Well, yeah, it says right there, preferred. Um, in this case, for my particular setup, I... I have this computer set up so that I can get to it from outside through various different protocols. Um, I have a reservation. For dinner? In DHCP. Oh. So when we get into DHCP, we'll look at what that means, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. For now, this is the address assigned by DHCP. I can see that DHCP, DHCP is enabled. And at some point, oh, it's not on this interface. That's what, uh, that's what you get. Is okay, that... real quick before you go. Notice auto configuration enabled by default, yes. Yes. A PIPA. A PIPA, indeed. We learned about that in a previous module. And we're, we're going to talk about it a little bit more here in just a bit. We are. We're actually going to talk about how to turn that off and why it may not be a good idea for your network. Okay. As it relates to DHCP, in fact. Uh, what you can see as well, lease obtained and lease expires. So July 20th, it was obtained. August 18th, it expires. Again, it's going to renew at certain points in that, throughout that lease. But this is a good way to see, uh, it's a good way to, to put pieces together if you're troubleshooting a rogue DHCP server, or even troubleshooting an issue with an existing DHCP server that's come down and is no longer servicing, servicing addresses. You can use the obtained and expires to figure out what's happened. Uh, use a computer that is no longer getting DHCP information that's probably been taken off the network that you'll see in a PIPA address on. It will have stopped getting your network. It will have assigned itself in a PIPA address. You can then go to another computer that stay, say still might have network connectivity or internet connectivity, do an IP config all, and you'll notice the, the lease hasn't expired yet. So it's still using an IP that it got from DHCP, but hasn't had to try and renew it. Let's go back to here. Close that because it's not what we need. Feature installation has succeeded. I can now manage DHCP on this server. So here we go, DHCP is installed. 
It's on this server. I have both IP4 and IP6 scope options. Server options we talked about, you can set gateways, you can set DNS, you can set up multiple different options. We're not gonna go to this yet. We're gonna configure this in a little while when we set up a scope, but you've now seen how to install it and what the management console looks like by default. Okay, so now let's talk about the process for leasing for that lease. Yep. So we've talked about a lease, a client uh, getting information from a DHCP server. So let's talk about that process. And that process is Dora. Isn't that that little fish from Nemo? It, Dora? it is a fish in a movie. Okay, but and that's then... not what we're talking about. That's not the Dora we're talking about here. I, I wish, now that I think about it, I wish I'd built a slide with some sort of tie into that. That actually would have been funny. The, the Nemo, yeah. So DHCP sessions use a four-step process known as DORA, discovery, offer, request, and acknowledgement. Uh, so if we look at the fancy graphic that we have here, so we see a client. Now this represents a client coming online. Yep. So it's, it's booting up, uh, it's, it's been turned off, uh, and at this point, it may or may not have an existing address. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the first thing that happens is it basically says, hey, Ali Ali Oxen free, are there any DHCP servers out there that can hand me an address? So that's the DHCP discover packet that gets sent out. And it's a broadcast. So that goes out to every computer on the network within what's called the broadcast boundary. Typically not routable. And not routable at all. So a server on the same subnet would say, hey, I'm a DHCP server. Here's an IP address for you. Now, it's possible that this client may receive multiple addresses back from multiple DHCP servers. Absolutely. So that's the DHCP offer. The client then selects an address and says, thanks, I would like to use that uh, DHCP address. And then finally, DHCP Pack, hey, pleasure doing business with you. I acknowledge that you are using that address. And uh, another note, the request, again, is a broadcast to let the rest of the network know I've chosen a server and an IP. That's what we're going with. Uh, the acknowledge, the server's actually going to resend the same information again as well. It's going to say, great, we're glad you've taken what we want. We're going to make sure you have the right information. And I would just like to call out that um, the people, the men behind the curtain, have informed me that the fish was called Dory from Finding Nemo. Oh. Dora oh. is the Spanish girl explorer. Well, now you can see, th this is actually a good gauge of, you can see how much time we get to do things outside of what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. we, don't, we don't get out much, so we at least have that excuse, I think. Demo, I think it's demo time. Oh, is it demo time? Add a DHCP All right, scope. we're going to the scope. So I'm already on the interface. I've still got the same console up I had it before. We are going to, so a couple things to notice. Notice the little red arrows, these little red down arrows. I wish I had zoom it on here that I could zoom in and take a look. These are currently not serving requests. There aren't any scopes, but even if there were, and we're gonna go ahead and create a new scope, we'll show you what that changes, if it changes anything. Uh, main office, you can give this any, any name you want. It's not function impacting. Give it a start IP address and an end IP address. Now, this is where a lot of, I, I mean, I hate to say personal preferences, but it will depend on how you set up your network, how you want to set up your network. Some people will start their IP addresses just in the range of IPs they want to assign. And what I mean is if you've got 200 clients on this network, you're not going to start at one and you've got 10 servers for those 200 clients. You may not start at one, you might start at 11 and then assign one through 10 to your servers. I create the whole range, 1 through 254, and then I create an exclusion. And what this says is the server can't assign these addresses. So it won't send these out to clients. I know what my entire range is. I know which one's servers are. And then we'll talk about another one in just a minute that's another little in between those two. And to address something that you just brought up, typically clients will receive a DHCP address, servers more frequently get a static IP address. Yep, I'm gonna assign it by hand on that box and not let it get something from DHCP. 
There is another option we're going to look at that may change that a little bit. So the lease duration, again, you can set this. The default is eight days. It is configurable in a broad range. It's going to be largely up to your network design and your network requirements. Options, I can set those additional options we talked about. Yes, I want to configure them now. This is where I'll set up a router. And in this case, I'll do 254. That's how I do it. So that's the, the address that all of my clients are going to get as a gateway out to the internet or other networks. Uh, domain name and DNS servers. This one's nice. It gives me a parent domain. It says to configure scope, enter the IP addresses for those servers. I already have IP addresses. Where did it get these from? Magic. Ma yes, magic. Microsoft builds lots of magic into their software. So things just happen automatically. We don't really know why. Uh, these came from my network adapter on this server. I've assigned DNS addresses, so it's pulling from there. I could take these out. I can use this to resolve the IP addresses of what might be my DHCP servers. If I don't know those IPs, this is kind of a handy tool that gives you a bunch of different options. I'm going to leave this as is for now. Win servers, I, we're going to skip right past that one because we don't use wins. I don't anyways. Yes, I want to activate this scope now. Okay, done. So I've now activated the scope. It is ready for clients to use. Notice I still have this red arrow on my IP4 on this server though. I have not authorized this server to start issuing IP addresses on my network. And it gives you this information right here on the main screen. Must be authorized in Active Directory before it can assign IP addresses. This again is to protect your network from rogue DHCP servers. Authorization is a security precaution that ensures that only authorized servers run on your network. So I'm not gonna do that because that will mess up my home network, but that's creating a scope. I now have a pool. I have leases. Now, in this case, I've actually made a mistake because I assigned in my scope options a router of 254 and did not exclude it from my scope. So I could potentially, in this configuration, create a conflict and lose some sort of network connectivity at some point, potentially for my entire network. Uh, address leases, this is where, as your computers take on leases, they'll show up. I don't have any issued yet. This is what I talked about, the happy medium, a reservation. This is where, within the scope, you'll see it says IP address 1921681. It's using the subnet mask I attached to this DHCP scope. I can tell my DHCP server to give a certain device with a certain MAC address, a certain physical address. Remember, those are unique globally, in theory, and they don't change. They're assigned to the hardware of every network interface device. So if it's a printer that's plugged into the network, it has a MAC address. I can get that MAC address. I can assign that MAC address or put that MAC address in right here. And what will happen is anytime that printer comes online, it does the same thing a computer does. Are there any DHCP servers out here that are ready to give me an IP address? My DHCP servers are going to go, I have that MAC address. This is the address you have to have. And it's going to issue that same IP every time. And the nice thing about this is you can use your DHCP server to centrally administrate all of your IP addresses. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a static IP address, uh, a dynamic IP address, uh, static I IP addresses for specific devices, like you said, printers, servers, maybe routers or anything, you can manage all of this within the DHCP service. Yep. I use this for printers. I, it's on the networks I was managing years ago when they were smaller networks, I would use this to manage network printers because it was an easy way to maintain a list of network printers. Uh, supported both types, DHCP and VoopP. We're not gonna go into these details in this course. Uh, this has to do with the routing of DHCP request and response traffic across routers. By default, DHCP traffic is non-routable. So I can't get a DHCP address from a computer to another subnet that's connected to my network. Uh, I'll add a reservation, why not? Close that, there we go. Scope options, again, we saw router and DNS. And then policies we're not gonna cover. Server options are the same as scope options in terms of what they cover. So you see 003 router, 006 DNS. I can set that here as well, router. DNS. The difference is server options are going to apply to every scope. If I don't set those options at the scope level, they're going to apply. If I set them at the scope level, they're going to be overridden. So, Which brings up a good point. You can set up more than one scope. Absolutely. I can set up as many scopes as I want to. 
and they don't have to be anywhere in the same realm in terms of this. They can be different subnets, they can be different subnet masks, they can be completely separate. In this case, we're going to exclude the first 100. Let's make this one day. Let's say this is a secure network that we need more rapid DHCP response times. I'm not going to worry about these options for time's sake, but I now have two scopes on my server. And in this case, this one, no red arrow, because it's been activated. This one, I have to activate. So that's scopes. I think that's pretty much all I have. We have IP6 as well. You'll notice there aren't... I'm not going to go into IP6. It's a separate conversation and a much more broad conversation about network technologies and the use of DHCP in the first place. So this one's just for four. And that's it. We've created some scopes. Very nice. A peepa. So we talked in a previous module, uh, I believe it was TCP IP, about a peepa is the protocol that allows for automatic private IP addressing. So as a device comes up, if it's unable to receive an IP address, it can automatically get an assignment. This works for small office, home office, uh, so basically Soho networks, without deploying the DHCP service. A PIPA can get in the way of clients obtaining IP addresses from overloaded DHCP servers. That actually, there's, there's kind of a side note to that in that if you've got clients on your network getting a PIPA addresses but you've got DHCP in place, it's not that a PIPA is in the way, even though that's how we've worded it, it's that your DHCP servers are overloaded. So that's actually a good indicator of a different kind of problem. It's not that your DHCP server is down, it's that your DHCP server has too many requests to handle. It may be time to add a scope, add a server. I, there may be multiple ways you can troubleshoot. But just in case, to prevent the assignment of a PIP addresses on your clients, if the DHCP servers are unavailable or overloaded, you can disable it in the registry. Uh, we put this slide in here. I can do a little demo real quick. That was my original intent. Um, but it was more just for warning's sake. We, haven't, we don't put the normal, I usually put a big red warning on any slide that says registry. Given that this is a network fundamentals class, you may also be new to the registry. Be very, very careful in the registry. You can do irreparable damage in the registry, and I have done so on a couple of occasions, always in a test environment, never in production. Well, and the registry, if you damage the registry, you can keep your computer from booting up, you can uh, damage services, and keep, you could basically disable networking yep. and no longer have networking working. Uh, there, there's all kinds of damage that yep. you can do within the registry. But it's a fun slide. It gives you an idea. You can see what the registry looks like. You can um, kind of get your first, if, again, if you're in a test environment, you can play with what the registry looks like, how it works, go in and change that setting so that you can turn off a PIPA and you can test it. Well, and so we've talked about classroom environment. The nice thing about uh, the classroom environment is you might actually have the opportunity to play with this. Absolutely. So you could go in and I don't remember what class it was. Maybe it was a Windows client class where you would go in and uh, manage a registry entry, bring the client back up and, oh, all of a sudden networking doesn't work. Go back in, change it back. Now networking does work. So it really showed you the impact of what would happen if you basically didn't work with the registry correctly. Yep. You, do some, you, you can do some good damage with the registry. Yes. Yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot at about the head. That's true. Yeah. Not optimal. Okay, remote desktop services. Yeah. I, feel like, I feel like maybe this topic, you, you have some... Some good insights, some good information on this one. Remote desktop services, near and dear to my heart. I, I, I have to say, I, I kind of enjoy me a cup of remote desktop services. It's been a few modules since your intro. Maybe you want to talk about why that is. Why is it so near and dear to your heart? The reason remote desktop services is near and dear to my heart is because that's the role service I've been working with for the last five years. Nice. So, remote desktop services, formerly known as terminal services. So, in 2008 R2... Uh, terminal services was renamed to remote desktop services to basically show 
or illustrate all the additional functionality the remote desktop services had. Terminal services no longer encompassed all the goodness that was now part of remote desktop services. And I don't think they wanted to just rename it terminal services extra goodness. Didn't quite work, so they renamed it remote desktop <laughs> services. They should have. They should have gone Terminal services, extra, extra goodness. goodness. Uh, so basically, so I've, I've talked about the name a bit, but I haven't really talked about what it does. Remote desktop services, its functionality is from one computer, you can basically remote into another computer, and you've seen Chris Christopher do some of this, uh, and take control of it as if it were local. So now a remote system appears to be local to you. Remote desktop services has, I wouldn't say different components, but there's multiple aspects of it. One is a session-based system, and that's remoting into a server. So the server having the ability to manage remote sessions, each user has their own session. The issue with this is all clients are working in a remote server environment, so it's a server environment. So you may come across compatibility issues. All applications may not work effectively in the client or the server environment. So there's also virtual desktops. Virtual desktops is new since R2, 2008 R2, and basically what virtual desktop enables is the ability to remote into a client that's a client operating system. So now a user has access to all the full capabilities of a remote client. If you look at the uh, slide here, you'll see the remote desktop services architecture. This is a poster specific to 2008 R2. It's an awesome poster. Uh, let me, I want to show you something here. Doop, doop, doop. Okay, so let's go to the desktop really quick. And on the desktop, I want to come to a program that I've installed. This is Server Posterpedia. Um, oh, 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 I have just been informed that the... Let's see, I need to duplicate my screen. I didn't have the screen duplicated. Okay, there we go, score. I have the uh, success um, signs from the back. The back of the room's going crazy. Uh, so now you can see Server Posterpedia. This is the default view here. What is Server Posterpedia? That's a good question. Server Posterpedia are posters of all the different systems that posters have been created for. Uh, it is a Windows 8 utility, so if you go into the Windows 8 store, you can download Server Posterpedia. And why I'm bringing this up is let's go into Remote Desktop Services here. Well, here's Remote Desktop Services, but there's also Hyper-V, uh, 2012, 2008 R2 with SP1, uh, features and technologies for Windows Server, Active Directory. So there's a lot of different technologies that are represented here. Let's go into remote desktop architecture here. Let me blow this up a little bit. Oh, not what I wanted to do. Uh, let's blow this up here. And basically what we have here is this middle uh, chunk here overviews the architecture for remote desktop services. The rest of the components here, let me zoom out a little bit, hopefully not getting too dizzy here. Uh, these other tiles show you the different components of remote desktop services. Remote desktop services is made up of, uh, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, of about six or seven different roles and features that come together are installed that allow for this functionality. So I just wanted to show you this poster, show you this utility that really demonstrates uh, architecture and is a great resource for learning about these different tools. So let's go ahead and go back to the slide deck here. Where's the deck? Is that? Okay, so that's it's in the there deck. Somewhere. Keep looking for it. And let we'll me... 
go back to extend. So hopefully now we are. No. No. Okay. I'm getting the no. It is not, we are experiencing a slight bit of technical oh, difficulty. There we go, I think we're good. Oh, we are, except now, let's see here. Um, I don't have my, okay, this, this is awesome. Uh, we have, where Go back to this? extend, I think you're in duplicate. Show presenter view. It takes a second. Okay. There you go. Okay, we have success. We're all Ta -da. good. Huzzah. Okay, so showed you the remote desktop services architecture. I showed you the poster. Server Posterpedia, if you haven't downloaded it from the Windows 8 store, you can. You can also download, if you're not on Windows 8, you can download those posters individually as PDFs from the download center. So for some bonus information, who authored that RDS poster? Excellent question, Christopher. Uh, who, let me see, who oh, authored indeed. that poster? Oh, that's right. I helped author that poster. Uh -huh. Martin McLean, poster guy, Brian Litch, uh, additional um, RDS technical writer at that point, and myself, we all wrote that poster. So download the poster. We don't get paid for it. And again, a big hug of knowledge for you. That's it's, right. They're free. They're free, and they look really cool hanging on your wall. They do. I'm actually a huge fan of the component posters. Uh, the component posters, huge geek cred. Absolutely. Huge geek cred. Okay, so now let's go to remote desktop connection. I have multiple remote desktop connection here. You're probably familiar, if you're familiar with remote desktop connection, with the upper right here, the remote desktop connection tool. Uh, from the command line, you can run MSTSC, uh, Microsoft Terminal Services Connection. So this is the old style. If you look at on the left, that's the new modern client with Windows 8. So you can download that. It's remote desktop from Microsoft. It shows here that there's a remote desktop and then RD Web Services. So RD Web Services is the ability to go to a website, a... Um, Administrator populates that URL, and when the user goes to the URL and logs on, they just get access to all of that service. So all of those applications, any of the populated desktops, the user will gain access to it. Uh, did you actually want to show a demo of this? I or? did. So uh, the reason I put demo on that slide, I added demo to that slide kind of last minute, so poor Thomas was unaware of my changes. Uh, I wanted to show what those two interfaces look like. I use... The MSTSC interface quite a lot. It looks like this. Uh, if we see my desktop, this is this is the old one. If you do start run or you do command line or you do something MSTSC, Microsoft uh, was it Microsoft Terminal Services Client? Client, yeah. Was the original the original initialism? This is what that looked like. You could put in an IP, put in a port, put in a username, change a lot of different information. I will give you a little bonus here to to some RDP, local resources, more drives. You can make local hard drives available externally. In your remote session. Potentially a giant security hole that your IT administrators may not know about. Correct, but we could use group policy to crank that down. Absolutely. So that's the old one, and then I wanted to do the demo of the new one. I actually want to grab it real quick. So remote Chris, desktop. Yes, so Christopher's showing you going up to the store, having to download it. Oh, you are denied. Demo thwarted too many PCs in the live account. That's right. We'll skip this demo for now. It, but you've seen it. Go to the store, type in remote desktop. You get the same interface that he just showed you. This is what it looks like. This is the new and prettier one. It's very nice. It's also more functional. You can actually keep track of connections over time, whereas with the last one, all you see in that box is the last one you opened when you open up Terminal Services Client. Okay, so notice from the screen here, you see... Uh, desktops and graphics, as you exit the uh, connection, it basically snapshots it and shows you what the last snapshot looks like. So it gives you a little bit additional information for that desktop. Shows you where you left off? Yes. Terrific. Yes. That's all I had. 
Okay, Routing and Remote Access Service, or RRAS. This supports uh, remote user or site-to-site -site connectivity using virtual private networks, VPNs, or dial-up network connections. Dial-up. Remember when you actually had to pick up the phone, you got a dial tone? That would be what that's referencing. Wow. What was that? Yeah, dial a phone. Remember Phones. when you used to have to pick it up and dial the phone? Weird. Okay, RRAS consists of the following components. Remote access, so allowing the ability to access a remote system. And routing, so basically the ability to, from a local network, to connect to a remote network. Turns a Windows server into a router. Correct, correct. And this was formerly known as the Remote Access Server, or RAS. Yep, RAS is a, is a well-known uh, acronym that's still, it's still used pretty readily. People still call it RAS, even though it's Routing Remote Access Service. Uh, routing and remote access service. Again, another excellent graphic. Thank you, Christopher. Let, let's see what, what we have here. We have the client. We have a remote device, the internet ISP, another, so routers. We have routers on each side, mm -hmm. the internet ISP, and then the server basically connecting. Yep, so it allows us to connect a client to a server or a network over the internet. Uh, this is the, the remote access portion of this particular technology, allowing us to let clients into a network from outside over the internet without having to build our own infrastructure. Thank you, internet, for providing that connectivity. Thank you. Demo time. Demo time, indeed. So let me get this running again. And we will jump right back into the same environment. My 75 character password. One of these days I need to change that. So we're right back to the same server we looked at before where I had DHCP up and running. We'll go ahead and close this. I am again gonna add roles and features. We're still on server manager. Next. Next, it's role-based, same server. And right here, so we don't, we see remote access. And we see all this, this one's much more than DHCP just wanted us to install a console. This one wants us to install all sorts of additional features. Web server, internal database, group policy management. We're going to go ahead and add those features. And the nice thing that any supportive services that need to be installed get called out. So you don't have, you're not of the idea of, oh, I didn't know what was installed. You can actually look on that and see, oh, IIS is installed. So mm -hmm. you have an idea of what additional information will get installed. Yep. Features. We have, again, a list of features that we can still install. We're not going to worry about this right now. Next. It does show us, let me go back to that. It does show us what was selected when that box popped up that said additional role features required. It shows us in here what it added. Group policy management obviously was one of those. Windows internal database was one of those. We can add our own if we want. Remote access, role services. So right here, this is where it gets a little confusing because it's called routing remote access service. In Windows Server Manager, you're only going to see remote access. It's when you get to this level the role services that you'll see routing as an option. So I want RAS, remote access, and I want routing so that we can see both. I'm not gonna worry about IIS, it's installing its bare minimum, which is all I need, and install. It says again, restart destination server if required. You can tell server manager to do your restarts automatically. I don't wanna do that. Now here, I already have this little yellow exclamation mark, what we call a bang. Post-deployment configuration. This is actually from the prior one, configuration required for DHCP. You'll see this from time to time after you've installed a feature or a role, if the server does want you to do something to that role or feature to get it working. Uh, we'll probably see one right here after we install routing and road access as well. Well, we didn't, in the previous demo, you didn't authorize the scope. I didn't. So it's, it's letting you know that, hey, there are still actions that need to be performed for this to work effectively. Yep. And for now, that's all we're going to do is install it. So now that we've done that, we'll move on and we'll come back to another demo in a little while. Okay. So we talked about routing and remote access. Now we'll talk about Internet Protocol Security, IPsec. So IPsec is a protocol within the TCP IP suite that encrypts and authenticates IP packets. This allows private or secure communication to 
occur over an IP network. Typically traffic that goes over an IP network. So in previous modules, we've talked about the postcard analogy. Uh, filling out a postcard that had a data payload in it. Uh, Dear Christopher, I'm at the beach. I'm having a great time. Thomas. Uh, I put an address in there and all of that, when I put that in the mail, anybody who sees that postcard can pick it up and read it. It's called plain text. And typical internet IP frames are clear text and mm -hmm. can basically be read by what you would call a network sniffer. Yep. So a network sniffer or analyzer could pull these packets out and basically recreate a session. Potentially. Potentially. It's a big, it's a big network security risk, actually, that a lot, of, uh, a lot of organizations have to fight against. Yes. Man in the middle. Hence IPsec. Yes. So IPsec uh, allows for securing application traffic, resides on the network layer, used in conjunction with VPNs, integral part of IPv6, and there's actually two different modes for it, tunnel mode and transport mode. Tunnel mode is used for creating virtual private networks. So creating a virtual private network between a client and a destination. So you basically create your tunnel, which we're gonna talk about later. You're gonna create this tunnel that uh, enables communication. There's also transport method, and this is for encrypting the data itself on private networks. If you look at the uh, graphic here, the IPsec protocol types, uh, you see the protocol, there's authentication header, encapsulating security payload, or both. Authentication header, uh, basically, if you need to be protected from modification and authentication, but you're not worried if the packet is readable. So now you're just ensuring that the packet isn't somehow modified. So a router that gets a hold of this, that basically takes it from network, one network and puts it on another, isn't injecting information in this. Or a person. Or a person, exactly. So when the receiver receives this, they take a look at it and say, oh, okay, is this the packet that was actually sent? Is this the same? Uh, that's authentication header. Encapsulating security payload. Well, now the data needs to be protected by encryption, so it's unreadable, but the IP address can be left unprotected. And then both AH and ESP allows for both to be used simultaneously. DNS. We, we've talked a bit about DNS, domain name system, worldwide service that resolves a host name to an IP address. Uh, the DNS architecture is a hierarchical, love that word, hierarchical distributed database and associated set of protocols. This associated set of protocols allows for a method of querying and updating the database. So as a client, www.microsoft.com, what's my IP address? A mechanism for replicating the information in the database among servers. So I'm a DNS server, I have this information uh, Christopher, you're a DNS server. I can give this information to you to do a couple things. One, build fault tolerance. Two, offload all requests coming to me. Now some requests are coming to you. Yep, potentially. And then it also defines a schema. A schema basically says, hey, what objects and properties are associated with the database? It's application layer, the TCP IP reference model, and use port 53 to accept name resolution requests. Yeah, we talked about ports. Mm -hmm. So, and this one's important in that if you're hosting your own services, hosting your own domains, you may have DNS servers running. You'll have to allow 53 inbound for external requests to get to those DNS servers, if that's how you've got it set up. Okay. So DNS enables host name to IP address. WINS allows for net BIOS name to IP address. We talked a little bit about net BIOS already. It was implemented using, or Microsoft used the NetBuoy protocol initially as the default to allow computers to intercommunicate. Yep. Uh, NetBIOS was the naming scheme. I think they were limited to, what was it, 15 characters? Yep, still, uh, still to, the, to this day. 15 characters name. So WINS systems are DNS-like 
in that DNS does hostname to IP resolution, WINS does net BIOS name to IP address resolution. So it's similar to DNS and then it's doing named to, name to IP. Correct. Uh, where DNS, the precursor to DNS was hosts files. So basically you just set up a file and create a host name and an IP address so your client could look into this host name file and arbitrated it itself. DNS automated that. Uh, for Wins, it was LM hosts mm -hmm. files. How do we get to the summary already? We're at the summary. Uh, we've talked about being able to install and configure DHCP. We've learned about Dora, the explorer, not the fish. <laughs> not the fish. Not the fish. Uh, we've talked about installing and configuring remote desktop services and that really cool poster that you should go get now, Server Posterpedia, yeah. and downloading the individual posters. We've talked about routing and remote access, uh, how to use IPsec in your environment, the various protocols that can be used. And we've talked about DNS and WINS. And in most environments today, you're not going to use WINS. Nope, you're DNS gonna only. Use, you're going to use DNS. In fact, DNS... I'll, I'll give a quick summary. DNS has a new feature in, as of either 2008 or 2008 R2 that allows for the sort of mimicking of WINS functionality to allow for backwards compatibility with systems dependent on WINS so that you can remove WINS from your networks. Oh. So it's called global names. There's a global name zone. It allows for what's called single instance naming. If you just want to put a name and an IP instead of a name in a hierarchy, we mentioned DNS is hierarchical. You'd have to have name dot domain dot something. Like I've got server.ctg.local, Christopher.test.network, whatever the case may be. Wins doesn't use that. Wins just uses server or Christopher or Windows 8, whatever the name of that host is. DNS has a mechanism called global names for accommodating Wins requests now. Oh, and really quick, uh, for more party knowledge, we've been talking about network services. A lot of these network services are IP based. To learn more about IP based services, RFCs, requests for comments. Requests for comments are the standards papers that create these utilities. Some are funny. I mean, I've seen some that were kind of written uh, like Twas the Night Before Christmas. So some are kind of humorous, some are odd, and some of them are very, very technical. But they're, they basically define the standard of WINS, DNS, and all the... T anything TCP IP related has been defined by an RFC. Yep. Um, I use RFCs. I use specifically the IP6 RFC to fall asleep if I'm ever unable to. You just start reading about IP6 and phew, five minutes at most. Out like a light. Yeah, those RFCs can be... You say they can be fun. They can also be a little dry. <laughs> a little bit. Christopher, additional resources and next steps. It's I'll, that time. All right, one more time. We've got our book. MTA Networking Fundamentals, Microsoft Official Academic Course. We've got our instructor-led courses, four different options. One of them is just the course that we're sort of teaching here, but in an instructor-led, peer-present classroom environment where you may get more hands-on experience. And then we've got our exams and certifications, which is usually the intent of these programs. 98-366 uh, Networking Fundamentals, Microsoft Technology Associate Certification. Almost forgot what we're teaching here today. And then also a link for the remote desktop poster that I showed. Uh, if you want to go to the download center, uh, www.microsoft.com slash download, uh, you can look up these component posters, Windows Server, Hyper-V, uh, SharePoint. Let's do a search for Azure. poster. It works really well, actually. Yes, yeah. And th there's, it, it's a really great way to visually represent the information a little bit differently. Yep. So you can kind of see architecture information and how things fit together a little bit better. Yep. It's a good tool. I guess we'll be back in a, back for more in a little while. It, it, we're, we're at that backslide. We I, again, I, I'm torn. I'm torn. I'm, I'm happy that we've covered some great information. I'm a little sad it's over. I feel like maybe you get a little emotionally invested in I these. do! I do! I want these people to have good information. That's, that's and, good. And, and we're done. That's why I make it a video. It's, it's uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of the word that we're, we're oh, posterity. We're recording this oh, yes, for posterity. Yeah. yeah. You, can come, you can even come watch it yourself anytime you want. I might. Talking about putting ourselves to sleep. Oh, oh. <laughs>
Oh, I certainly hope not. So, MTA, Networking Fundamentals, uh, Networking Services. Uh, I think that about wraps it up. For now, yeah. Yeah. Welcome, welcome back. I'm Thomas Willingham. We're here with Christopher Chapman. Hi again. Networking Fundamentals. I like that, getting the hand in just the right place. Uh, we're here to talk about understanding wide area networks. Awesome. So we've talked about TCP IP, we've talked about OSI, we've talked about standards allowing devices to intercommunicate. Now we're going to talk about wide area networks or basically expanding the reach and capability yep. of our network. Our objectives include understanding routing. So routing is going from one network to another and defining common WAN technologies and connections. Uh, warning, this uh, module has a lot of text in it, uh, a lot of concepts, not, a, not as much fun graphics. Christopher's managed to throw in some fun graphics. I got a couple. Uh, but uh, we're just going to talk about some fun foundational technologies, kind of overview them a little bit. So the first thing that we need to talk about is routing. Routing is a process of managing the flow of data from one network segment to another between hosts, devices, and routers. Data is sent along a path according to the networks, the IP addresses, and the IP addresses of the hosts. So think about it is where you have a map in front of you, you're at your uh, starting point, you're trying to get to your destination, and there might be multiple uh, methods or roads to get to your destination. How do you decide how you're going to get to your destination? Uh, you may pick traffic patterns. Okay, so I know on this road that traffic's going to be pretty heavy. Uh, I know that this road isn't as good. So I have one road with heavy traffic, I have another road that maybe it's not a decent road, so I don't like to use it. So there's two routes I am less likely to use than, say, a third or a fourth. Uh, routing over the internet has similar ideas behind it. Uh, how many hops or how many routers have to be crossed to get to my destination? Uh, how fast is that line? How much degradation is there? Uh, these are issues that can be taken into account when it comes to routing. So the router is the device that maintains this information. And if we look at the graphic here, you'll see we have uh, the fancy graphic that Christopher's done for us. We have multiple methods to get from our client to our server. So the client sends out a packet, it hits the first router. The router then evaluates from what it knows, its table of information, its router table, wh what is the best path to send it to. So it decides, okay, I'm going to send it this direction. This router then makes its decision, I'm sending it that way. Uh, the final router says, oh, okay, well, I'll send it to the destination. What would, what would help us determine, what would help a router determine which route to take? Because that, that diagram has a number of options on it. There are different routes that that packet could take to get from A to B. So how do those routers know? Well, and that, that goes back to the map analogy of trying to figure out a uh, destination. Uh, there could be line degradation. Uh, a router port may be off. So possibly notice that it went, the client went from the first router and from the first router it went up instead of across. Uh, the across this line, maybe this line was down or maybe there's signal degradation, so it's causing uh, problems conveying information across that. So that there are hops, uh, maybe the router's off, signal degradation. Those are all issues that could cause uh, something to be rerouted. Okay. That's something I can set manually if I want to? You can. There is, and that's actually the next slide, static and dynamic routing. Okay. So with static routing, you basically configure a consistent path that's always taken. I'm always going to go from point A to point B to point C to get to point D. Dynamic routing 
dynamically configures the path that's going to be taken. So a static route, you have to go in and manually configure the route that's going to be taken between all the devices. Uh, the dynamic route, like I said, is configured, again, automatically uh, using protocols that the routers use to communicate with each other and communicate these routes. So if we look at the graphic, we'll see that this is a static configuration. So for each of these setups, these routers have manually been told, the first router was told, hey, if the client is going to that server, this is the route I want you to take. Versus dynamic, here we have a dynamic setup. Notice that it might take different routes depending on, let's show that one more time, it might take different routes depending on signal degradation, uh, overload, maybe a lot of bandwidth is being taken on that, so you're not getting good response from that. So different routes can be taken. Yep. So dynamic routing. Uh, dynamic routing has two conceptual parts to it. A routing protocol used to convey information about the network, and then an algorithm to determine what's the best path. And that algorithm is, is the road bad? Uh, is the road overloaded? Is there bandwidth? Is there, that goes back to the traffic analogy. Is there a road? Yeah, is there a road? Maybe the road's closed. Common dynamic routing protocols, distance vector routing protocols. Distance vector is made up of two points, uh, or two components. One, the number of hops to a network destination. This is the distance and the direction a packet can reach a network or the direction a packet takes to reach a network destination, which is the vector. So this is the distance vector protocol, routing protocol. Updates are sent at regularly scheduled interviews, interviews, intervals, and can take time for route to change or route changes to be updated. Link state routing protocols Updates are only sent when a route has changed. So this allows for routes where as a router goes down or as a network component goes down, when one of those events happens, then it sends out information. Versus the distance vector routing protocol and RIP routing information protocol is an example of distance vector. Which one, we're going to cover in a few which, minutes. Which we're going to cover. One of the issues with RIP is it's referred to as a chatty protocol. And it's called chatty because it sends out a lot of information frequently. So with RIP, it updates on a schedule. So it basically says, hey, I have a table. Here's all the routes and networks I know about. And I'm just going to send it to everybody I know. The problem with that is as states change, that may be outside of an update interval, so it may take a while for changes to get propagated on the network. So route updates may take a while. Versus link state, and an example of link state is open shortest path first, OSPF. Link state, hey, when I have an update, this route has changed, I'm gonna send an update. If the network's static and there's no changes, I'm not gonna send any updates. No need to be chatty. Exactly. Exactly. Or I'm only going to talk when there's a need to, to say something. Yeah. Interior gateway protocols. Interior gateway protocols are routing protocols that enable elements that comprise an autonomous system, AS, to exchange routing information. What does that mean? Well, for very large networks, it can ease routing to divide the network into smaller entities known as autonomous systems or AS. IGPs or interior gateway protocols are routing protocols that exchange information within the autonomous system. RIP and OSPF are examples of IGPs. So notice here we have uh, an AS, an autonomous system, and RIP or OSPF could be used within the system to keep the routers up to date on, about the paths. So here we have two separate autonomous systems. 
RIP and OSPF could be used in either one. But they're not talking to each other. No, they're not talking to each other. At least not with interior gateway protocols, they're not. RIP, routing information protocol. It's a distance vector protocol. So basically deals with distance and... Uh, I've totally blanked out on direction. the word. There we go. So distance speak. and de direction. Good. Thank you. That enables the exchange of IP routing information. The direction or interface is that packet should be forwarded to is calculated, as well as the distance. Each router maintains its own database of the number of hops to a network destination and the direction, so the distance vector. The nice thing about uh, RIP is it's easy to implement. Typically, most routers, you can implement this by default as a pretty large install base. One of the issues that we talked about is the fact that updates are sent periodically, so it's chatty. Open Shortest Path First, OSPF, is a link state protocol, and it monitors the network for routers that it basically have changed their link state. A link is degraded, a port has been shut off, a route's no longer available. Once that information hits, then I'm going to send an update. The routers maintain a database of router advertisements called Link State Advertisement, LSAs. An LSA consists of router attached networks, their configured costs, and a cost could be number of hops, a direction, or maybe even a, a path. Uh, maybe within your network, a specific path is a line that costs more to use than other lines do, so I'll use that line less frequently. And then finally, updates are sent when a route is actually updated. So we've talked about interior gateway protocols mm -hmm. uh, that allow communication within an autonomous system. Now we're going to talk about exterior gateway pro protocols that allow communications between autonomous systems. So exterior gateway protocols, border gateway protocol is an example of an EGP that enables autonomous systems to exchange routing information. Uh, BGP is used to enable routing on the internet. So basically we see these two separate autonomous systems that may use RIP or OSPF, it doesn't matter which, uh, but they, before exterior gateway protocols were unable to communicate with each other, now with the exterior gateway protocol, bam, look at that. We have communication between the two of them. So now a device from one AS can get to a device on the other AS. Absolutely. And it's all automatic, in theory. The whole practice behind these, these protocols, as we've talked about, as opposed to static, is you don't have to worry about it. You configure the routers initially, and you walk away. And one issue that can happen uh, that can cause problems is a router gets bad information. And so now, all of a sudden, a segment becomes unreachable. Uh, I have this network segment. I have devices on the segment. I can no longer reach that segment because the information about accessing that segment is bad. Yep. And that's an issue that, router, that people who manage routers have to deal with. Possible. So it's demo time. So now we're going to, well, we, the royal we, meaning <laughs> Christopher, <laughs> royal we. is going to configure an RRAS server and verify RIP. I am. So we'd, we'd installed routing remote access in the last module. Uh, yeah, I believe the last module. And we kind of left off with, a, with that installing. It was actually in process. And that's now done. We still have our DHCP config, but that's it. We can now open up routing remote access through our tools menu in Server Manager and take a look at this console. And we'll look at how RIP is implemented.